Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. Before we begin this video I would just like to let you know about my new store page which can be viewed on my channel page. So if you're interested in buying anything and buy something it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. This happened back while I was in college a couple years ago. Me and my roommate moved into a beautiful apartment our junior year of college. Our parents made it extremely clear that us living alone together was not ideal for some of the cheaper, shady neighborhoods close to our college. We attended a college in our state capital, so we were in a city environment, and had certain criteria we had to meet in order for us to live there, and for them to co-sign our leases. Lit sidewalks, keyed entry into the apartment building, lit parking lot, X amount of blocks from campus, etc, etc. So we finally found one that fit our parents criteria. Our apartment building had a keyed entry for both the front of the building and the back gate that led to the fire escape. Our apartment was an end unit that led to the fire escape, so there was two deadbolt locks on it. We loved our apartment, we felt safe, we had fun, truly living the college experience. And then my roommate's boyfriend starts slowly moving his things into the apartment and staying there way more often than he should. I finally tell my roommate if he wants to stay here and use the water, electric, and food I help pay for, then he needs to pay for it too, including our rent. I tell her a three-way split or I'm paying only my rent and he can pay the entire electric water and trash bill. I think I'm being pretty fair and even though her boyfriend doesn't have a job that's not my problem. I work and go to college, your I don't want to work at McDonald's, yes he actually said that excuse is completely garbage. If you want a place to stay then to the golden arches you shall go. So instead my roommate starts sneaking him in really late at night after I go to sleep and he leaves on days I'm home. While I'm in class he's there then leaves before I come back. My schedule is extremely routine. Well, he can't have a key, so if my roommate is in class or at work, how is he getting in? He can't take my roommate's key because if he decides to leave halfway through the day, how will she get her key back? All good questions. The solution they came up with was to leave the back door unlocked that leads to the fire escape, and then he can just jump the fence at the bottom of the fire escape to get back on the fire escape when he's ready to come back, or stick a rock in between the door, whatever works for him. So I'm off of work in school one Thursday morning and I decide I'm going to sleep in as long as I possibly can. My roommate and her boyfriend had already left for the day, so naturally they leave the door unlocked. I'm asleep and it's about 10 in the morning when I hear the back door open to the apartment. I come to just enough to recognize the noise, realize it's my neighbor or her boyfriend, and I brush it off and go try to drift back off. All of a sudden I start hearing someone creep through the apartment, wooden floors. It definitely doesn't sound like casual walking. It is clearly someone stepping slowly and quietly through the apartment. My door to my room is ajar just a sliver, but I don't see anything out the door and I'm honestly too tired to get up and look. A couple of minutes pass and I figure that my room my aunt or her boyfriend are just being weirdos and I fall back asleep. I can't be sure how much time passes before I open my eyes, but it can't be too long. I wake up to my door opening. My back is to the door and I am facing the opposing wall. I slowly start to turn over to see why my roommate or her boyfriend would dare wake me from my slumber, and there he is, a burglar. In my room, next to the bed I'm currently laying in, a 6 foot tall burglar, unplugging my TV about 5 feet from where I currently am. I immediately pretend I'm just shifting positions in my sleep and continue to roll over with my eyes as shut as I can make them seem, still open enough to watch what was going on. He hears me shuffling as I turn over, stops, looks dead at me, and luckily doesn't realize that my eyes are open just a tiny bit. He goes back to unplugging my TV, my DVD player, shoves it in his bag he's brought, like those bags from Ikea, and steals my change jar and casually starts walking out of the front door to my apartment, like he came in for a cup of tea or something. After I hear the door shut, I immediately spring out of bed, grab my phone, start dialing 911, all while locking the back and front doors. The dispatcher is trying to calm me down. At this point, I am hysterical. I can't even catch my breath to tell her okay. Luckily, I told her my address before I started hyperventilating. I will take a second to commend the police department, both city and college, because they were there in less than three minutes. She tells me the cops are there, but they need me to go downstairs to let them in the building because they don't have the key to the front door of the building. I am so afraid to open the door to my apartment and even look down the hallway. I am about to walk to the front door and extend my arm out to the handle when I hear, Ma'am, it's 
the police. It's if I didn't get scared enough already, they yell through the door. I am paranoid because the dispatcher just told me they couldn't get in and didn't realize someone probably let them in downstairs. I ask the dispatcher to confirm that the people at my door are actually police officers. She tells me that they are at my door. Okay, cool. I open the front door and I collapse right there. My legs completely turn into jello and I just hit the floor. I blacked out for a brief period of time, but they helped me up and sit me down on the couch. There's at least 10 officers in my apartment from both the city and college departments. When I look outside the living room window to the street below, there are 5 or 6 cop cars blocking the street. I later found out that they were doing a perimeter search around the immediate area. I'm being bombarded questions now. I have to try to find out what's missing besides the stuff from my room. I'm crying, I'm shaking, this is not at all how I saw my day off going. I tell them my roommate left the back door open for her boyfriend, they inspect the back door and blah blah. The next thing I know my roommate and her boyfriend walk in and they both have the most dumbfounded looks on both of their faces. At this point now there is a detective talking to me and I'm giving my statement. Giving a description of the burglar, the stuff missing, looking at mugshots, etc. I immediately stop talking to the detective, look up at the both of them and blurt out, someone robbed us while I was asleep, he came into my room. Two officers take her and her boyfriend aside and talk to them while I'm finishing up with the detective. I call my then boyfriend and he comes over to help me pack my stuff to stay over his house for a couple of days, which turned into staying until my lease at my place ended around 4 months. After failing to recognize any suspects in a lineup, the cops slowly start leaving. After they all leave, I call my parents to tell them what had happened, gather my things and head over to my boyfriend's house. My roommate and her boyfriend never once apologized, not for leaving the door unlocked, but just just a general, I'm sorry this happened to you type of apology. They never asked me if I was okay, if I wanted to talk, nothing. The day my lease ended was the best day of that entire year. I couldn't wait to get away from my roommate, her boyfriend, and that apartment. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. I didn't even care about the materialistic things. He robbed me of my safety and security and it took a good amount of counseling to get that back. I am also thankful he didn't try to attack me that morning. My friendship with my roommate was tarnished. I haven't spoken to her since. To this day, I don't sleep with my back to the door and I always have a knife under my mattress. This happened to me 2-3 to three years ago. I was around 23 at the time. I am a female and I live in Romania. One night I was coming home from class, masters, classes start after 6pm and end at 10pm at around 11pm. I had to take the subway for about 12 stops. The destination I have to get off at was the end of the line for the subway. At the time, there wouldn't be many people in the subway. All I need is my headset and my music and I am good to go. Said and done, I plug in my music, I pick the furthest chair in the subway, away from the only two people that were taking the subway with me at the time. So far so good, until I see, with the corner of my eye, a silhouette approaching me and sitting right next to me. It was a man, fairly built, dark hair, wearing glasses, a black shirt with a black hoodie, and a sickening smile. He doesn't engage in talking with me, but would just stare at my phone as I would browse through my music. I can hear him breathe heavily, not like painfully, but still like he was feeling something very strong. I feel uneasy, so I decide to change my seat and go even further behind, trying to avoid him. I pick a new chair, sit down, plug my headset again, and proceed with the remaining 6-12 to 12 stops on my way home. I see the silhouette growing bigger and bigger and a breeze running on my skin as I realize the guy is again sitting right next to me. Glancing in midair, dead eyes, a big smile staring right into my phone. I panic, there are still 4 stops to go. I have nowhere to hide. I look after the other person in the subway trying to sit next to her, thinking that strength comes on numbers. She is no longer there. I start shaking a bit, but not allowing the creeper to notice me being vulnerable. I stand up, go to the door, and just decide to stand until my stop comes. This way he won't sit next to me, right? Wrong. He comes straight after me and sits on the chair right near the door because he couldn't see my phone, on which he was so focused so far from that angle. He fixates me right in my soul with his eyes and says, Hi gorgeous, why are you avoiding me? I am freaking out as I look at my phone trying to call my boyfriend or message him and he stops me by saying, I know no one will help you. You would have sent an SOS message by now. I know you didn't. That moment I realize I am cornered. He has been focusing on my phone to see who I was talking to, trying to figure out if I panicked, trying to see if I would ask someone for help. He cornered me bad. I had the luck to reach my stop as I would delay any reaction or ignore him so that he would repeat whatever he wanted to say. I drop off and run for the exit, not looking back. I get out at the surface and I don't see him anymore. At this moment, I put my phone in my purse and realize I had pepper spray with me all along. 
My heartbeat comes back to normal as I know at least I have something to defend myself with, but still a long way to get home, and who knows if he is alone or not. I walk rather fast for maybe 5 minutes from the metro and feel a hand grabbing my wrist hard and pulling me back, another hand covering my mouth disabling me from screaming my lungs out. It was him, the same black hoodie, dark hair, and dead eye stalker. He was furious and said, how dare you run away from me, you should be honored I give you attention. Now, my phone is in my bag, I can't call the police, and I can't reach for the pepper spray. I panic, I can't punch him in the crotch, his hand is still on my mouth. What do I do? I did the most desperate and disgusting thing I could think of just to save my life. I played along. I used my other hand to touch the inside of his thigh and mumble a, I'm sorry, while his hand was on my mouth. He took his hand off my mouth and repeated that I'm sorry, I didn't realize he was just flirting. He let his guard down and took his hand off my wrist. He asked me for my phone number and address to drop me off, but I refused saying I'd rather add him on Facebook and he agreed. I told him I'd reach for my phone but instead picked the pepper spray and got him sprayed all over his face. Made sure I'd cover both his eyes, nose, mouth, even his ears and hands. He instantly got all red, suffocating from the pepper and swelling. I called the police, told them what had happened and what I did. They asked me if he is immobilized and I said yes as the effect wears off in 45 minutes. The police arrived there 5 minutes later to see me shaking like a leaf and a man on the ground, swollen like a pumpkin, throwing up and swearing me between gasps of breath. He was arrested and the police told me they had been looking for him for the past week as they discovered the body of a 24 year old woman in his apartment. A lady with red hair. I have red hair too. The woman was his girlfriend and ever since he's never gotten back to the apartment. I do not know what he wanted to do with me. I can understand why he targeted me due to the similarities but I just hope I don't ever have to meet him again. I used to live in a townhouse, duplex, by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally, I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda, but none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out for a last pee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulbs so I always took him out the front. That night, it was around 11pm and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside of a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was trying to to steal some stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gave me the absolute creep so I grab my dog and go inside. I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch at my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. And like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. Street. He's moving towards the house across the road and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment. And then he is there. He's not just there, he has stopped at the top of my driveway. Just standing there. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance. Like he was preparing for something. Like he wanted to come kill me. My heart is racing so hard I can barely hear. And I'm standing there slack jawed looking at this would be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window further opening it and I see this person, this man looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He starts walking down my driveway undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go sit in my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my dad who lives in a suburb away. He answers. I whispered to him what was happening and he said he will be there as soon as he can. I lie down on my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks, pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in. What if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me. Why am I lying here in the dark crying? Turn a light on. So I did. What well, seemed like a lifetime but was probably just a couple minutes later my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia so no guns but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. I called the police who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have, I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted but for a good year after that I was scared living there. Luckily that feeling faded away after a while.
This happened to me a few years back when I was in my early 20s. At the time, I worked in a department store and a makeup counter. The job relies heavily on good customer service and building relationships because you want people to keep coming back to spend money on your products. We are given personalized business cards so that we can build up our own client base. Very important for a commission department. It's not uncommon to be familiar with the people who frequently shop in the store. As workers, our training is focused on being friendly and accommodating. One day while I was working, I had to move to a makeup counter that wasn't my own to cover someone's lunch break. It was a really slow day so I was just leaning on the counter, people watching. I could tell most shoppers were just browsing so I kept to myself. One of the people that I noticed was a very tall and broad man. He walked very slowly, almost hunched over. His face was fixed very aggressively, like he was angry but focused. He circled around the counter a few times but I could feel his gaze on me instead of the products. After a few rotations around the department, I decided to to greet him in case he needed help. It wasn't until he came directly over me that I realized just how big he actually was. I'm a 4 foot 10 female, so I feel pretty small regardless. But even with his slouched posture, he was over 6 feet tall and well over twice my weight. I'll never forget his teeth, they were completely black in the front. Your eyes couldn't help but go right to them. Despite his menacing appearance, he was soft spoken. Truthfully, I could tell he wasn't all there by the way he talked. He told me no when I asked if he needed help, but requested my number, so direct. We had never spoken before. I declined and said that I was in a relationship and that it would be inappropriate. He then asked if he could have a business card for the counter in case he wanted to get products. Since I wasn't on my normal counter and I really wanted him to go away, I handed him my co-worker's business card and told him to call if he had any questions. It worked and he walked away after that, filling me with relief. Only a couple minutes later the phone on the counter rings. I answer with my peppy customer service voice and say, Thank you for calling makeup brand name, how can I help you? And immediately I know it is the same guy when he starts talking. He asks me again for my personal number and I explain once again that I cannot do that. But he just wants to talk, he explains. Since he wasn't getting the hint, I say, I should have told you that I'm married, you can't have my number. Politely he apologizes and hangs up. I thought that would be the end of him, but for the next few weeks or so I spent much of my time at work anxious that he would show up. I would see him every week and he would lurk around the counter looking for me. Anytime I would see him, I'd immediately drop what I was going to to run and hide or run to the closest customer and offer any bit of assistance to make it look like I was busy so he wouldn't talk to me. I successfully dodged him every time and it came to the point where I stopped seeing him. I was thrilled. I had almost completely forgotten about him until one day I decided to go to Walmart by myself to pick up a few things on my day off. I generally like to shop alone. I can take all the time I need and I like leisurely looking around. I grabbed a basket and made my way over to the cosmetic slash hair wellness section since that's where most of the things I needed were. I only managed to grab a few things before I locked eyes with them as I walked by the supplement aisle. I had recently changed my hair color and wasn't wearing my work uniform so I didn't think he'd realize who I was. I was ready to just go about my shopping and ignore him until I noticed that he dropped the items he had in his hand and started heading my way. I panicked and swiftened my pace immediately. I thought to myself, he's not going to really follow you through the store, right? But as I turned around to look, I could see his humongous body just plowing through people, with that same terrifying look on his face, only meaner, his black teeth growing closer with a snarl. Since the direction I was walking was the opposite of the exit and there was no way I was going to turn around, I decided that my best course of action would be to follow the perimeter of the the store and cut down the center section, which would bring me close to the registers. I speed walked the entire time in the hopes of losing him amongst all the people, but never once turning around again. By the time I made it to the register area, I could actually feel him behind me. Still not wanting to turn around to look, I glanced in the reflection of the soda machines that are in between the register aisles to see how close he was. To my horror, there was only about two feet between us. I was afraid to just drop my stuff and run out the door in case he followed me to my car. I had parked in the far back back at the parking lot and didn't want to risk it. I also didn't want to get in line at the registers since the lines were long and I would just be standing out in the open alone. Instead, I walked into the cluster of people crowded around the self-checkout line. I noticed another large but older gentleman with his carriage in the middle and ran straight for him. The people were so closely clustered together that the man following me couldn't make it through. I ran over to the man in line and grabbed onto his carriage. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not cutting you, but there's a man that's been following me through half the store and I need to stand with you. He was so sweet and let me be with him while we waited in line and even let me go ahead of him so I could leave quicker. As I was cashing out, I could see my peripheral vision my stalker staring at me and pacing about, but he couldn't come near me since the self-checkout is somewhat sectioned off. 
By the time I had finished and grabbed my receipt, I couldn't see him anymore. I looked around but he was nowhere. I thought about asking the older man to walk me to my car, but he still wasn't finished at his register, so I decided to call my boyfriend and make a run for it. Staying on the phone, I explained to him what was going on as I sprinted to my car, frantically looking around in case he tried to follow me outside. I made it to my car safely and rushed right home, breaking down to my parents about what just happened. I could feel it in my bones that the man wanted to do something to me, and thankfully I didn't find out what that was. His aggressive aura was bad. To this day, I can still remember the adrenaline that I felt when he followed me. I had never felt so vulnerable. I quit that job roughly two years later. This incident happened in the summer of 2015. I lived by myself in a nice house inside a small town. Low crime, but still the occasional shady person. Anyway, at work that day on a smoke break, I watched a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle, four lane city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there, scooped his little self up, and booked it back to my workplace. He was not injured amazingly. As a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me until I could figure out what to do with him. I have a large amount of cats, and always have. This was my first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy, head hung, tail tucked, jumpy, just looking at me like I was about to beat him. I was clueless on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew that they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out about 15 times, as I did not want him using the bathroom in my house, obviously. I was having my final cigarette of the day on my porch. The dog was on a lead, chilling under my chair as I smoked and chilled. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs by my house. He kept glancing up at me before passing. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on his heel and approached. Hey, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him I would search the address on my phone, which, of course, was taking a minute to pull up. He explained he didn't have a phone of his own and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps toward me the whole time. Finally, the address I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in the direction. He kept his eyes locked on me, continuing to slowly move closer. The dog starts growling very softly at this point. I forgot he was even there until now. Mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm bad with directions. I rose from my seat, pointing again. It's truly just two blocks up the road, just follow the road. Two blocks, the house will be on your left, making it very clear that I wasn't going to just hand him my phone. Well, can I call them? I need to let them know I'm coming, he said, still creeping closer, extending his hand. No, I curtly replied. How about text them, pushing forward still, dude, no. I started toward my door. Just let me see your phone. He was visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it and getting way too close to my porch. As a last ditch effort of getting this dude to screw off, I say, you need to get out of my yard. My dog's protective. He will screw you up. I didn't know the first thing about this dog, let him know whether he had the capacity to screw someone up. I just hoped Sane would intimidate pushy phone guy. Like I had said the magic words, Pupper springs into action. The dog emerges like a bullet from under the chair, growling, snarling, and barking his head off. He jerks me near off the porch trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like an 80 pound attack dog, not a 40 pound timid beagle mix. I was afraid. I didn't know if the pup would turn on me. As stated previously, at the time I knew absolutely jack nothing about dogs. He backed his hindquarters into my legs, almost nudging me to the door. Still carrying on, eyes locked on phone dude and baring his teeth. Phone dude holds up his hands and backs off, stammers something like, uh, two blocks north, yeah? And begins walking that way. I go inside, cut off my light and peek out the window at him. He glances at my house, assured I'm inside, turns and begins walking the completely opposite direction I pointed him in. Icing on the cake, he pulls a phone from his pocket and raises it to his ear to make a call. The dog secured his place as a member of the family that night. He is incredibly protective of me and has frightened away another creeper since this incident. He is attached at my hip and has made it know that he is grateful to be in a safe, loving home, wherein he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. His name is Hank, and I truly believe that night would have ended very poorly for me had he not been there. So about three years ago, I was going to school in a US city and was living with two other roommates. My one roommate was known to usually bring CD characters back to the apartment. At one point during our fall semester, she befriended a guy in her advertising class who went by the name of Dallas. He became her weed dealer and she would frequently bring him over to the apartment. I suspected they were sleeping together, but she denied it. It was a strange relationship, but who am I to judge? My other roommate and I thought he was charismatic enough, but also didn't see the appeal that Christy, 
my roommate who befriended him, Saul. I remember one night we had Dallas over for dinner. He told us how he played for our college's football team, that he just started his own business at the age of 25, and how he was a very well-known weed dealer who made a lot of money, and his name was Dallas because he used to live in Dallas, Texas, and his parents named him after that. Me and my other roommate nodded our heads and listened, but we didn't think much of it except for this dude thought he was hot stuff and wanted to glow about himself. I believe he came over for dinner or something maybe one or two other times. My roommate claimed that one time she decided to buy weed from him and went to his apartment off campus. When she arrived, she saw our roommate, Christy, just passed out on a chair in the middle of the day in Dallas's apartment in some random room. When my roommate arrived, he mentioned nothing of her being there. My roommate shook her awake and Christy just woke up in a haze and basically told my roommate to screw off. My roommate recounted the story to me and we both agreed it was weird and Dallas was probably not the safest person to hang with. After a couple of months, Christy stopped hanging with him. I remember her saying he got pissed she didn't want to sleep with him. I also found out that a friend of hers, who knew him for a long time, was engaged to him. Oh also, his real name wasn't Dallas. Yeah, real shocker there. Fast forward two years, me nor my roommate talk to Christy anymore. We are living elsewhere in said city, doing our own thing. We get an alert on our phones that a girl who had just transferred to our college went missing after leaving from one of the campus bars the previous night. It doesn't take long, maybe a few days when this huge story breaks. This girl was killed by someone she left the bar with that night. My roommate calls me and goes, do you remember what Dallas's real name was? I go, yeah, I believe it was said name. She goes, go online and read this article. He killed that girl who just went missing. Sure enough, I go online and there's the most horrifying mugshot of Dallas with a photo of the girl he had just slain. It gets crazier. Apparently, he had taken her home that night and attempted a one-night stand and he killed her by blood force and strangulation. If that isn't terrible enough, he cleaned up the evidence-ish in his apartment, threw her body in a storage container, took a lift to his grandma's house hours away, and buried the storage container with her remains in it on the property somewhere. After obtaining a video of the two of them leaving together from the bar, it didn't take cops long to bust him. Weeks after after the story broke, so many girls came forward and shared similar creepy stories about Dallas, the guy who played for said college's football and ran a successful business. You can guess that none of this was ever true. Also, he was like 28 years old, claiming he was still a student at Aber College when this happened, prying on younger women. I just hope he rots in prison for the rest of his life. For a bit of backstory, my mom was dating an abusive guy at the time. We'll call him Ian. Because of Ian and the crazy fights they had gotten into, we couldn't lock up my house at all. He had kicked in both the front and the back door to the house and they never fixed. My mother and Ian were at the bar all day, every day. I told you this so you would know why the house wasn't locked up and where my parents were when this happened. This incident occurred when I was around 12 years old and my little brother around 10. I was a really small girl at this age and my brother was sick all the time so he was very tiny and frail. My mother and Ian were at the bar as usual. When you opened my front door, it put you in the living room and you could see the back door. There was a hallway to the right that led back into the bedrooms, and that is where my brother and I were. We were in his bedroom with the door closed playing something on a PlayStation. It was around midnight or 1am and we were playing and having a good time when I heard a weird noise. My brother didn't hear it and I didn't want to creep him out. I told him that I wanted to go get a drink and told him to stay in the room and I would bring him something. To get to my kitchen, you would have to walk down the hallway in front of both the front and back door because it was behind the living room. I kept hearing strange noises so before I left out of my brother's room, I told him to get into the closet and work on our fort so that it would be ready when I was done getting our drinks and a snack. I raised my little brother for the most part and took care of him. I had a terrible feeling, a sense of dread. I could tell something wasn't right and this was a way to get my brother to hide without scaring him. He frightened easily and had really bad asthma attacks and at this time we had no inhaler or his breathing treatment machine for him. I knew if he started having an asthma attack on top of being scared, it wouldn't be pretty. Anyway, I left the back room and decided to see what was going on. I started sneaking up the hallway as slowly and quietly as I could. I was terrified. I could feel that something was wrong. Before I made it to the end of the hallway, I hear a man. It sounded like he was grunting. I can't explain it, but the feeling that washed over me made me near puke. So I of course freeze. I have no one in this town. I don't know anyone and my dad is living in a different state. My mom is at the bar drunk. I was sitting 
sitting there trying to gather the courage to see what was around the corner and going over my options when I hear my brother's door open. He sees me and the look on my face and freezes. I remember his eyes going so wide with fear because he must have heard the grunting too. I motion him with my hands to go back in the room and he does. I gathered the courage to peek around the corner and what I saw still freaks me out to this day. It was horrifying. I saw a man, probably around 6 foot 2, sitting on my couch with a grin on his face. By some stupid luck that man didn't see me. I slowly snuck back to my brother's room. I slowly shut the door and started going over my options. My little brother was already horrified because of the grunting noise this man was making. I am so thankful he wasn't the one who saw what was out there. I gathered myself and calmly told him that there was a man that I didn't know on the couch and he needed to be very quiet and I needed him to be brave and keep his breathing in check. My little brother adored me and looked up to me so when I told him that I needed him to be brave, he tried his best. I told him not to move and he didn't. The first thing I tried was the window but it wouldn't budge. It was completely stuck. I'm making myself stay calm for my brother's sake but I know what's sitting out there. So since the window was stuck, I decided to start looking for a weapon. My oldest brother lived here and I knew he had swords somewhere. I don't remember where he was. As I'm looking for a weapon I hear the man saying, I know you're here. My stomach nodded up. The hair on the back of my neck raised and I instantly got a cold sweat. And then I hear it. My little brother had started wheezing. Asthma attack. I hugged him, reminded him about being brave and told him to sit still and focus on his breathing. I started frantically trying to get my window open, but it was stuck. I looked around and started moving blankets when I find my older brother's cell phone that he always forgot. I remember thinking that I was lucky and felt a bit of relief. I immediately called the police and told them what was going on, hysterical at this point but still remaining quiet. The dispatcher told me to remain on the phone so she could hear what was happening when the man started banging on our bedroom door. It had been about 5 minutes into the phone call when this happened and I could no longer remain calm. I had lost it. I started screaming. I forgot to mention that our bedroom had the only working lock. So the door was locked, he was trying to get in and banging on the door. His banging got louder and louder. He was screaming to let him in when it went completely silent. Then he did the creepiest, most terrifying thing ever. He started laughing. He then says, you know I could just bust down this door in about two seconds, right little girl? He then starts lightly knocking on the door and asking me to open it. Then I hear the police start screaming at him to get on the ground, put his hands up, etc. I heard him putting up a fight, followed by more yelling and eventually silence. After a few minutes, there was a knock on my door, but at this point, I was too terrified to open it. I thought that this nightmare guy was still there. So being in my hysterical state, I started screaming, no, 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 please, over and over again, sobbing and shaking. I couldn't stay brave for my little brother anymore. I was on the floor holding him this whole time, convinced we were going to die. Eventually, I calmed myself a bit, and this time a female officer was at the door, so I opened it. There were about five cops standing in the hallway listening to me being hysterical. I refused to let go of my brother at this point, but we both ran to this female officer and just collapsed, sobbing hysterically. We had been so scared. It turns out this guy was completely wasted and high on drugs. I remember the cops walking me up to him and having me stand in front of him to ask me if I knew this man. I didn't. The man's eyes were completely bloodshot and filled with hatred. My parents were called and investigated for leaving us alone like that and for the doors being like that. My mom is a different person now, doesn't drink and is now married to a cop. She completely changed. I remember asking her about it later on and she told me something that I didn't know. The man had a huge knife, so that's what he was scraping the door with. He also had some rope, tape, and a tarp. I still don't know how he didn't get to us, or why he didn't just bust the door down to get us. It would have taken one half kick from him to kick the door down. It was super thin. So hopefully I will never have to endure that horrible experience again. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me. A few days later, it happened again, but this time, she was following me. I assumed she wasn't following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she did not follow me up to my building. After a while, I noticed we took the same train home. A lot of the time, she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she'd look away. Then, she'd continue looking when she thought I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office. I went there for lunch a couple times during the week. I started seeing the girl sitting in the window for lunch and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was almost always there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes, she would walk the same way as me. Once I got to my place, I live in a condo with my brother. She would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed was spam. 
There would either be silence on the other end or the person would hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people I already knew or were already on my friends list. December of 2017 comes. By this time, I'm not going to Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue, said she wanted to follow me on Instagram. We text a couple of times and I accept her follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. I'm talking about every day slash every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this when she asks me if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal should have sent red flags up for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like what would you do when you're trying to get to know someone? She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself, and I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things I do, but that's it. August 2018 rolls around. I am still seeing creepy girl everywhere during the week. I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now, I never post on Facebook and would never talk bad about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with anyone, nor do I know of anyone who has a problem with me. I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently and I tell her what happened a couple days later when I got home from work. I tell her I don't want to get much into it, but she keeps pushing for details. I finally told her I was going to go to bed and she got the message. The more I thought about all the time she texted me, the more uneasy I got. Some things that she said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remembered her. We had kept in touch over the years, just not as frequently and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram but the Instagram she last messaged me through wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was. Phone number is completely different and it turns out that she was never the one texting me nor did she request following me on Instagram. I track the number and it turns out to be one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain it was the girl that's been following me. These things only started after she appeared. The phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook request, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think much to it. This whole ordeal is really scary when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and my address at one point. My friend even confirmed a post my brother made with pictures he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for 8 months about my life and they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. She doesn't follow me anymore, but when she did see me on the metro, she would always sit somewhere that she was able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number. I just hope that she decided to forget me and move on. About 5 or so years ago, I was 23 at the time and had just gotten out of my first and only serious relationship a year prior. That guy was my first love so needless to say when things ended and he had zero interest in trying to work things out, I was heartbroken. After about a year of moping around, I decided to try actual dating. I met this guy Rick on a dating website. He was a couple of years older than me, was an ex-marine, and good at making conversation. After a few days of talking online, he asked for my number and we decided to meet up. I drove to his house and come to find out he lived with a few other guys who looked really shady. Now he actually lived in a good neighborhood, but the way they kept their home and the way his roommates looked was my first red flag that a inexperienced and naive girl would not fit in his crowd but I decided to stay and give it a chance. Once he saw me, he came up, gave me a hug, and handed me a helmet to his motorcycle. Now I have never in my life rode a motorcycle before but I had always wanted to, so I thought why not and hopped on. Now the street he decides to take me up is known to be a very long a windy road that is pretty secluded. It's also important to note that this is the springtime and it's about 5pm when we go on our ride. 
I didn't realize at the time he had decided to take me on that specific road, but once we got on it, my red flag started to kick in. I began to realize that, one, it is dead silent and there are no other cars on this road right now, two, it started to get dark, and three, yeah, I don't know this guy, so what am I doing, and my alarm bells start ringing. Once my anxiety kicked in, I told him that I think we should turn around and go home. He started laughing and asked if I was scared, and I said no, I just need to head home because my parents are expecting me for dinner soon. He kept riding forward. More alarm bells ringing. Pictures of me lying dead in a ditch came up. I kept asking can we please turn back and he finally gave in and turned around. The next day comes and I told myself that maybe I was just overreacting and he was harmless and decided to agree on a second date a few days later. We met up at a sports bar for dinner and a couple of beers so we can watch the hockey game. The entire time we were sitting there, Rick has his arm around me and has me literally attached to his hip, constantly trying to make out with me and is acting extremely possessive. At this point I'm completely freaked out because I barely know this guy and all he is talking to me about is our future and how he would be such a protective boyfriend because he was an ex-marine. At this point, I knew I was done with him, but unfortunately, my car is at his house. When we are done and head home, he insists that I come inside and hang out for a bit. I decide to walk in and stay for five minutes. We walk into his room and he immediately pounces on me, making out with me and trying to feel me up. I kept pushing his hands away and kept telling him that I needed to get going, but I could tell he wasn't going to give up until he got what he wanted, especially after I realized his little friend was aroused. He told me that he would not let me leave until we did something. I said screw this and was able to bolt out of his door and sped home. After that night, he tried to ask me to hang out again and I told him that I think it would be best if we stayed friends. This guy began to relentlessly call me and text me and beg me to see him, then proceeded to call me names because I was ignoring him, then would apologize for calling me said names and it was because he liked me so much, so I blocked him. Then he tried to message me on Instagram, so I blocked him on there, and then on Facebook, and finally on Snapchat. I never gave Rick any more attention and moved on. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story happened to me about six months ago. I have lived where I lived for three years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the late 90s. In the last few years, the city I live in has had a massive population boom and people have been non-stop pouring in. Good weather, amazing economy, cool place to do stuff always. Because of this, I have seen the landlord staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date to attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like six years before he he ended up buying a house and moved. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is that there are two stories. Where my bedroom is, on the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase in my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up against the wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling to. For weeks, I would always see the workers over there painting and redoing the floors, etc. A few days before this happened, it was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance in the kitchen, and when I came home from work, they were gone for the day. Nothing unusual for a single bit. The part that is unusual, though, is what happened one particular night. I was awake around 1am watching TV in my room, when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up the stairs, and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall. I could feel him listening to me breathing. I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. I heard nothing for a few minutes, and then after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person start walking the rest of the stairs to the second floor. It was very obvious that someone was on the other side of that wall listening to me. I also knew that it was only a few days before this happened that I saw the maintenance redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew that there was no way someone already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all, nothing. I went back into my room and laid down in bed again. I didn't play the TV, I just sat there waiting to hear something again. I was messing around on my phone for around 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement in the stairs again. This time though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I was sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall listening to my every move. This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched out the window again. 
Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building in the apartment. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building and the apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after could hear him talking to someone, but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I went downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop, that it was a heck of a way to meet your new neighbor. I felt embarrassed, but more importantly felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed off the whole thing as it just being late and my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day I went to leave my apartment when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps towards my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment and I looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on, and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked over to a maintenance man and said, didn't someone move in here? And he informed me no and that the apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone is staying there and she said absolutely not. I told her about what I experienced the night before. She was floored. She told me that they would change that apartment's locks immediately. She also suggested that I call the non-emergency line to the police department and informed them that no one lives there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information and detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out what officer came out to check out the situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed that I had never seen him around the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it and started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in and they are very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went out to introduce myself to them. But to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping the following weeks of that happening to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I had I have zero idea of what the intentions were of the person or what they were doing on that staircase. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of this story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida and lived with my family in my hometown in the Florida Panhandle. It's about a 7 hour drive up through Central Florida to get between the two places, so I mostly only went home for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving in my junior year, and I was excited that I had managed to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic and was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have a last meal together before we all left for break. So I ate in the campus dining hall around 4 p.m. and I set off on my journey around 5.30 p.m. Around 10 p.m. I had just passed my two-third mark, where I always stopped at this little mom and pops type of diner by the side of the highway to grab a snack, use the restroom, and call my dad to let him know I was okay, I didn't have a cell phone yet. Well, I hadn't been there since summer and the place was out of business, so a little bummed out that I wasn't getting my chocolate chip pancakes. I just kept going. There really wasn't much built up around there at the time, so when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all the places on this green earth, some town called Alachua, so I went for it. So I went and parked directly under the street light for safety and used the facilities, called my dad, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman who approached me asking for directions, saying she was with her husband and two small children from Virginia and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, grey or bluish work van parked very close to the driver's side of my 95 Honda Civic. Yeah okay, I thought that's pretty weird. It had Florida tags on it so it couldn't have been the ladies I talked to in the bathroom. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop promptly running into some random middle-aged guy with two little boys. Getting to talk to him, it turned out it was his wife I had spoken to as she emerged from the bathroom a second later, and I felt comfortable speaking to him. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said he'd go check it out, so he left the kids with his wife and strutted up to the driver's side of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking, his voice awkwardly quivered, but we could hear him yell it from where we were standing some 100 feet away. Excuse me gentlemen, we already called 
called the police so I'm gonna have to politely suggest that you get out of here. And then he ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, pointed to me with a swift you and said come on let's all get in the car now and we ran together. So here I was confusedly sitting in the back of the stranger's SUV while he went and used the payphone to presumably call the police. Meanwhile the van peeled out of there. Like I have never seen someone get out of there quite like they got out of there. They ran up on the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van and he could see in it pretty well because I had parked under the street light. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was a guy sitting in the driver's seat and a guy sitting in the back. A tarp laid out in the back and a bunch of other random items back there he couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the guys were reading a newspaper or a map or anything. They were apparently both just sitting there. I'd say I was around 8 at the time this took place. At the time, we had to get mail from the post office in town, and so seeing my mom get the mail, my brain decided, wow, I want to be cool and get the mail like mom. That childish need to prove that I was mature. Eventually, after time and time of begging, my mom let me get the mail. I'd guess it was a weekend as the post office was closed, but you could still grab mail, just no people that worked there were there. I asked my mom if I could grab the mail as we slowly pulled up outside the post office. She nodded and gave me the keys that had the mail key and a few others. I jumped out of the old van and ran up the ramp to the building, avoiding the stairs completely. I opened the door and saw a lady and a man getting their mail, but turning to my side, I saw an older man sitting in the corner staring at me. He gave me weird vibes even as a kid, but still I gave him a quick smile and wave. Bad move. The man smiled back, revealing his stained teeth. I walked past him and went to the mailbox. Me being me though, I forgot what key was what and began fumbling awkwardly as the others grabbing mail left the building. After maybe 3-5 to five minutes of trying and failing, I finally unlocked it. I was so happy that I disregarded the man staring as I grabbed the mail. With a quick click of the lock, I closed the box and began to walk away. I found the gaze of the man as he looked at me, a crooked smile across his face. I pulled my open hand against the door and began to push when a pair of arms reached around me, one hand forcefully pulling the door shut and the other around the upper part of my chest, like my collarbone, pulling me into a tight, unwelcome and horrible hug. I froze. What was I supposed to do? I was always taught to respect adults and I did. He had a strong scent of alcohol on him, so much I think I coughed a few times. He began to speak after a moment of just holding me there. The words he spoke scared me really bad. He then said, Man, hey, where are you going? He spoke almost passive aggressively. Me, oh, I have to go. My mom was waiting for me. Man, oh, okay. He sounded defeated and began to let me go. Before I could break away, he held me tighter again, tighter than before. Wait, wait, wait. I have a dog you know, he had a grin on his face. Me, oh that's cool. Man, yeah, and you should come with me and you can play with him. I almost went with him at that moment but luckily something told me not to. The next maybe 8 minutes he had let me go and pulled me back hard into him, his dirty coat brushing against me. He kept telling me to go with him. Finally, he seemed to snap. Man, alright, you're coming with me. Me, what? But I need my mom. I have her keys and she's waiting for me, please. That was still my priority, her keys and mail. Man, nope, you're coming with me now. He opened the door and began to pull me out. In a moment of his weakness, I broke away, running to my mom in her car. I slammed the door shut, scaring my brother and my mother. I began shaking and crying, dropping the mail on the car floor. I picked it up and handed everything to my mom as she demanded to know what happened. I told her everything and she looked pissed. I was so glad that she was on my side. I looked outside, tears still streaming down my face, and noticed the man look at me through the car window from the top ramp of the building. I began to cry harder and panic as he started coming over. My mom stopped me as she noticed him coming. He fell at the bottom of the ramp and tripped. My mom laughed at the creep and started driving away, while she tried to comfort me saying things like, he was a harmless old drunk man and he didn't hurt you. I'm pretty sure I knew what his intentions were towards my younger self, and I'm just glad that I was able to get away from the man. This happened in 2015 when I was 16 and still living in my hometown, a forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things you can do there as a teenager. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of fun park type things, only a whole lot worse. There's a crappy arcade with broken skee ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s, a pathetic mini golf course, and the most dangerous go-karts you've probably ever seen in your life. 
Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down is the beach, and across the single street are woods. If our town is in the middle of nowhere, Miller's is practically on the moon. My cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-karting. It was around 10pm, so we knew it would be almost deserted, but that was the way we liked it. I picked her up from her house and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty parking lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever. There was no one there except for a few boys in the arcade and a guy who looked to be in his 60s sitting on a bench near the batting cages. Emma and I paid him no mind and went to the go-kart track. Like I said, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced way too fast around the windy track. This is why I didn't notice the guy walking over to the fence and why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence, right where I parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression, a weird smile with dark eyes. I managed an uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, who was obviously higher than a kite, and Emma and I went off again. This time I couldn't focus. The dude gave me the worst type of feeling. My eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was we only had bought three tickets. We were on our second to last run and he was standing directly next to the exit gate. I was just praying that he'd move before we were done. But of course, no such luck. Our last go came and went, and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt, and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was, but she didn't seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening. I opened the gate, and the guy stepped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry and he smelled of cigarettes. What are you girls doing all alone here. My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what, she said, pushing past the gate so she stood beside me. It's so late. His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake. Do your parents know that you're out? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. This was a lie and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had? Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you to your car? He starts inching towards me and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb as we're both small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us are anywhere near his size. This guy clears six foot too easy, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we were just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us here. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town, and I knew that she knew this. The guy's face immediately changes. His smile disappeared, and he now was glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself start to cower. Boyfriend, he says roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left, and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, it felt safer than outside. We ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What do we do? I left my phone in my car. I whisper shouted. There was no way I was going out there alone, and the go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack. I don't have mine either. I left it charging, she said, face palming. We're just gonna have to make a run for it. Are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. What about the the guy who runs the go-karts. We could get him to walk us out, she said. I just shook my head. He's as high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Then we have no choice. She stood up pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard, wanting to cry. I'd never been that scared before. There was something so wrong about that guy. We made our way out of the arcade, looking around to see if he's nearby. The park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drag me to the exit. I was looking every direction every second, waiting for the guy to come out, out of the woods or something something and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. Everything was still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed. And I pulled them from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when I stopped dead in my tracks. What, she whispered. I stared at the car, keys in hand. I had never locked it. I never locked the car, Emma. What? I didn't lock it. What if? I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled me away. I'm just going to peek. If I say run, you run. Her voice is quiet. I nodded shakily. She eventually made it close enough to see inside, but by the way she was squinting, I knew it was too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if he's in there? All these thoughts, almost drown out, the unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement.
pavement. My head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at us at full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized I had locked it. Emma was already on the other side screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door, flung it open and practically threw myself inside. I just managed to close the door when he was there, slamming his fist against the window and shouting incoherently. I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it as hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go and through my tears I shoved the key into the ignition and flew into reverse. He was still chasing us and yelling as I veered backwards out of the lot and turned as fast as I could while slamming on the gas. I was driving like I was still in a go-kart but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I regained some composure. Though obviously shaken up, she managed to keep her tears and be the same one out of the two of us as we drove at least 30 miles over the speed limit the whole way back to my house. We kept this encounter a secret between us for a long time but me and Emma decided to tell this encounter we had experienced on here. We didn't talk about it until months after the horrifying encounter. Safe to say we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that. I urge all of you to be extremely careful when going out at night. I just hope that me and Emma never have to see that lunatic again. This story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972 when she was 8 years old. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant slash gas station in our hometown. They have always run a business of some type since the 50s. This means that a lot of days my mom would take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, usually no more than an hour or two. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her but he was a little older and sometimes had football practice. So was the case in the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day, let herself in the house, and put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy and knew the first thing she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog in a white towel, this is important, and walked him outside. As she put down the dog, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flailing it about the wind. It's then she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street. This guy was in his late 20s and was known to be very strange. My mom said he always creeped her and everyone else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside and made her feel generally uncomfortable. She said he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day and as she took out the blanket he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little shook, she picked up her pup, went inside and locked the door. She began to do some homework and after about 5 minutes of work, she heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked to the window to see who it was. She knew it wasn't my grandparents because of course they had keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street, like he was already looking in the window. She jumped and said she screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She walked to the door and made sure it was locked. She said he just continued with the slow continuous thud on the door, almost in rhythm knock 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 then she really got terrified as he began speaking to her through the door hi sweetie i saw you with your doggy let me in to see him she was in shock come on and let me in sweetie please i want to see your puppy in full freak out mode my mom screamed you need to leave now you need to go back to your house i don't know you he kept knocking knock 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 i can see the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part he said let me in i saw you waving your flag of surrender i kid you not the guy thought my mom's shaking hair from the blanket was a flag of surrender and a sign for him to come over. My mom screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off her fear. She then got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house so the kitchen and the rec room were down there along with the only phone in the house. She made it to the phone and began to dial 911. All of a sudden, she heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through and my mother screamed, what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him as his lower half couldn't squeeze through. Then my mom began hearing my grandmother screams, what are you doing? Then the guy yelling in pain and squirming out the window as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in her garden on the side of the house where the entrance to the window was. He managed to get out the window and bolted to his house. The police came, grandma called my grandfather and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested him for breaking and entering. On the day of his court date, he told them the white flag of surrender story, but this was the final nut on his crazy cake as they put him in a mental institution that day. He may have gotten out but went back because my mother said he later died in an institution. Outside the courthouse, the crazy family of the creep tried to blame my 8-year-old mother and the man's father called my mother a harlot. We always can't help but wonder though, what would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that moment?
This took place when I was about 16. My aunt was in town visiting and we were coming back from the grocery store. We were driving back to my mom's house, my parents are divorced, and she lived way out in the country. Like, it's a 10 minute drive from anywhere. We pull up at our driveway and a red car pulls in behind us. My aunt and I stay in the car and the man approaches the driver's side door. I can't rightly tell you why he looks like a creep, but he looks like a creep. Very pasty skin, eyes that were staring down too hard, just overall weird. He claims he is lost and looking for his way to a fitness center in the town next over. The exact fitness center that is about a minute away from where the grocery store is, i.e. the opposite direction of where we just came from. Super odd, but I give him directions. He thanks me, but continues to stare at me. He asks if we know each other and I reply no. He gives me his name and I again repeat no, I do not. A couple of seconds of awkward staring and he asks me what my name is. Well, being an idiot and feeling anxious, I tell him that was a mistake. He confirms we don't know each other, oh really, and heads back to his car and we watch him leave. My aunt and I agree he was very strange, but shake it off and take the groceries in. From where we were parked, you have to take a little windy path up behind the house to the back door. My aunt goes outside to grab the rest of the groceries and I settle on the couch in the living room and look outside. Red car in the driveway. My aunt comes upstairs and said the guy was almost to our door and claimed he forgot the directions. My aunt curtly told him right, left, right, and told him to leave. The directions were truly that simple when following the main roads. I'm freaked, she's freaked, but we never see him again. A month passes and I'm chilling at my dad's and posted something like, I'm bored at my dad's house, who wants to chill on Facebook? Guys, always set your page to private. Several minutes later, I get a message from the same guy asking if I wanted him to come over. I'm home alone and understandably terrified. I immediately block him and tell my dad, who goes to one of his cop friends to see if they know anything about this guy. Well, this man was kicked out of a local university for stalking and had two other counts of stalking on top of that in a restraining order. Another month goes by and I'm in study hall with a friend and he is telling me about this guy who was stalking his older sister. I don't remember the specific details, but it was definitely the story of someone being stalked. The craziest part was the stalker almost drove this girl's brother off the road in an attempt to get him to pull over. Once pulled over, stalker jumped out and was making his way to my friend's vehicle when my friend noped right out of there. I'm sure you guessed it, but the stalker and the creep I ran into were the same person. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy, religious town was not my ideal place. Eventually, I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out almost every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time we were hanging out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the stuff he said was just the drugs talking. But one day he said, I'm gonna stab someone this week. For days later, he threatened to shoot up a place on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, students Students would run from him in the hallways, people were sending him threats, his reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed, he was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something, and he would start attacking me with words. If I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship and for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this, the verbal abuse continued, and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off of Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex, not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone that wasn't him. Alex was also a weed dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact him out of weed, but it was a decent amount, enough to be mad about if you don't get paid for it. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off, and called 911, calling it a drug deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, 
later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house, who lives in Sean's neighborhood, when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled out his window and called him a coward, then drove away. Sean called the police again and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting myself into that situation, and I had just told them I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school, and I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so I didn't have money to buy weed, and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of his house, so I snuck my phone and texted him that my parents might call his parents and he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said he wished he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to coke and I was selling my nudes. This is when the text started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I'd block that person's number. Then he'd use WhatsApp or group me to text me since we use those for work, so I just block him on there. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went on for a few weeks, and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock, where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he wasn't in his car, so I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive through the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look at my rear view mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear and she said, I didn't want to scare you so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend to not notice him. He then pulled out of the drive through and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message he had sent me over the months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive through talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by and I don't hear anything from him. I thought that maybe it was over and I could move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I stick to natural drugs. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continue to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean was not an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago. 
I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there, so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around town. I landed one from a girl that seemed just like a chill person. We had a few exchanges through the Tinder app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door and gave me a hug. She said the name of a local bar she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her I would drive and proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door. She had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me staring. I looked at her blankly for 15 seconds and asked her if she was going to get in. She said, sure I would love to, and went the long way to the passenger's side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something, as I had kind of got the vibe she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I am not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back away from most people, just so I could have a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point and it was actually a fun time for the time being. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did, recreationally use weed, and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I am not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my mind to think maybe she was just high off marijuana, and that rationally explains some of the out of their behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point, so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks and she agreed. When we got to my place, we had a few more drinks, then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important, she said, I'm actually Anastasia, and I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that serious at this point with how much I drank, so I kind of challenged that statement using the little bit I knew about history. At this point, she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors in history. And then she got quiet and tiptoed right up to me and grabbed me by my neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says at this point, I am a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. And then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my face and kissed my forehead. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked to her to calm me down, telling her I was only joking. Then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she started talking about her cats. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I am not about judging people on their interests, so I listen in. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in my living room. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point, so I just listened to try not to set her off. She noticed sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual I like to do, but it's mine and mine alone. Something I take very personally and I like to do myself. I tell her no, she can't light it and that it's my thing to do on my own. Then she freaks out telling me I am a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her I can take her home now and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she is screaming at the top of her lungs that I am a horrible person and I should go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard and about 10 minutes saying she left her phone in there. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she's about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she's not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from. I told her no because I paid for the thing. I slam the door at that point and lock it. I hear her bang on the door for a minute. I then hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I I waited about an hour and then went walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. So a few months ago, I was out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of western Maryland and we were about 6 miles into an 8 mile loop we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button down shirt, not exactly hiking attire. We decided to set off on the last 2 mile leg of the loop. 
This park goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain slash bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail and you have to walk single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her and I see the same man right behind her, following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe, as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us, in case he is only following closely because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he is carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has sight lines to us, and he turns around looking up at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy, and we don't want to have to pass him again. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and see him walking up the trail too. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area we were at before. We start to strategize and wait, deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There are more people around, so we felt safe for waiting and out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We are talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or is waiting on the trail where it is more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between the slot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and says we need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there, he had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure we got to our car safely and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail but there was no sight of him. I wish I knew where he went and what happened to him but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The events of this story happened 13 years ago and it still messes with me to this day even though I'm not in any sort of danger. When I was in college, I got super depressed and stressed out near my junior year. I was always super into school and just started slipping near the end of my college term so it threw me off bad. Never experienced failing at subjects before and it threw me into a ridiculous stress. I graduated and figured everything would go away with that, but I found myself still very, very mentally foggy. My sister knew how bad off I was from the last few years of school so she hatched a plan to surprise me. I always wanted to go to Miami growing up. I know how lame that sounds, but being a girl who grew up in the Midwest and even went to college there, it was always super exciting looking to me. Up to this point I traveled but never went anywhere as lively or big as Miami always seemed. My sister planned a 5 night vacation with me as a way to get me out of this mental fog and also celebrate in our own way me graduating college. I was super excited. The few months passed and it was time for the trip. We get there and the first few nights were incredible. We hit up the restaurants I had on my little list of places to try and spend many hours by the ocean. I was never a big party girl. Up to this point in my life, I was drunk maybe twice. My sister was the opposite who was at every party that happened in our hometown. She got bored of going back to the room so early every night and convinced me to go to a nightclub with her for the first time. I fought it a bit but let my guard down because I was feeling great for the first time in a long time and was ready to try new things. It was a Saturday night downtown in the middle of summer. We we get to this nightclub and the line is legit wrapped around the building. It was massive. We waited in line for what felt like forever and were let in finally. I walked in the door and felt like I got shot because of the loudness. My sister dragged me to the bar and ordered some shots of some drink with a funny name. Again, I decided to just let my guard down and try new things. As more shots went down, I decided that would be the theme of the night, trying new stuff out. I was aware how boring I was and was, in my opinion, in the most exciting place in the world. Around 45 minutes into dancing and drinking, I became very drunk. 
Borderline blackout. I was very sloppy drunk and was aware of it. I found myself laying on a couch thing in the upstairs area, overlooking the dance floor as my sister was dancing with some guys. As I stayed there trying to consciously sober myself up, I realized how badly I had to pee. So I brought myself up to a sitting position on the couch to stand up and walk to the nearby bathroom. As I sat up, a massive man quickly sat so close to me I could feel his leather pants pressed on my leg. Absolutely over 6 feet tall and looked like some sort of bodybuilder. Admittedly, he he was very good looking, but I was so drunk that I wasn't even trying to flirt and just get up to find the bathroom. He smiled at me and yelled over the music something like this, leaving so soon. I remember nervously laughing and attempted to get up but he grabbed onto my dress and pulled me back to a sitting position next to him. His smile went away and he said in a very deep tone, I don't remember telling you that you were allowed to leave. Even though I was very drunk leading up to this, I felt like I sobered up within seconds. I never had anything like this happen before, but I wasn't going to just allow this guy, no matter how much bigger than me he is to do that to me. I attempted to stand up again and he did the exact same thing, but much more aggressive. I thought it was insanely rude, but I wasn't afraid because of how many people were around me. He tapped my heels with his big yellow leather boots and said, I couldn't help but notice how much I want to screw your feet. My fight or flight kicked in. I slapped him in the face and stood up to walk away. I was very uncomfortable, but I still wasn't afraid just because of the amount of people around. As I was walking away, I heard him laughing and he yelled to me, I'm trying to decide if I want to keep your feet after I cut the rest of your body up into little pieces. I walked away very quickly as I attempted to search for my sister on the dance floor from above. I couldn't find her, so I decided to take my phone out to text her just to see I had missed a call from her. I was out of eye shot from this dude and cut away into the bathroom so I could call her back. It was still pretty loud in there, but it wasn't loud enough to where she couldn't hear me on the phone. I went into a stall and called her back. As I was in the stall, I heard the bathroom door open and someone went into the one directly next to me. I was waiting for her to pick up when I looked down underneath the stall and saw the same guy's very distinct yellow leather boots. He was just standing there. I felt like I was about to die. I knew he knew I was in there. I held my breath and hung up on the phone just staring at his shoes, not moving a single bit from when he shut the door. I heard the main bathroom door open again and I immediately ran out the stall, out the door and straight to outside the club without slowing down once. I was terrified. Just so happens my sister was close to where I came out trying to call me to ask if I was ready to leave. I told her we needed to get back as soon as possible. We got back to the room safely and I told her everything that happened. She suggested calling the police but I was just ready to drop it. We changed up our flight and the next night flew back home. Home. I searched for a few years pretty actively online for arrest in the area to see if he would ever come up. He never did. After a few years, I moved on mentally and got over it for the most part. I don't know who this guy was, if he was trying to say things to scare me, or if he was serious. This story begins when I was in 4th grade, so I was about 9, as I was a bit young for my grade. Because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't get along with them very well. So whenever we would go out to recess, I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day, I went over to my normal spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while when I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence so I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and something tugging on my hair. Surprised, I whipped my head around thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in the gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forward between the branches with his face mostly obscured by leaves and his arm outstretched, trying to grab at my hair. I screamed and bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was very shy back then, so I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a friend who we'll call Matt. Matt was also a bit of an outcast, and when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became fast friends. He was nice enough, but even my nine-year-old self could tell that there was something off about him. He was way too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I of course didn't have any other friends then, so I ignored it. However, one day he told me that he liked me. I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as a yes because he called my home phone later that night. My mom handed me the phone, saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, 
like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now, this would be creepy for anyone, but I was nine. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He was not happy about this, constantly glaring at me and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through fifth grade and had a serious bully problem, but that's a story for another day. It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switch schools the following Monday. Fifth grade at my new school was great, and starting in sixth grade, my parents got me my first phone. Of course, I called up Clara, who became my friend after the Matt incident, and let her know about my new phone. A couple more months passed, and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey, I missed you so much. Why'd you leave me? Not even a second after he said that, I hung up, blocked his number, and called up Clara, as she was the only person at my old school who had my number. Apparently, after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mom, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him, as she was a very kind but quite gullible girl. Soon, she noticed that he was taking a while and that he had a pen out and was writing something on his arm. She yanked her phone away and he panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened up my contact info. I was freaked out but felt safe as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages every time. Every time I would block one number, he'd somehow call from another one. When I got a new phone, the call stopped and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school, and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hairs, touching female students, and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room. The realization hit me like a semi-truck. Smelling and touching girls' hair. It was Matt from all of those years ago when I was reading at that tree. I'm a 24 year old woman and I once worked at a pharmacy store for about a year as a cashier. I had many weird encounters because people were sometimes behind in their medication doses when they came in to pick them up, mostly harmless. The shifts were usually just one cashier and a supervisor, with the supervisor in the back of the store and the cashier alone up front. This happened close to Halloween at about 9am on a sunny, innocent day. I was just chilling at the cash register waiting for customers when a man came in and stood in the aisle across from the register and just stared at me for a good five minutes. I didn't realize that's actually what he was doing until he made eye contact and he didn't look away. He was tall and reminded me of Tyler Labini's character in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, just not the least bit charming. I immediately called my supervisor up front over the loudspeaker and the guy walked down the aisle towards the pharmacy. When my supervisor appeared, I told her what happened. She downplayed it, didn't look for him, and said just to call her if he did anything. Comforting. When she was gone, the man made a loop around the store and came right to my register with a bag of Halloween candy and nothing else. I tried ringing him up quickly, but he started asking me ridiculous questions about our savings card program and insisting he sign up. I slid him a pamphlet to fill out his information because I did not want to speak to him more than I had to. He just stood there holding the pen and staring at me, then suddenly asked if I knew how trick-or-treating originated. I didn't have time to answer him before he started describing how, back in the day, the men that ruled the country would go house to house every year on Halloween and demand the daughters of every age to be handed over so they could, you know. That was trick-or-treating in his mind. As soon as I heard that, I said, get away from me, and walked to the other register and called my supervisor loudly over the speaker because he was blocking my way to the back. He didn't flinch as he followed me to the next register and started talking about how all women are bad and are meant to serve men. He noted my wedding ring and said my husband could also rent me out because it was his right end on and on. I was considering jumping the side of the register to put some distance between us so I could run. Luckily, the male pharmacist heard the panic in my voice and rushed over to the front of the store. He saw the man and shouted, Jake, get out of here. The man, Jake, just stared at him as he calmly walked out and it was so scary and stupid at the same time. Turns out that Jake had been a regular customer until he stopped picking up his medication. Instead, he would just come in and harass female workers and he'd been on a police enforced ban for over a year. My savior, Mr. Pharmacist, called the police and the store manager to cuss her out for still scheduling girls alone after everything Jake did in the past. So such as ripping a toilet seat off of one of our toilets and threatened to beat a girl with it who used to work there. I quickly transferred to a different location because I just could not get over it and the manager kept scheduling us alone. The police only watched the store for a week.
I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that had stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm currently 20 years old. I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself and not a store inside it like me. I had one other friend at my job who was my age and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had and one day she asked if I heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange she didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling, or even someone to be afraid of, just as a very eccentric man. Jessica has also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day, chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior or harmless flirting. If he wasn't a 50-something year old man bringing chocolates to a 16 year old girl he barely knew, I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees and the restaurant was empty. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he had gray hair with bald patches and had beady little eyes which he never adverted from yours. Eric must have sneaked up on me as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy, are you married? He almost laughed after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see my reaction. I began to clock on to the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite insert band here song? I felt creeped out. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was going through my Instagram page. I forced myself to forget all about it and carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre our questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable and he liked it when I got uncomfortable. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that Eric had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric unsettling actions towards me and this manager informed me that a few years ago Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl who used to work for our restaurant into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep yet still employed at the shopping center. On one hand I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason but on the other hand I was frightened as he'd been doing this for years yet no one had stopped him. There was a woman who worked at the same place as me called Rebecca and she had some sort of disability which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her text with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you sat on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here. I was stunned. I was constantly questioning why this old man was so bent on finding out everything I do in my life. He had gone out of his way to source information about me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favorite film, because it's a great film, right? Anyways, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. This was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal and sent three pounds to it and quoted the movie Grease. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous and incessant calls, one after the other. My phone rang all night, I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, 
making it point to breathe heavy. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the links he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all of my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, hurting me or my family? I reported Eric to my managers and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they had witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior of times he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management yet nothing was done, except the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he outsmarted me and found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved cities as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot about Eric. I was soon going to remember though. On Christmas Day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed with a notification. I received a notification from PayPal and it was the exact amount of three pounds, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, sending on behalf of Eric. I had forgotten all about Eric and now he was antagonizing me through other people. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with my family, until I forgot about the notification. I since haven't seen or heard anything from him and I wanted to stay that way. I'm not sure if he still works at the shopping center, but I don't go there anymore so I don't have to find out. So this was back in 2011. There were four girls living in the house, including myself. Parents place and I would sublet rooms. First girl was a child friend who moved in to get away from an abusive ex. Second girl applied via online ad and was normal enough except for telling everyone her daughter was actually her niece. Party girl. Third girl was a run-of-the-mill insurance claim processor and quiet type who kept to herself and usually declined any invitation from the rest of us when going out or socializing. Quiet girl. So party girl and I buy tickets to go to a concert at a town. Childhood friend can't get the time off of work and opts to stay behind as does Quiet Girl. No surprise there. So Party Girl and I leave on our trip and spend the night dancing away. Meanwhile, childhood friend comes home from work to find Quiet Girl sitting in the shower screaming slash crying with the bathroom door wide open. She asks if she's okay and calms her down. Quiet Girl says she wanted to make dinner for all of us and Party Girl and I have ruined her cosmic plans. Childhood friend sees spoiled chicken breasts in the sink and thinks, oh she just wanted to do something nice and offers to go out to dinner together as party girl and I will be back tomorrow night and we can all do dinner then. While at the all-you-can-eat Chinese food restaurant, childhood friend notices quiet girl is stuffing her purse with food. This is odd. She's not wrapping it in napkins, just shoving it in there. When they get home, quiet girl started talking all this crazy stuff that made no sense and childhood friend gets a little nervous and goes to bed early, locks herself in her room and nopes out for the night. When party girl and I get home the next afternoon, we notice a few things. Childhood friend is already at work, but quiet girl is sitting on the living room couch completely naked and has covered her body in the stuffed animals that belong to the rest of us. Rotten chicken is still in the sink and smells strongly of bleach and other chemicals. Knives are laying around and pictures have been removed from the walls. I go to my room and see all the pictures of my dad have been piled up in the middle of my bed. I ask Quiet Girl about this and she explains I need to be reunited with my father. He died in 2003. Party Girl emerges from her room wondering why her underwear is piled up in the middle of her bed and several other possessions have gone missing. Quiet Girl says she needed them for the ritual and explains we can find what we are looking for in the backyard. We find the charred remains of our things in the smoldering fire pit. We are both angry at this point and demand she explain this behavior. This is where she goes full crazy and explains that her souls are all linked and only through death can our bonds be truly realized. She explains that her and my cat are one soul and that he has been telling her about all of our sins and bad behavior. Also that it's actually her cat. She then full on threatens to end our lives as soon as the last member, childhood friend, has arrived. I grab the largest knife I own while party girl and I barricade ourselves in my room in the basement. She calls childhood friend telling her not to come home as it isn't safe and I call 911 as my life has been officially threatened by someone who has clearly lost her grip on all reality. Cops arrive within minutes and ask quiet girl her name. At this point she just starts screaming her first, middle, and last name repeatedly. Over and over again. Will not stop. My cat is trying to sneak out the front door and I ask one of the officers to grab him. She begins to scream that it is her cat and not to touch him. I am 
and Tearson offered to retrieve his adoption papers. I am terrified, I don't know what to do. Party Girl is hiding behind me. Then, Quiet Girl loses her mind, jumps up and attacks the officers. It took three of them to pin her down and arrest her. Once she was removed, I wrote up a letter of eviction and we began bagging up her room. That's when we discovered that she was a schizophrenic who was offered schizophrenia medication. Her boyfriend came later that day to collect her things as I had called him to notify him of the situation and he was totally clueless. He accused the rest of us of running a drug ring party house and driving her insane. Not true at all. We changed the front and the back door locks that night and put new locks on each bedroom door as well. She later tried to serve me papers and sue me for wrongful imprisonment. Pretty sure the cops made that call and not me. Nothing ever came of it obviously. I have not had a roommate I wasn't related to since. This happened about two years ago when I was 22. After work, I stopped at a local convenience store to buy beer. The cashier looked familiar, but it's a very small town, population of 6,000. He acted odd. I asked how he was doing to make small talk and he just stared at me. I instantly felt uncomfortable, so I only glanced at him a few times before I left. I arrived home 10 minutes later and decided to browse Facebook. I had a friend request. The guy looked familiar. He was a local, so I accepted him. A few hours later, I realized it was the cashier. He'd got my name off of my ID and added me not even five minutes after I left. I told my boyfriend we agreed it was weird. A few days later he came into my work. I asked my boss. She'd never seen him in there before. He grabbed milk and initiated small talk with me. I felt uncomfortable. He asked if I remembered him, told me his name and that we'd been good friends in high school. We never said two words to each other. I was trying to be polite, told him yes I remembered. After a few minutes my boss pulled me in the office. She was watching through the window and could tell I was uncomfortable. It was a small farm and we were all close. He started coming in every few days. If I wasn't there, he'd ask for me. After a few weeks, my boss would pull me in the office whenever he'd walk in. All the managers were briefed and did the same. That was all they could do until something happened. Then he stopped coming in. We didn't see him for a few weeks. I was relieved and went about my business. I was allowed to carry my cell phone on the floor. My mom was very sick, so if she needed anything, the managers were fine with her calling me. I got a text from a random number shortly after. I asked who it was and they replied, you don't remember? You gave me this number. It's my stalker. I'll call him George. My heart started pounding. I sent a polite, short message back. After I work, I checked to see if my phone number was anywhere on my Facebook. It wasn't. George started messaging me daily, calling me babe. I was freaked out to say the least. My boyfriend was working out of town with limited cell reception, so I couldn't let him know what was going on. A few days later, I got a message from an old classmate I still talk to once in a while. Hey, did George ever get a hold of you? He said there was an emergency and needed to contact you. Is everything alright? I broke down crying, finally acknowledging that yes, I was being stalked. I didn't know if he was violent and he knew where I worked, so I sent him something like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I have a boyfriend. I didn't want there to be a misunderstanding between us. That's when it got bad. He called me a liar, telling me he doesn't know why my ugly self would even think he was interested in me. No man would be interested in your nasty self. I asked him to leave me alone. The insults got worse. I shut my phone off and tried to ignore him. A few hours later, after calming down, I turned it back on. The last message he sent read, I know where you work. I know where your house is. I could kill you in your house. Try to call the cops on me. I'm in New York right now. Do it. They can't protect you. Obviously not as legible. I could tell he was mad and wrote it in haste. I called a friend and explained. Show her, showed her the text. She took me down to the police station where I showed them the text. I filed a report and later got a restraining order against him. Turns out he already had two other restraining orders from girls he'd done this to as well. My boyfriend came back a week later and I told him what happened and had to stop him from hunting him down. Last year, he tried getting my number from a friend over Facebook. She blocked him. I haven't seen or heard from him since, thankfully. There have been very few times in my life I've been that scared. For some context, I'm a 32 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside, or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab 
lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said sure. He initiated simple conversation to which I obliged, but being careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which department building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person in my life but I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had nearly spent all of my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere, seemingly out of nowhere. The same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and I would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets, with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me. But keep a few faces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim, but he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speed walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked, the moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it. To look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me, it was him. I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me. I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road to, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I was shook. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a co-worker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked and even though I'm terribly shy, I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work and from then on was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then now and I still work at the university. I am so leave to say that I never saw him again after the food court, and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I never asked the guy's name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me. 
When I was in my early 20s, I moved to Southern California with my aunt. Once I had a job established and steady income, I found an apartment that was super affordable at $350 a month, plus utilities, the first red flag because California is not cheap. The other residents in the apartment was a 45 year old male named Zach and a 45 year old female named Tina. They weren't a couple. Tina was a little difficult to deal with, very OCD on a lot of things and we mostly avoided each other. But this story is about Zach and his friend Mike, also 45 years old. Mike and Zach were childhood friends and Mike lived in the same apartment complex as us. So he was over a lot. Every time I would come home from work, they would be polishing off a handle of vodka and then would go out. I wasn't super comfortable in the living situation but it was cheap. And I was in school and I tried to make the best of it. I got along with Zach for the most part if it was just him around, but Mike was just a time bomb. Here are just a few instances that just gradually got worse over time. The first incident. Zach invited me out with Mike and another friend of theirs out to a local bar a couple miles away. I was comfortable around Zach and I got into the passenger side of the truck. I didn't have any negative interactions with anyone until this point. Mike went ballistic in our complex parking lot about how I was selfish and had no business in the front seat because I wasn't Zach's girlfriend etc. It was weird because a man the same age as my dad was throwing a tantrum over the passenger seat, so I just got out and went back to my apartment. My first rent check bounced. I apologized to Zach and discovered that my checks had misprinted the account number. I paid in cash and paid off the bounce check fee and thought all was okay, until I got home one evening and Mike was over as normal, but starts interrogating me on why I couldn't pay my rent. I was only 22 at the time and didn't really want issues, so I was just like, hey, I apologized and took care of it. Even though Mike didn't live in the apartment. He would not let this go. He would just scream at me saying I was lazy, that I should be evicted and on and on. It's also important to note that Mike and Zach both had two DUIs. Zach was a school teacher and ended up being let go because of the DUIs. However, both men continued to drink excessively all the time. I also had to have a key made for the lock on my bedroom door because it would get violent a lot and that was my safety net. A lot of other instances happened, but this one takes the cake and is the point to the story. Zach and Mike had gone out and took an Uber to whatever local bar. I had gotten home and went straight to my room as always. I hear the front door swing open and Mike was pissed drunk screaming his head off about how he lost his new iPhone. This guy starts beating on my bedroom door demanding to be let in because he knew I had his phone. I cracked my door open and he had stepped away from the door with his fist balled up like he was going to hit me. I told him I didn't have the phone. Mike circles back to the one time months prior at this point that my rent check bounced and I obviously need money. He demands that he come into my room and tear my room apart looking for said phone. I told him absolutely not and shut slash locked the door. Mike started banging on my door and trying to unlock it, threatening my life, saying he was going to kill me and lots of other gross and scary things. I was told if I called the police that he would beat me to a bloody pulp. This was especially scary because my aunt was my only family nearby and she wasn't really helpful. She just told me to be an adult and deal with it. Other than that, I didn't really have a support system. I told Zach a couple of days later that I would be moving out immediately and would not be paying rent for that month. Then out of Zach's dark bedroom, Mike just pops up with a smile saying bye, almost taunting. I hurried into my room and locked the door. I could hear Zach blaming Mike for me moving out and Mike continued to just call me names and asking how I had the money to move out. The iPhone was found for anyone who's curious. It had fallen out of his pocket in the Uber he was in, but obviously the first step to finding the iPhone was to flip out on me versus calling the Uber driver. This was almost a decade ago and I don't know what happened to that pair. About two years ago, I worked at a movie store inside a mall. I was 20 at the time. This guy was over 6 foot, late 40s, very hefty, and always had this weird zombified expression on his face. He came in about once a week. One of my coworkers had even warned me about him, how he was a little off, but I still treated him with as much respect as I did everyone else. One day, he came in and we talked for a bit, but it got a little awkward and I kept trying to end the conversation and looked busy by tagging items behind the counter. He stood there in silence watching me for about 20 minutes and finally left. A few days later, he comes back in and walks up to me, holding a large container. He says, I made four pounds of enchiladas at home today, just for you. I remembered you like Mexican food. I don't remember at all telling him that I liked it, but I do know that I went to the Mexican restaurant across the way every lunch break. I just politely accepted it and put it in the back office. Another few days later, he came back in and had a drawing for me of a dragon. Now, I love dragons, but I never told him that. This drawing looked like it took 
took hours to make, and at this point, I was a little freaked out. I had him leave it on the counter so I could just throw it away later. Later on, I was given about a week vacation. During that week, I had cut my hair about 12 inches. The day I came back, I got a shift with my manager. I told her all about the guy, and immediately she was weirded out for me. A few minutes later, I see the dude walking around in the mall. He was going towards the exit and didn't look at me once. My manager tells me to go back to the office. I go and wait until she comes to get to me and when she does, she tells me I need to make a report to mall security immediately. Apparently when I ran back there, he turned around to come in and walked all throughout the store. When she asked him if he needed help with something, he said, I can't believe she cut her hair and briskly walked out. I go to the mall security office to make a report and we went through all the videos from the cameras of when the guy came to visit me, but there was one video that really stood out. The video shows him pull into the parking lot of the mall and about three minutes later I arrive. This was really early in the morning and no customers were here yet, but there were cars in the lot. I didn't notice him at all. It shows me walking through the entrance and him following me. Right as I open the entrance door, the man starts sprinting towards me. I walked inside just in time. It shows him stop and just stand in front of the door, watching me through the glass walk a little further away. He begins walking normally inside the mall. I never noticed him behind me. That part really screwed me up. The video gave the security every reason to ban him from the mall and they did. They later told me they gave him a background check and he had four counts of stalking with restraining orders from different girls on his person and was on probation. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was like 13 years old, probably close to 12 years ago, I went trick or treating with some friends from school. We were the type to bring pillowcases and get as much as we could, then weigh at the end of the night. We've been all over the neighborhood. We lived in a suburban area, but we were quick. We were able to get most of the houses before lights started turning off, and we all had a hefty turnout of candy. Trick or treating was starting to calm down by this point. The time must have been around 9:30 or 10, maybe. There was this one house with the lights off, but we still walked up anyway because they were a couple cars parked outside. We rang the doorbell and nothing, so we rang a few times, still nothing. I'm not defending what we did at all, we were seriously stupid kids back then. One of us starts banging on the door and talking bad like, we're gonna egg your house and so on. Right after that, this man jumps out of the door and basically slams it open. We all jump back startled, it was pitch black inside his house. Where were the other people? There were two cars right in front of his house. He had to be late 20s or early 30s with a scruffy beard, wearing a white beater and black zip up hoodie and had this look of total rage in his eyes. He comes out with this huge dog on a leash that starts barking, growling, and showing his teeth in our face. I couldn't really make it out at the time, but it appeared as though he had a knife in his other hand as well. We're terrified because we didn't expect this. He just busts out the front door and starts chasing us down and we start sprinting away in total fear. He's screaming things like, I'm gonna kill you, and you shouldn't have screwed with me, or better hope my dog doesn't catch you, or get back over here. He ran after us for probably 10-ish minutes. The whole time he was just frantically waving his arm with a knife, shouting mostly incoherently with his dog by his side on that leash. It was horrifying. We got away thankfully, somehow managed to lose him after running for a while, but I can't imagine what would have happened if we stayed there for any longer. I'd probably be chow for his dog, but thankfully we were all pretty healthy kids so we could outrun him. I'm honestly surprised that nobody else was really around to see this maniac chasing us in the middle of the streets. I knew it was later at night, but still. We had to beeline back to my place looking over over our shoulders the whole time because we didn't notice when we lost him and we didn't see him walk back towards his house. He was just gone after we turned a few corners. Now, I understand it would be frustrating for some kids to be at your door being annoying like that, but what gets me is that the reaction from this guy didn't really seem appropriate. I would have just opened the door and told the kids to screw off or threatened to call the cops or something like that. We went back to my parents' house and played Smash Bros on the Wii all night and ate a bunch of candy. We managed to hold onto our pillowcases of candy the whole way home. My friends started crying after we got back. We locked all the doors and windows obviously. We were pretty sure he wasn't around when we went into my house so it seemed safe. That guy's house was right in front of the middle school I went to and I had to walk right by his house to get to school every day. So fearing for my safety, I told my dad. We went back to that house the next day to knock on the door. In hindsight, we probably should have called the cops and let them handle it, but my dad is a confrontational no BS type of guy. So we went over and knocked on the door. This time there were three cars in front of the house. This mother opens the door and we could see inside their kids watching TV. When we told her what happened, her face went pale and she immediately rounded up her family
family and got them outside, fearing this crazy person might still be in her house. She told us that her family went out to another friend's house in the city next to ours for Halloween that night to do all their trick-or-treating. They didn't get home until the next morning because they stayed the night there. It was at that point that cops were called to search the house while we all stood outside. They didn't find anything though, no trace of him turned up. He must have been long gone by then. It turned out that the guy was able to get into their house because there was a window unlocked in the daughter's room on the bottom floor near the front door. Luckily, nobody was in the house that night. The only notable thing the woman could tell the police was that she noticed a car with dark windows parked down the street for a while but didn't think anything of it. He must have been posted up in there with his dog scoping out houses and noticed this whole family get in a car and leave and figured that would be a good opportunity to make his move. So who was this guy? Nothing was stolen from the house, and nothing looked ransacked or the family obviously would have noticed. The family said the front door was still locked when they got back too, so he must have locked it again and went out through that same window to cover his tracks. I'm pretty sure this was before those ring doorbell cameras were popular and I don't think they had any security cameras set up either. I'm not sure to be honest, maybe he was just a drug addict and didn't have a reason for any of it. His eyes did seem pretty crazy and wide open, like he was strung out on something. This happened to me a few years back. I was living on my own in the city and was unemployed at the time, usually out looking for work and trying to stay busy. One early afternoon, I was heading back to my neighborhood after running some errands downtown and boarded a tram that would take me almost all the way home. There was a park that I would have to cross between the stop and my home, but crossing it would only take a few minutes. So I boarded the tram, which was mostly empty. Besides me, there was one younger man in the second carriage and the driver up front in the first. I find an empty two seater, the rows are quite narrow but I'm comfortable. I put my earbuds in and look out the window as we start moving out of downtown and towards home. We pass a couple of stops and don't pick up any new passengers. There had probably been a tram right in front of us who took all the people, so it was particularly empty compared to normal. At the third stop, the doors behind me open, but I don't pay much attention until a stocky man, average height, probably in his 50s with neat, short hair and inconspicuous clothes suddenly sits down on the next seat next to me. The rows are very narrow. This guy is basically trapping me. I can't get past him without his cooperation. He greets me with a huge smile and says hi as he sits down. On this particular day, being down about not finding work and it being broad daylight, I decide I do not want to play along. I just want to listen to my music and I don't like this man's vibe. I tell him I'm not in the mood to talk and he needs to go sit somewhere else. Wrong answer. That man goes from 0 to 100 in 0 0.2 seconds and his face contorts with rage as he starts yelling at me from the top of his lungs. I wish there was an exaggeration but unfortunately it isn't. He was loud. You are a terrible person. You don't clean yourself. You stink of sweat. I didn't. He did. He goes on and on about what an abomination of a person I am and I have sort of a freeze reaction. Inside I am getting very scared. I start looking for a way out but I'm trapped. I look over to the young man hoping he will come to my rescue. I can tell he's hoping to stay out of it but after I've been screamed at for maybe two whole minutes he finally says meekly you better calm down which of course doesn't help. So he just gives up and goes back to whatever he was doing, probably looking at his phone. I am hoping that the driver might react as he has a clear view to the back of the tram and there's no way he's not hearing what's going on, but again, nothing. The stocky man, maybe frustrated that I'm not reacting to his insults, escalates the abuse and starts screaming that he's going to kill me. At this point, I have to do something and unconsciously probably decide that the only way is through. I'm so done with the situation, so before I even realize what I'm doing, I just get up and push past him. It's all survival instinct. Scared that he's going to follow me, I move quickly towards the front of the tram. He gets up and follows me, all red-faced, shouting how he knows where I live and that I need to clean myself behind my ears, that I stink and that he's going to kill me. Again, the driver does nothing. As we pull up to the next stop, which is the stop before mine, I wait until the very last minute before I ask the driver to let me out the front door, which he does. I slip out quickly in hope of escaping without being followed. I don't dare taking the time to look over my shoulder. I just hurry down the steps and away from the stop. I am so scared. Only when the tram has left the station do I take a second to look around me and he's not there. A brief sense of relief washes over me before I start worrying that he's going to get off at the next stop, which is normally my stop, and that he will be waiting for me there. It should have come as no surprise that I do not want this guy to follow me through the park or know where I live, so I spend a good hour just walking around, trying to get my nervous system out of panic mode and staying close to shops where there are other people around before I finally make my own way home.
This happened when I was 21 years old, and I am fully aware I made a lot of poor decisions in my younger days. I am very lucky to have survived, and here's one of my stories. I have just met with a cousin at the mall I hadn't seen in a long time. At this point, I had been living in South America for about a year and had started feeling overly confident. I have been told many times about the dangers of taking a taxi from the street. Some people always take them, and some people never do. It's obviously never worth the risk, but I look obviously foreign, and I should have known better. My cousin says, I always always take street taxis, I'll find us a good cheap one. This was my first time ever taking a street taxi. She finds one and waves me over, looking back, I am flabbergasted as to how I got into an all black car. Again, these cars could just be normal taxis, they exist, but it's even more riskier than taking the yellow ones. The first red flag was how silent he is. After chatting away for some time, we realized it was taking far too long. I could see the smile on my cousin's eyes fade as we both realized at the same time that we are nowhere near home. She asks him, where are we going? and he mumbles under his breath, not really saying anything. We both know at the same time that something is very wrong. I remember vaguely thinking we had just went into a circle and wondering why he'd waited so long to rob us. It had to have been over 30 minutes. He finally gets off a highway and stops the car just past the ramp and we are on a very quiet street. He opens his dashboard and pulls out a gun. I'm terrified to say the least, in that moment, all you think about is surviving. A car drives by and he yells, don't turn your head. He then tells us to give him everything we have. I take off my backpack and even my my jacket out of panic. He orders us to hand over our phones, which we oblige. He then says, I will let you go, but if you turn around to look at my license plate, I will come and kill you. He lets us out of the car and we run for it, but we are in a very, very bad area. I'm dressed inappropriately for the area, especially after handing over my jacket. A foreigner wouldn't dare come here. Everyone on the streets was staring at me up and down and one man yells, aren't you going to get cold? I try to cover myself with my hands as I felt so unsafe. We ask a couple of people to try and contact for help, but what do you know? They have no more minutes on their phone. In South America, it can be very dangerous and very poor. We find no police, but we do find security patrol people. They take us back to their office to contact the police, only for them to tell us we have no data and the phones are broken. So my cousin and I keep walking. It's the middle of the night and we are again in some obscure area. An hour must have passed by now. Then we see a police car and we are running for it. We tell them we had just been robbed and they ask, did you get a license plate number? I reply, no. The police officers shrug and say, he's probably at the club now celebrating all the money he made and proceeded to laugh. I then asked to use their phone to have someone come pick us up to which he says, hurry up, I don't have much data. We get home, but I find out that the person who robbed us used my cousin's phone to contact her family. Luckily, she was already with her parents at the time when they called, but there was a woman in the background crying hysterically, faking to be my cousin and they were trying to get a ransom from her parents. He was never found and nothing was done. I wonder what would have happened if it had just been one of us, and I am grateful that nothing more sinister happened. A week later, my friend and I are ordering a taxi, the safe way of course. While we are waiting, a similar black car pulls up next to us, asking if we need a taxi. We immediately say no. As he drives off, I turn to look at his car, and what do you know, he has no license plate in broad daylight. I'm not insinuating it was the same person. Of course it wasn't, there are over 10 million people in the city. My point is that it happens a lot in South America and never to get too comfortable. This experience made me realize what it's really like to live in a developing country, even if you have money and stay in good areas. You always need to be high alert and no one is immune to the constant fear of, will I be robbed today? Brief setting and context, I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I needed to be cool to sleep and I haven't really worried about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, and I can reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises, and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be be able to do it again. It started at maybe 3.30, 4 a.m. sometime, I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours.
hours. I was reading a book and heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window before jumping up at the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police, my dog will bite, just in case there was someone there, and went to look out of the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too, tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then. It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by or the neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark, but she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She'll usually growl but stay on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the open window to potentially break in, they'd see now that the room was occupied by a person and dog, and would go find an easier target, but mainly I guess it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off soon. Then I heard her growl again, a really serious deep and low growl, and I listened, again, thinking it might be foxes or something, but I heard what sounded like deep breathing noises. I sat up and looked up at the window and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted hey, again, and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and the exit of the front garden. Too dark to make out features or clothing, it was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone, and called 911. One thing that creeps me out in hindsight is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted and he knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. It was so loud, like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure, and it was. Very careful to lock doors and all the other windows at night, and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5am and took the report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow, and they went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5am, the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant I only saw the shape of a person, no real description, I doubt they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and height would have been probably around 5'8 to 5'10. I'm still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like that would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges, since I'm caring for my parents full time now. I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I have to think it was someone who was looking to break into a house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back of the garden with only a small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access against the back of the house. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep by then maybe. This happened a few weeks ago. I work at a gas station and have years of experience in a previous one, so getting this job was a piece of cake. Only this was different as it was lone working. Working 8 hour shifts entirely by yourself. The shifts included night as well. So my shift started early afternoon, about maybe half an hour to my shift this guy walks in. I've seen him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes but luckily someone else was working with me that day for a short while so I asked them to deal with that guy. My colleague said we don't have anything to spare you and told him bye, the guy leaves. The next day the same guy walks in and I thought, what does he want now? He walks up to the desk and starts chatting to me. He was asking me some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me it's not really my place to give advice, I just shrugged and told him to just sleep on it and think about things. He then left. He didn't enter the store to buy anything at all, just a chat but thinking 
looking back, I remember that he asked what time I got off and stupidly told him 11 o'clock tonight. I went on with my shift as usual up until about 9.30 p.m. as the same guy returns but with another guy who may I say look dodgy, all dressed in black and hood up. The guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top ups. We do but something in my gut was telling me to make him leave now, so I lied and told him we do not. So the guy and his dodgy friend hang outside the store for a bit while I was serving customers then until the shop seemed quiet again they both entered the store and looked all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time and then a thought struck me. I might be getting robbed tonight so I took some deep breaths and tried to keep calm and just thought of my training I repeated in my head. I thought to myself that I should just stand and be ready with one hand under the desk hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself the minute they pull a weapon out on me is when to hit the button as its silent alarm and just pray the police arrive on time. Well they just ended up buying a bottle of water as of course I did notice there was someone still outside in their car. I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking they just wanted water, or they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. They both leave the store but again hang around outside, right by the door. Then I see the car drive away and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again, not while I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes, I had no customers and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I call my boss to tell him what's going on and to give him a heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me very anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys all dressed in black and wearing those COVID masks. He also hands his friend's mask too then he makes his way around the back of the store. Then I realize the back door, the one I go out from to smoke. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. At this point I was scared for my life as these guys stack around the place to which felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point I was really freaking out. The next thing I hear is my cell phone ringing as a colleague calls me to check in on me. I told him what's happening when I came out the office to take a peek and of course those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention and they saw me with two phones to my ears. They saw me. I said to my colleague on the phone. Then I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had making a call to the police down and kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen, I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Don't say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say the till is slow you hang up and call the police that's me telling you i'm in danger so i put him on speaker and hide my phone on my bra i head to the window what's up guys can i help you guy why is the door locked that's because we're in night mode right now doors are locked but i can surf through the hatch what can i get you they just look at each other and whisper amongst themselves guy we'll just take some smokes and a lighter sure one moment i grab what they ask and they push a 20 dollar note through i grab the 20 dollars and of course check it then i rang them up but as i had their change ready I saw one hand through the hatch. I dropped their change into that hand avoiding contact. Okay thanks. I stared them down and they left. I demanded that my shifts are to be changed to morning shifts after that night or I'm quitting. Back when I was around 17 or 18, I would go out to parties with my friend at night. It was my best friend at the time, Ivan, and his cousin Caesar that would invite me out that night. I had been talking to a friend of Ivan on Facebook about meeting each other. This girl had a birthday party that day and invited us all to join her. So I took a bath, got ready, and my friends pulled up for me in a small car. I said bye to my mom and got in, and we went to buy beer for the night and a pack of smokes for everyone. Back then, I would smoke a lot. My friend told us that he had been in contact with this girl Facebook and that she accepted to come to the party with him tonight. We were all impressed and happy for him. We pulled to her house and parked near a park to wait for her. I remember a group of people walking around the park but since they seemed our age we weren't too bummed out. My friend called her to come out and my friend Caesar stepped off her smoke. I was sitting in the back not wanting to come out because of these guys outside. They seemed to be asking for trouble because they begun to argue about something really dumb with him. So my friend Ivan told me to step out just to have his back in case anything went down. We went to the party and had a great time. I hit it off with the girl I was talking to and later found out she kissed pretty much every dude that was there before me. Nevertheless, I was still grateful for the opportunity and said goodbye. As we headed back to my house with my friend's date, she seemed very quiet. I knew they hit it off during the party but now looked stiff and even scared. My bud and I were riding in the back to let them have the front to themselves but she was just nervously looking at her phone. When we arrived, she wanted to get out and my friend trying to score points said, wait, I'll walk you in. 
She did not like this and said just go. We were a bit buzzed in the back and wanted to have a smoke so we all stepped outside and watched them go to her door. I remember laughing about something with my friend when the mood suddenly became so dark. She started screaming go now get out of here. A car pulled out nearly in front of us and people with bats and blunt instruments got off so fast I barely remember how I got back into the back seat. The girl said something along the lines of leave them alone and held him while a bunch of dudes got out. My friend Ivan got into the driving seat and started the car. Thankfully it started right up without trouble but a big bottle of liquor then hit the windshield cracking the top corner. I saw some guys come from the right side of the car where we were standing and quickly went to the other side to let my friend have easy way in into the back right seat. As I turned the corner I saw this massive looking guy come up to me and barely had time to close the door and pull the lock down. Dude was punching my window. My other friend wasn't so lucky since he actually got hit in the head and had barely made it in the car. He couldn't even close the door because one guy was grabbing his leg. All of this happened in the span of 6 seconds. I acted all out of instinct and thankfully we got in and my friend stepped in the gas while zigzagging in case they would shoot at us. We were all scared and wondered what had happened. As we got back to our neighborhood my friends were fuming. Both of them knew their way around the fight and could hold their own. Thankfully I still had some cash left and told them we should go buy some illegal beer at midnight and tried my best to calm them down and convince them to not go back. My friend Caesar had actually woken a dude up in the middle of the night with a phone call and the man was ready to show up and throw down. After a few beers and a lot of talking, I convinced them it wasn't worth it and to just let the night end. I got home and my parents never found out and I just fell asleep. The next few days, my friend Ivan called me and told me that the girl's ex-boyfriend was actually a lead gang member. My heart dropped out of my chest. We had been seconds away from getting beat down and maybe killed by a bunch of people for a date. If it wasn't for our quick reaction and her backing them up a bit, we may have not made it. All I can say is trust your gut and your instincts in the end. It can all happen so fast. Many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. I did most of my trips alone. This story is about the first time I visited Prague. I had never been to Prague and the trip was last minute so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country and I was determined to make the best out of my trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, decoration building on a nondescript street about a 10 minute walk to Stair Mesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standing water and dust. I found my room, a double for $12 per night, and made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there, but on her side of the room there was a suitcase, dressed neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair. A scattering of makeup containers on the beat up desk and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. As I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, so I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Wenceslas Square. I purchased some Sheck crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise for one. At around 6 p.m., I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar in Tinska and had a glass of wine. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with someone and was holed up at their place, or hanging out at another hostel, so I was surprised but not concerned. I took another shower before bed, however, and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed up in my return. Her bed was deeply turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing though was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed, my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, my shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was in the shower or somewhere nearby so I expected her to return shortly. After about an hour though, her side was still empty 
empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit and it reminded me of a funhouse. A tightness began to fill my stomach and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me yet I kept glancing back over shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft thud of my flip flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as it left it, except for the silky nightgown which was now back on my bed. Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway, the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed up my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was light, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key, and the hallway empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in my bed, and with the light on. Though I'd pay for two more nights, at 7am, I gathered all of my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been clean since. We only have six people in the whole building. The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. At the time of the story, it's mid-October, I'm 20 years old and a senior in college. I got out of class at 9pm and headed downtown in my college town to see about an open mic thing that was supposed to be happening at a lounge. And around that time, there was a guy who would play accordion on one of the corners of the main through of hair. Didn't find accordion guy, and either the place was closed or it wasn't an open mic night. Don't quite remember. But as I'm walking back down one of the main streets in downtown that heads back onto campus, I came across this very drunk woman begging two other women for a ride home. I think the girls were getting into an Uber or they didn't have space or something. Point is, the other women weren't taking her and couldn't slash wouldn't help her. Mind you, this is a Thursday at 9-ish at night. When she finds that the other women can't help her and I'm walking past, she turns to me to ask for my help getting home. For context, I still have my backpack on. My phone's running low, but I've been at this school and in this town for three years at this point, so I know downtown and campus pretty well on foot. To note, I do not have a car at this point in time. She gives me an address and it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk north slightly northeast of where we were at, and I knew the general area where it was, so I was more than happy to be a good Samaritan and walk a drunk woman home who didn't feel safe. I would regret this later. She's incredibly thankful and overjoyed that someone is willing to help her get home. The route we were going to take was super straightforward and I knew exactly where I was in relation to the rest of the town. She says that she has to pee really badly. I reassure her it won't be that long and she'll be back at her place. She says that she was out with her boyfriend and he left her at the bar alone drunk and mad at her about something. Says she's from out of state. I commiserate with her that what he did was bad. She asked me about what I'm studying. I confided that I was finishing a bachelor's of science and in information technology. She's bemoaning this boyfriend that's at home that I'm walking her back to. She keeps trying to walk with me up against my side or slightly behind me and I'm like no walk slightly ahead of me or keep some space. She has a dermal piercing on her cheekbone that's hard to miss. She's getting more and more manic and weird as we walk along. We get about a half a mile into north downtown less than a a mile from the address she gave me, and the boyfriend's calling her and being a real douche. I'm about done with this guy from the stuff she's telling me about this and that and the other thing, so she puts him on speakerphone and I tell him to chill out. We're on such and such road close by. His tone changes in an instant. He goes from hostile and angry to surprisingly chill. That threw up a million more red flags for me. She starts saying that I'm going to have a good time at her house. I'm looking for an exit. Every bone in my body is screaming at me to get out of this situation. We get to the end of the road, which coincides 
arrives with an intersection that has a gas station. I say, hey, let's stop here to use the bathroom. She says that she doesn't have to use the bathroom anymore. I'm scared. I tell her, well, maybe you don't have to, but I do, which was true. We go into the gas station. I head immediately to the bathroom and text one of my friends asking if she was working and if she could pick me up or if I needed to call the campus safe ride home program. Friend says it'll be a minute if I'm willing to wait. I agree to wait. I come out of the bathroom and this drunk woman, if she was even actually drunk to begin with, has vanished. Nowhere in the store, nowhere outside that I care to look. I buy a soda and wait for my friend and her friends to come save me effectively. I'm later told that maybe the woman was affiliated with human trafficking and to be honest, with the vibes and the changes in tone and the narrative that was being spun around me walking this woman home and how she just completely vanished on me when I got to a safe place with lights and cameras and such, I have to wonder if that wasn't the plan. I won't ever know for certain, but it certainly scared the ever-loving daylights out of me as a 20-year-old. My friend and her friends pull up and take me back to one of their dorms and I spend more of the evening with them so I wasn't alone. Forever thankful for three underclassmen for rescuing me from a gas station at 10 p.m. Last year I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We have been there for a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing with Uber is, it allows very cheap and flexible transport but it also opened the door to a lot of creeps. I have had Uber drivers who are super cool but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're impressive but the guy we had that day was by far the worst. It is late evening and Uber picks us up and drives me. 27 year old male, another one, 25 year old female and 24 year old female to the desired old town where we plan to go clubbing and drink. While driving, the driver constantly looks at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. They only told me this afterwards. He kept starting conversations but basically only addressed the girls who left answering to the guys who gave short non-detailed answers, basically signaling that we, one, don't want to talk and two, don't think he needs to know our plans. To us, he seemed way too pushy and he wasn't really that big on hygiene. Meanwhile, we can't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super horrible situation. But that stuff did not feel this great when this guy didn't stop on the road but instead pulled into a parking spot. He started fumbling with his phone and we were like, alright, weird, but let's get out and left the car. To our surprise, the guy then turned the car off and got out as well. We saw that red flag and just started walking away towards the bar area of the town without saying a word. Cars can't enter the old town. After 400 feet, once we reached the gates, we stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group, who took a separate Uber, and found out that this guy was following us and stopped as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking, where one guy is just kind of standing next to it because people don't let him in? Yeah, we did that. We started making conversation about how long the others will take to get here, where they are right now, etc. And this guy keeps throwing in comments like he is a part of the group. Oh cool, even more people. This must be a great evening. Then we texted our friends at a group chat that we are changing their meeting place to this bar because the Uber driver is following us around and we want to lose him. So one of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They are very small, lots of people, high old town buildings all around them. We make turns at every corner trying to lose the guy but he follows. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of people closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost the guy. Finally, we could head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other part of our group. Two hours pass, life is all good. We decide to head to another bar a bit further away because the drinks and prices kind of sucked in this one. We had two drinks in that bar and guess who walks through the door and stands next to the table? That guy. Hey guys, he says. At this point, a friend, 28 year old male, who is good at communicating and frankly quite big, tells the guy that we want to keep to ourselves and have no interest in hanging out with him. Please leave us alone. Fortunately, Unfortunately, the guy says it is no problem and leaves. Unfortunately, at around 3am, while dancing in the crowd at a club, the same guy announced his presence by tenderly pressing his body against the back of one of the girls who he has been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognizes the guy, gets angry, grabs him by the collar, and essentially tells him that if he keeps following us, he will get beaten up. A bouncer sees this and approaches them. I start talking to the bouncer, who is super annoyed by anyone intervening at first, but after hearing how this guy stalked us from this car to this club, he just asks the Uber guy a few questions, then proceeds to throw him out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us. After that, we reported the guy for being a creep in the app and called another Uber, which thankfully wasn't him. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. 
two years ago, I moved to the UK for university as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too bad for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people. It was a good year without meeting my boyfriend, who I'm still with and just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, as second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise and parties as living in a small shared flat like in first year. No, I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a very small backyard in which I would go smoke every day as I am a smoker and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs blah blah. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard but since it was an old door we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were strange so to say. I met one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention due to one of his flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them having cuts everywhere on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by a kitchen knife. Me and my flatmates didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his clothes. We then saw the guy who hurt these flatmates being escorted out by the police and into a van and driven off to be arrested. I don't know anything more about the story, the police didn't really tell us anything else. Anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to grab me and flirt with me, but we just wanted to make sure he was okay as we didn't know him. Then after some time had passed, I would go to uni and come back home and see him quite often in the street and just never said a word to him again. But one day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly and I didn't feel comfortable at all with that for some reason so I just didn't respond to him. He then just said, oh that's okay, I'll just wait in front of your house then and we can talk further. No need to say I was creeped out and just thought he was joking. So I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street and as I turned into the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. So I went back to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away but obviously he wasn't home and no one else was there either so I literally just waited it out until they left about an hour later and then sprinted back home and locked the front door. Note, my front door had a glass panel on it where you would be able to kind of make out who was standing in front of it. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while but then one day as I went smoking in the backyard I noticed that the wooden door which is always closed was open and the strings that were put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house and it would take me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night but we kind of just got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get out of the room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more opened, and one of the guys saying something in a different language that we didn't understand and started hearing them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone, and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. So I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police, who luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came, I think me and my boyfriend were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they were in inside of their house and found a lot of meth and heroin, and that they were carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I've never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors, so the idea of them breaking in with whatever knows what intentions with the kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police, and I moved back home a few months later.
I was 17 when this story happened three years ago now. I was working at an old pizza shop right on the edge of my town. For context, the town I was in was an affluent, suburban town surrounded by a bypass which loops around the town. Around my town is some farmland and main roads, where all the blue collar workers moved to after the town was gentrified 10 to 15 years back. The pizza shop was around 20 years and was very catered to these same blue collar workers. It's around 9pm and a call comes in for two pizzas and a 2 liter of soda. I'm the only driver in, so I have to take the delivery out. It's about a 10 minute drive to get to the location. There I have to drive up a long, gravel driveway that took about 5 minutes to get up. My car really couldn't handle the gravel and how rough it was. Arriving at the place I see a nice house and two barns plotted across the land, with wheat 5 to 6 feet tall surrounding the whole property. Being at this place when I felt truly all alone really started to make my anxiety flare. I decided to call the number on the order because I have no idea where this guy wants me to go and drop off his food. After about another 5 minutes of absolute silence, the man picks up. He had a very deep and raspy voice, like he's been a career smoker, which didn't do anything to help me feel better. I was told to meet him at his truck at the far barn on his property. I am now properly scared as my mind races of all of the worst possible things that could happen to me. I pull myself together and muster further into this guy's property. I see the man's truck as I round one of those cylinder storage units where I see his F-150 and him inside. Instead of getting out, I call him and ask him how we should do the transaction. In that same deep voice he instructs me to get out of my car and to put all the food onto his truck bed. Since he paid with his credit card already, I thought this would have been over in 10 seconds. I do what he tells me to do and walk over to the passenger window so that he can sign his receipt. The man looks to be around his mid 40s, heavy set with a scraggly black beard and a trucker hat. My mind was already racing on being kidnapped or murdered so I really didn't feel safe around this guy. I ask him if he has a pen on him because I forgot to bring one. I was pretty bad at my job and he did not have any cash on him. He stares at me with these cold eyes and points into the back of his truck saying to me, if you ask me for a tip I'm going to be sticking this tip down your throat, where he has a double barrel shotgun just in the back of his car. I'm frozen in fear as I'm registering that this man has just threatened to kill me. The only thing I can muster out is okay and I get back into my car and I get out of that farm. I was going so fast that I screwed up my car from my car bouncing around on that gravel path. I go 80 all the way back to the pizza parlor where I tell my co-workers what happened. None of my co-workers took me seriously and just thought I was playing this up for a joke. I go home and forget about it pretty quickly, but a year later I'm working the lunch shift and the same man calls in and orders a pizza. Now at this point I am refusing to take this order. The pizza place I was working at wasn't doing well business wise, so it's on its last legs already, so management forced me into going anyways. It was only 1 to 2 p.m. on a Sunday, so at least my fear of the dark would be covered. I get there and the man is waiting for me at his actual house. He recognized me and out of all things started apologizing to me for what he said. He was excusing it saying that he just started going through a divorce and was struggling with his emotions. I just wanted the whole thing to be over with and he gave me $60 for what happened. When I was 6 years old, I attended the elementary school which is located in our small town. My way to and from school was basically just 500 meters of main road before turning into the street where I lived. At the time, we're talking about the late 90s here. All the parents in the town were extremely adamant on telling their kids not to trust or follow strangers. Never get into anyone's car, even if they say they know your parents and are friends. The reason why, there was a murder 3 years back in the same town. A girl, not even 6 years old, was found dead in a field. The strange thing about it is, nobody knows how exactly she was taken, no signs of forced entry or anything, which implies somebody lured her somewhere without her suspecting a thing. The case still hasn't been solved more than 20 years later, so our parents were very afraid that their kid was going to be next, because kids can be really stupid and you can't watch them 24-7. Now onto what almost happened to me. I was walking home from elementary school, about halfway home, at the shadiest and mostly covered by trees and bushes area, a car pulled up next to me. A blonde about 30-ish year old woman was the driver. She told me she could drive me home. She claimed to be going in that direction anyway, which was unclear to me at the time. Essentially BS because once the road ends near my house, there is nothing but empty fields. Kid-like as I was, I was not suspicious and was like, oh no, it's not that far, I can walk. Then she started becoming more insistent. The whole, oh come on, it is fine, nothing to worry about, and you can relax instead of walking thing. The alarm bells only started ringing when she said she 
she knew my mother. They are friends and supposedly she was asked by her to drive me home. Thank god for my parents repeatedly talking about the tricks that people use to lure you in. I started being creeped out, continued to walk, but she kept driving beside me. Now the real weird part in hindsight was her next attempt to get me to the car. She started saying that I was obviously afraid and cool children are not afraid of such things. If you want to be cool you should just relax. Honestly, I did not fully realize the full extent of the situation. I just felt uncomfortable and wanted to get out of this conversation, so I just started sprinting the rest of my way back to my house. Once I got home, I stayed right next to the door and kept looking out of the window for a few minutes. And guess who drove by and basically checked out the house, that creepy woman. The road was a dead end road, and only after 3 more minutes the car came back the same way. It took years until I realized what kind of bullet I dodged there. All I was thinking was, my parents told me not to do this. I didn't know why or what that woman wanted. The drill of hearing over and over again not to believe strangers or get into their car kicked in. Moral of the story is, even if your kids are too stupid or young, like I was, to comprehend such things, the rules of not following strangers and the fact that strangers will lie to you for evil intentions must be drilled into your child's head like watching both ways when crossing the road. Last night, my 25 year old husband woke me up at around 11.50 to tell me that someone has been knocking on our door and ringing our apartment doorbell for about 10 minutes on and off. He woke me so I could possibly ID the person. Once I looked out our upstairs apartment window, I saw the man walking to his car in our apartment parking lot, across the street from our unit. He was wearing blue jeans and a grey t-shirt. He was a medium build, possibly a 30 year old blonde man. He wasn't covering his face or anything, but the thing is, he was carrying what looked like resistance bands or rope. He sat in his car for around 3 minutes while I was on the phone with dispatch. Then he came back to our door and knocked hard for another few minutes. Dispatch advised me that the police were on their way and they hung up. I started videoing the vehicle. I read out the tag number and make and model and just watched as he put his car in park in reverse over and over again. Out of seemingly nowhere, he backed out of the parking lot and started rushing away, but not before the officer arrived and pulled him over. My downstairs neighbor knocked on my door and told me that he had been peering into her little children's windows It was pounding on her door as well. She said that her husband had left only one minute before he started knocking at her door. She said he saw her children through the window and that's why he continued knocking. Our doors are right next to one another, so he probably didn't know what door he wanted opened. He was watching us as well through our upstairs windows, so I turned all the lights out and shut the blinds while I called dispatch. The police never contacted us for a statement. I've reached out to dispatch about an update and I'm waiting to see if any action was taken. We're keeping our eyes peeled to see if he's been following us. I'm replacing my porch light bulbs with motion detectors and putting bars in our window and door tracks. My neighbor and our families are panicked to say the least. He was outside for about 25 to 30 minutes. Update. I am trained in firearm usage and now live in a state where I can open carry and the background check is really quick. We are going this weekend to get a firearm. My husband will be taking some classes as he came from somewhere where owning a gun is illegal so he's never handled one. I am still waiting on a call from the responding officer. I have his badge number and name so if they don't reach out to me today or tonight, he might work third shift, I will call the substation. If they didn't do anything, I will go ahead and make a suspicious person case for the paper trail. We had no odd encounters last night. However, while I was looking at the video I took, I remember that car. I was walking my dog at 8pm a week ago from him to pee, and this car was driving really slowly through the parking lot and parked a few spots down from where I was letting my dog sniff. They just sat there with the car running. When I tell you my ears started ringing and I got an awful feeling, I'm not joking. I turned around and went home, didn't give my dog the chance to pee, and shut every door window. I think this man has been stalking out our apartment building, me and my neighbors, and I think he wanted to get in where those children are. I'll update more when I have new information. Update 2. It's been a week since the incident. I called the dispatch today because I never received a follow up from the responding officer. A sergeant from the PD called me back to give me more information. He said that they pulled over the man, ran him to make sure that there were no warrants, and asked him what he was doing. He told the officer that he was meeting up with an acquaintance. The officer let him go with no further questions. I about lost my mind. The sergeant I spoke to today 
stated that he should have looked into it more, it was obviously an attempt at burglary with whatever knows what intentions. The responding officer is supposed to call me tonight when he gets on duty. I'm livid honestly. Zero due diligence for this case, but there's not even a case. No case number, just a documented police contact. I'll give more info when I have it. Final update. The officer finally called me. Here's how the conversation went. I answered groggily. It was well past midnight. Hello miss, I was told you have some questions about an incident a few nights ago. Yes, about Thursday. I wanted to know what the man told you he was doing. You know, he was looking at windows and carrying potential restraints. I'm not sure if that was relayed to you. I stopped him, ran his tags, and he told me that he was meeting up with a guy from a dating app. He seemed forthcoming and open with his motive for being there. Meeting up with weight. He was meeting up with someone by looking in windows, knocking on two different doors for 20 minutes. I was shocked and still not fully awake. Like I said, he seemed forthcoming and honest with me. With resistance bands, like workout bands, he had lots of belongings in his car, so he just probably had them in there. Right. But bringing them to a hookup, knocking on multiple doors, he saw the little girls through the window. He waited until my neighbor's husband left until knocking. That's on tape, officer. I checked in with the apartment management after the incident. Well, I'm familiar with this individual, and I've been doing drive throughs of your complex to make sure he doesn't come back. I haven't seen anything. If you don't have any more questions, I'll let you go, ma'am. Doesn't make sense to me, but thank you, goodbye, and I hung up. I don't have much to say, I just feel so icky about that conversation. Nothing new has come of the situation. I haven't seen the man or the car. My mind is blown at the lack of follow up or due diligence. I live in a suburb, it's not a busy one either. The PD has a small jurisdiction. Guess I'll have to protect myself. I was 24 at the time, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than most nights as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing around 12am instead of keeping customers until 2.30am. Usually I'd be the only one left as I start cutting staff as the night went on and since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on. About 2 months in of regularly closing at 12am, I was walking home. I used to bring bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone as I've been followed and chased multiple times before and we'd often get men waiting after hours for us girls to come out knowing we'd eventually come out after closing and didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home as I didn't have a car and had a few terrifying experiences with Uber drivers not actually driving me home, turning out to be fake cab slash Uber drivers or harassing me until I pretended to show interest or give them some way of contacting me to which Uber would just give me a $5 coupon for the trouble, but that's a story for another other time. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown. Often at this time I'd maybe see a handful of people but the streets were generally empty. I'm walking and notice a parked car about a block away. The driver noticed me and u turns around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he's catcalling me and trying to get me to come into his car. I don't engage and keep walking. We're maybe a block or two past the initial spot I saw him and he's been slowly driving alongside the sidewalk. I'd crossed the street but didn't want to get near his car. He keeps this up until about halfway mark when he takes off in his car and I'm just relieved he's gone. He then comes blasting back down the road. Now my walk has turned into a light jog which then turns me into full on running. I'm running behind closed bars and businesses now trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I live. At one point, I'm running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I end up on, his car is waiting for me. Eventually, I run right in front of his car while it's parked on the side street beside my place or run into my house through the back entrance. The back entrance is obscured by plenty of trees and car, and the surrounding houses are multiple unit homes, so I was confident he didn't see what door I got in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday, and I'm walking home. Guess whose car is parked at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four Tuesdays, except he started parking on the street in front of my house until I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance and I stayed with them which led them to drive off for the night. A week passes and I'm no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sends me a news article via text. I open it and see that the man who's been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He got caught because he'd followed a university student up to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him. He got out the next day I believe and was arrested a few more times and was put on restrictions. Couldn't be out of his parents house between certain hours unaccompanied by either parent before he was deported. I've also heard he didn't actually get deported but I moved away shortly after and didn't keep up with the news on him.
It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80 pound Aussie mix and my 80 pound German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I always have issues sleeping when I'm home alone, so I tend to just binge watch TV in the living room until I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This particular night, I remember that the trash pickup comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realize it's 1.30 a.m and I still haven't taken the trash out to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street or anywhere in our neighborhood isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor, smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late so I usually see him and we wave, say hi, chat a little, then I go inside and he makes the joke, you didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So unbothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk, but also maybe it was a guy taking a night walk. Not unusual in our neighborhood, and just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out, went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and I woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you can take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Aussie mix is more passive, but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog, however, continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window, which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything. Eventually, my dog settled back down with my other dog, but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching TV again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later, I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed no one was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the 6 foot back gate. My Aussie mix, going crazy, bust out of one of our door side lights. I heard the guys say, oh crap, and immediately, I let out my German Shepherd mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch on the guy's hand, the guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he'll hurt my dog, so I run out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy with blood all over his face. I called the police. They took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband bawling and he got on the next flight home. I stayed at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant ribeyes for being so good in saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted, but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. Quick backstory, I have had a stalker for about 4 years. He was never aggressive or sent me proper threats, so stubborn as I am, I did my best to ignore him and not give him the satisfaction of showing him any fear. His stalking behavior mostly just consisted of sending me letters and gifts, such as photos of my own apartment building from the outside, things he dug out of my trash can and so on. I called the police many times but they weren't able to or really tried to be honest catch or identify him. About 3 weeks ago, I discovered the AITA subreddit and thought that people might want to know about what it's like to have a stalker. Since I barely use any social media aside from reddit and have no personally identifying information here, I didn't think he'd ever see it. One person even asked, does he know you're putting him on blast on reddit? And I answered, maybe. Maybe it would make him angry, maybe he'd be turned on. Don't know, don't care. Well, I know the real answer now. He did see it and he did not like it. Like I said, he was never aggressive and never came close to me. The closest I know of was when he sent me a picture of myself, unlocking 
opening my apartment door, taking from the corner of the steps above. I'm thinking that he might have hit a camera there instead of being there to take the photo himself. I think I would have noticed him if he did. I don't know how he got wind of the AITA post I made, but he did. The next week was quiet, no letters, and I didn't see him anywhere. Then, he left me letters with printed out questions and my answers from the AITA post. He also left me with a long, hateful letter towards my boyfriend about an issue I had posted on the AITA subreddit. His letters were never hateful like that before, though he never seemed happy with my boyfriend. He wrote about how I should share the spotlight with him since I got so much attention thanks to him. A few days later, I got a gift, but this time he didn't leave it in my mailbox or at my car like he usually did. No, this time he left it inside the apartment building right in front of my door. I didn't take it inside my apartment but opened it outside. It was a pretty big box, which was also unusual, and it was taped shut. As I'm typing it out now, I realized that wasn't a good idea at all and could have ended badly for me. But luckily, he didn't send me anything deadly or anything. He did, however, send me several zip ties, a roll of tape, the kind you use to tape off walls when painting, nothing you could use to restrain someone, a TV remote with most buttons picked off, a pack of band-aids with a few used ones, not actually, just made to look that way according to the police, and a framed picture of me. I could tell the picture was taken a few days ago and my boyfriend was next to me but cut out of the photo. The frame was shattered and the package was full of glass shards, clearly more than just what could have fallen out of the frame and they were also intentionally put inside the crumbled newspaper that was stuffed in there to keep it all in place. I called the police right away and gave it to them. They were more concerned this time, finally, thanks. It told me they'd send patrol cars more frequently. He didn't show up or leave me any letters or gifts for about another week and a half. But eight days ago, it started again. I found letters in my mailbox where he wrote about how he wasted his time on me, how I haven't been appreciating his effort, how he was wrong about me being special. Five days ago, I left my apartment in the morning and heard a crunch sound as I stepped onto my doormat. He put broken glass under it in the night. I went off to work because I was in a hurry and was just going to make my boyfriend call the police, but then I found my car had also been vandalized. The sides were scratched, lights smashed, and the windshield had a phrase painted on. It's time soon, miss, my last name. I went back inside and called the cops myself. They found the same phrase on a note under the doormat. This time, they really, really, really took me seriously, which might have been because I was just pissed at this point, which I made very clear. All of this, the letters, gifts, photos, even the glass under my doormat, are just really annoying and inconvenient. But my car was useless to me now, and the threat scared me even more. I did, however, have a dash cam in my car, and it caught everything. The police said they took the footage as evidence, even though the dash cam footage wasn't of high quality, and I had given them photos of him that were just as good before, but they said it's not enough. And they told me they'll look into it further and promise to send more patrol cars again. Then it was quiet for two more days. Until two days ago, someone rang the doorbell at just after 4am. My boyfriend and I got up, but we were both hesitant, but I saw the blue lights outside, and just as I got up, I heard them shouting, this is the police, please open the door. They told us they were called by one of our downstairs neighbors, who came home from his night shift after about an hour earlier, and heard someone else entering the building after them before their door fell shut. My neighbors know of my situation, and I've asked them to make sure they don't let strangers into the building. This neighbor then went into his own apartment and looked through the peephole. We have motion activated lights in the stairway, so he waited to see if they had turned back on. They did. Then he saw a middle aged man walk upstairs. Above this neighbor are only me and my boyfriend, and a single mom with three kids who probably won't be getting any visitors at 3 a.m., so he called the police. They came and found my stalker one half floor above me on the stairs. He should have been able to see the cop car since there was a little window up there and they had their lights on, but he either missed them or wanted to get caught. They found a pocket knife on him and he confessed to being my stalker right away. He's finally caught. They got him. It took four years and one very vigilant and caring neighbor, but he's finally done. He's facing several charges and I've collected every single piece of evidence over the past four years. I don't know what kind of outcome I can expect, but for now, I finally got some peace. When I was a kid, my mom worked as a teacher and she was very close to a co-worker of hers who had a son around my age and of whom I, as well, was very close. When my mom or her friend would head out for the night, the other would take care of both of us kids and basically, it meant I spent half of my time over there and my friend spent half of his time at my house, which was perfect and fun for us. We lived in different cities, but since that kind of system had been going on pretty much forever since, I grew up knowing my friend's city just as well as mine. His mom was well aware of that, so 
so that being said, whenever we were going on a walk in their area, she let us wander around because she knew we'd always find our way back to her. My mom though was more cautious and always kept an eye on us, as she'd walk behind us to make sure she always was able to see us. I just wish her friend would have done the same. One day, I had to be around 6 or 7, we were going on a walk with my friend Marcus and his mom Katie. It was a very sunny day and I was wearing a dress with embroidered flowers and I had my blonde long hair down. During that walk, Katie was walking ahead of us and I was chatting and just fooling around with Marcus when he suddenly remembered something urgent to tell his mom. As urgent as something can be for an 8 year old boy. He ran up to her and left me strolling behind for a couple of minutes, just as it already had happened a hundred times prior. That time though, we were circling around a big camping site and we walked by the white vans and camping cars. One of those vans had its back doors open and there was a man, probably in his mid 40s, smoking a cigarette and leaning on the vehicle. He locked eyes with me as I was approaching, then saw that Katie and Marcus weren't paying much attention to me as they were already a couple of meters ahead. Then he proceeded to pull me by my arm close to him and so I found myself with my body touching his. So weirded out that I didn't even say a word, although I knew Katie would have heard me if I called for help. He leaned toward me as he was obviously much taller than I was, muttering something I didn't get and he winked at me and kissed me on the lips and then pulled me to the open doors of his van. At this point, if he had pushed me just a little, I would have fell in the truck. At this point, I was just too scared to even lift a finger, and even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I knew it wasn't okay. He put his hands on the door as to close the vehicle and I felt my heart sink. At that exact moment, some other man jogged towards us, in his 40s as well, waving hello to me and saying something along the lines of, I lost sight of you for a bit. I was so scared. He had a very friendly look on his face and was staring at me with a great insistence and with a huge reassuring smile. And the van man awkwardly laughed and yanked me out of the way of the car, slamming the door shut. I ran to Katie as I heard the van go off and just acted as if nothing had happened. To this day, I never told that story to anyone, not to Katie or Marcus. Not to my mom, nobody. I am 22 years old today. Last year, I was staying in a university hall for my final year. It's a private building so not connected to the university and out in the city near the main town. We have a car park but nobody really uses it because we are poor students and it costs money to park there so mine was one of the only two or three cars at a given time. The car park isn't well lit and it's to the side of the building so you have to walk for about two or three minutes to get into the main door. I was sitting in my car one evening after getting back from the gym, just scrolling on my phone because my seat was warm and it was dark and raining outside so I couldn't be bothered to get up yet. I was reading an article when suddenly someone started knocking on my window which was really odd. It was a man dressed all in black and he started telling me how his friend had seen me through the window and thought I was really attractive so could he have my number. I responded no that's a bit odd and I don't feel comfortable with it. He continued to be insistent for a while practically begging me to get out and give them my number or any social media details telling me I should come over and speak to his friend who was weirdly stood at the other side of the car park for the away from the building. I kept saying no and scrolling on my phone to show that I wasn't interested. He finally relented and walked away. I text one of my friends to ask if he'd come and get me and walk with me to the building. As I was waiting, this man returned but now with his hood up and he started banging loudly on my window, saying that I was being rude, ungrateful, calling me all kinds of names. I kept staring at my phone and pretending I couldn't hear him. He then started trying my door handle, thankfully I locked my car after the first encounter, and then began violently pushing into my car when it didn't work. I still kept ignoring him and text for my friend to probably bring some other friends with him. My friend was taking a long time to read my message and I was terrified but for some reason didn't think to call the police, probably because I was scared of things escalating. The guy at my window had calmed down after a few minutes and walked off, saying that he'd leave me alone now. However, I watched him out of the corner of my eye join up with his friend and then maybe three or four other men. They walked so they were out of sight, but I could see their shadows lingering as they kind of circled around my car and moved towards the building but staying in the dark. They lingered there for for a while until luckily another car came which was obviously full of students going to a party due to the loud music and singing going on inside. This group of men left as they saw these people arrive and I latched onto them and was able to walk with them as they entered the building. When I got home, my friend finally responded. He said that he'd actually heard about these guys before. Apparently they'd followed another girl into the building and into the lift a couple of days prior, then stood in the lift making really gross comments to her. She had to run to her door and lock it, where they then stood outside knocking on the door and whispering for her to open it. We were able to report this to the building who, to their credit, then hired a permanent set of security staff. We also got the CCTV footage of both incidents and were able to pass this on to the police. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. 
My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet loving dog. She was an ESA dog but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped anyone and she had no sense of smell so she loved all animals and people. A real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I, 11 years old, was at home with my siblings, 2 years old and 6 years old. My then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer, having a grand time watching YouTube videos, when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston terriers and one chihuahua perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've ever heard her bark, ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up here were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the intention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky, and I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me, even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer looking t-shirt and new jeans. But he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas, and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion, because I definitely don't know this man, and I asked him what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there kiddo, I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seems so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving. Because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I'd have to go get my mom. Something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead I just shook my head and said, no we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things and he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock. Small town, hard to access home, we never needed a lock, so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen, and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen, when all of a sudden I hear it. Punky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me, and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about, but Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone jump up with him running when he got onto the road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew. No barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realized my siblings are still down the hall and run to check on them, and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch, where Punky 
Punky was sleeping. So I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off. And the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took all of us to my aunt's house. And on our way there, we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work slash travel experience and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time, Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey, and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and the kitchen. The back wall was complete glass and looked out into the garden, and the garden was completely fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life. I adored all of my roommates except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for 7 months, I was over her antics. One day, I come home from work, I lock the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I am in my night tight with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze and then soon after that a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. I am working away, completely focused until I feel something. I look up to see a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room in on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home. He doesn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs you, he then interrupts. I am not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I start surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He is about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair and black eyes. He has a light blue polo shirt on and one side of his collar is popped up in a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper bottle anyways. He nodded replying, yeah, let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I am shaking all over and try to gain control of my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my night tie bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying, I was most likely rambling, I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there is a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us is the kitchen and living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that had the wine glasses. He said he knew where they were and started walking towards them. I now have the kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumble over the lock, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help and suddenly I am flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin and sent sharp pains where they are jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and to call the police. I lock the doors and I call the police. While I am on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and doors. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that the police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me. I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freak out. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I am losing my ever-loving mind. She then said, they are pulling onto your street now, you should hear their sirens. I did. The intruder then blasts off, one officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home, interviews me and the two gentlemen, collects evidence, takes photos. The next morning I am called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go 
into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked me if the items were mine. They were. They were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimates three months. He had made a nest outside our home on top of a hill that overlooked into our living room and kitchen. He is a known offender and drug dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. So this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit, but the situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time and so was video chatting. Thank Tiny Chat. This is important for later. I was on an online dating site and was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time and he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going to a bar. I'm also not a big drinker. I invited him over to my place, I know, after he finished at the bar and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and know how to defend myself, if needed. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo in a hot day. The air went out at work, put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam program and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10 p.m. and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later he asked for some water so I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I came back he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left I looked on my nightstand where I put the firearm down after showing him and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm and he left his phone on my bed. Right then his phone rings and I answer it. Come to find out he's married. His wife was calling him wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this. Him, I need my phone, give me my phone. Me, not opening the door but yelling through the window. Take the clip out of my firearm, empty the chamber, throw the clip into the bushes. The one in the chamber across the road and put it on the ground. Him, no, give me my phone. Me, I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment and I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker. Wife. A whole bunch of expletives. Him, he runs and gets in his car and then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch. At this point, I make him into his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off, and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone. I go outside and get in his car, in the driver's seat, and tell him to take me to where he threw my firearm. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, domestic violence, involving a firearm. We get up the road, he tells me that the firearm is there in the ditch. Then, I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. I could make him go get it, taking a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on his phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number, and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me, and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket, so now he's enjoying some time in prison. So glad I never have to meet this person again. This takes place around 10 years ago when I was like 8 or 9. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood in what was at the time a really rundown city. It wasn't good but it wasn't bad at the same time, just a few bad apples in the tree. Anyways, enough background on the neighborhood and now to the main story. My friends and I loved to play outside, it was the only thing we could do. No one in the neighborhood could afford any sort of electronics or any sort of fun machine to play with. We loved to just run through people's yards, cutting through houses if they just so happened to leave their door open. Now looking back 
back on it, it is probably the dumbest thing kids our age could have been doing in a neighborhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running in people's houses. Just wanted to let you know how dumb of kids we were. Well, on one fateful day, we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiders and one of us a seeker. We thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighborhood so that the seeker could never find us and we'd win. We like to call that part of the neighborhood the rich part because they had two story houses over there and a forest with a creek in it. We were just doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping fences when we heard the loudest scream maybe four to five houses down. After hopping off the fence that we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around wondering where it came from. I noticed that one of our hiders weren't with us anymore. Three of us left. Where's Isaac? I exclaimed. We heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound came from and we all jumped back over the fence we just jumped from and ran towards the scream. When we thought we got to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land in the forest. We all started to get scared. Did Isaac get lost in the forest? Did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again. It was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other 8 year olds and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified their faces were. I knew at that moment that I was definitely the only one that would go down into the forest. Making my way in, I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further in, it started getting darker and harder to see. I was whisper yelling my friend's name. He responded in the most shaken up voice, down here, be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what happened. He told me the story of how he got tired of running and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath and that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after like 5 minutes after he sat down, he heard talking. Nothing that he could make out, just random nonsense. He looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek staring at him, but the man took off before my friend could even get up to run away. And this is where he said he started screaming at the top of his lungs and hid somewhere else in the forest, which is where both of us are now hiding. And I kid you not, as soon as he told me this, we heard a twig snap. We both look up to see the man looking for us in some of the shrubbery on the forest floor. I couldn't make out any facial expressions or anything on his face for a matter of fact. I could see he was holding some sort of blade. I couldn't tell if it was a stick or a machete. All I knew is that we needed to run. So when he turned us back, we got up and started running. We didn't care how loud we were, we just knew that we needed to run. We got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street. We kept running until we got to the other side of the block and we all turned around to see the street empty. No one, not a single car, and from a distance you could hear a roar, or like a very loud engine. Shortly after that initial roar, a silver 2000s Mustang with the darkest windows comes peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go, headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like that at that very moment when I knew it was the same guy from the forest. I told all of my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding and running through alleyways and jumping fences, you could still hear his engine. It was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood, but still I hear his engine coming up on me. So I ran more. I was exhausted. The sun finally started to set and I could hear his engine fade. Almost like he had forgotten about me or had just given up. I start making my way back home scared, checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Once I made it home, I went right to bed to cry myself to sleep. And for months after that, that 2000 silver Mustang would follow us, stalking every corner that we played on. We would see it at our school and the grocery store. It could have been a coincidence that our little minds are not perceiving things around us, but either way, I think he was stalking us. Nothing actually came of him following us. He never did what he did that first day, but it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. I didn't know what to do or how to tell my mom, so I didn't, and still haven't. This story is for the people of this sub and my four other friends. Funny enough, the seeker didn't know what happened until the day after we were at school and we told him. He still doesn't believe us and says it was to go inside and have him looking for us all night. So for a bit of context, I am a college student. Without giving too many details, I am a woman on the smaller side of average female height. I currently do not have a car, so I use my bike, walking, and the bus to get around. My college has a transit service that allows you to scan in with a student boarding pass for free. Other non-students are allowed to ride the bus by paying upon entering or purchasing a ticket beforehand. I frequently ride the bus for various reasons, grocery runs, or treating myself to food. And yesterday, I had the idea of treating myself to a movie after 
after all the exams I have been having lately. I'm an avid horror fan and knew that Terrifier 2 was in theaters, so of course I wanted to see it immediately. One of my friends told me they found it funny and really enjoyed it, which was more than enough reason to go see it. I was looking at tickets the day before yesterday and trying to decide which time slot I wanted to see the movie in. Looking back now, something in my gut told me to choose the earlier time. I wish I had listened. Another detail I want to add is that there are two bus sizes, a large one and a small one. The bus I rode during the incident was the smaller one. The stop where I got on the bus is the beginning of the route. Unlike every other stop, the driver usually parks the bus here for 5 minutes and gets off to use the restroom or have a quick break before continuing with the rest of the route. Upon entering the bus, I noticed only two other passengers, another girl about my age and an older man. The girl was in the front of the bus on the right side and the man was in the second row on the left side. I sat on the right side, several rows back. I usually read something on my phone or listened to music on the bus, so I immediately got on my phone when I sat down. Everything was okay for a little bit until I looked up and noticed the man repeatedly staring at me and looking away before staring at me again. I was immediately apprehensive but just brushed it off. He started speaking aloud out of nowhere saying things like, beautiful baby and so fine, while staring at me. I was frozen out of fear and could only keep looking at my phone and trying to ignore it. This continued until I worked up the courage to say, sir would you please stop staring at me? To which he claimed he was not staring and told me I was extremely beautiful. Unsure of what to say, I just stupidly thanked him and went back to my phone. He had his body slightly turned, but when I confronted him, he faced fully forward. The driver got back on and we started moving again, so everything was calm for a bit. Though I was admittedly still shaken up, this calm did not last long. Obviously, this creep couldn't contain himself and just had a voice's opinions about me out loud. He started saying similar things again, but also added some new phrases such as, gonna make you my wife, and by far the worst one, I'm gonna get you pregnant. I was shaking at this point and was unsure what to do. I desperately wanted to sit next to the other girl but did not want to pass by him to sit by her. We made it to the other two stops before the girl got off and said sorry before leaving. My heart dropped to my stomach, the last thing I wanted was to be alone with this guy. Luckily, more people got on at the stop. A middle aged couple and a guy about my age. In a panicked voice, I sort of shouted and asked the guy my age if he would sit with me. He was a bit confused but came to sit by me and I immediately felt relief. The stress of the situation got to me and I broke down crying. I guess the creep took this as indication to leave because he swiftly made his exit after that. The kind younger guy who sat next to me and began to comfort me. I am so grateful he chose to ride the bus that day. The bus driver noticed the commotion and called me to the front to get information in order to make a report. He told me he couldn't hear anything but that buses have video and would hopefully pick up what the creep was saying. He told me that the same man had recently been kicked off for a similar incident and that he would be reporting this immediately. For the rest of the ride, the younger guy and I talked about things like majors and other school related stuff. I want to go into the marine biology field and he is a graduate student in mechanical engineering. I made it to the movies, it was awesome, and back home safely. But I definitely learned a lesson. My boyfriend is going to help me look into some self defense items and he taught me a few fighting tactics. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me, as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time, and all the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access, as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs, as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to use the back entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window, standing at the door. I did not feel safe opening the door so I called out hello. One of the men tapped on the window. Yes hello, may we come in? We are with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable but did not have any issues with it. I replied, we're not having any issues with Bresnan, is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said, can we come in? We're servicing the area and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head, we're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we are visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice. So you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work. I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am, I saw him try the doorknob again. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your 
supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle and one of the men replied, no need to ma'am, we're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the Bresden Cable Company and spoke to a representative, who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company no one had. For the longest time, there was this man that would sit in his garage and watch me. He was an older man and he was very scrawny. He had patchy gray hair and a super gross beard. I never learned his name, so we'll call him Nick. He looked like a Nick to me. I moved into my classic suburban home before I was even born. I've been living here my whole life, and the first memory I have of Nick was when I was 10 and he gave me a small two-finger wave as I walked back home after school. I had to see him every day since my bus stop was a few houses down and I walked like a block to get home. My mom said he dropped by after after I was born, knocked on the door in the middle of the day and rang the doorbell until someone answered. My mom finally answered, my one year old brother attached to her leg and newborn me in her arms. She said his face lit up when he saw me. He smiled brightly and asked to hold me. She obviously denied, cause who comes to your house to hold your child when you don't know them in the slightest? She said he scowled at her before calmly walking back to sit in his garage to smoke a cigar. After my first encounter with Nick, I never stopped seeing him. Every day after school, every morning before school, every time I took my dog out for a walk. Every time I peeked out of my window at 3 a.m., I swear this guy never slept. I told my brother how it freaked me out and he said he was probably on house arrest and that was the only way he could get out. We learned that wasn't true when he knocked on our door. Small background for this bit, my mom is very weak. She has an autoimmune disease and her legs and feet will go numb randomly. She's doing a lot better now but this event happened when she was pretty bad. She insisted she take the dogs out alone and I didn't want to argue so I sat in the living room. After about a minute I hear a knock. I yell out that the door's unlocked thinking it's my mom, but there's a louder knock. I get up and go to the door. I open it and there he is, smiling at me. Hey hun, your mom fell off the porch. You might want to help her, Nick states, giving me goosebumps. His voice was unreal, so raspy and sounded like he was in the process of choking. He leaves very quickly and I hurry to help my mom off the grass. Calling on my younger brother to get the two dogs inside, I gave her the I told you so speech and she grumbled about it for weeks. My younger dog, a pit bull made of 98% muscle, got excited when she saw a bird. She pulled to get the bird and yanked my mom off the porch. She was standing behind a pot and tripped over it on her way down, making the fall hurt a lot more. She had a black guy and her legs were scratched up. The pot of flowers that she tripped over was smashed, but she was okay otherwise. Flash forward to my 13th birthday and my mom's in the hospital, so my dad goes all out, letting me invite a lot of my friends over for a sleepover, making us dinner and breakfast, and just letting me have an amazing time. There's a park across from my suburb that I walk over to sometimes. I decided that I wanted to take my friends there to chill before before their parents picked them up. The night before we were looking out the window and giggling about the man, I know it's creepy and we were 13, so they knew he was weird. I told them to ignore him if he talked to them, but I didn't take my own advice. Hey Rosie, he said it so quietly I barely heard him. My name is Rose and Rosie is a nickname my grandfather often used. I never told this guy my name, neither did any of my family members. Uh, hi, I replied and my friends all scowled at me, knowing I screwed up. How's your mom? She's fine. I go to leave before I pause. How do you know my name? You told me, remember? No, I don't because it didn't happen, but I wanted to get away, so I agreed. Oh right, I chuckle. Me and my friends scurry off to the park. The next day, there's a box of chocolates sitting on the porch, a note with Rosie and Chicken Scratch writing on top of it. I pick it up and look over at the guy. He waves, and I can see that his left hand has disappeared into his pants. Gross. I leave the box out there and tell my dad. The next morning, me and my dad take our dogs out. No man. I figured he gave up after he saw me reject his chocolates. A few weeks later, a large family moves into the house, and I hadn't seen a trace of the man until yesterday. I'm 15 now and the woman who lives in the guy's house comes over yesterday. Does a Rosie live here, she asks. I had answered the door and my heart drops at the nickname from the stranger. Yeah, why? She hands me an envelope with my full name written on it. The guy who lived in the house before us said to give Rosie this on her birthday. It's not Rosie's birthday. I was trying to pretend I'm not Rosie. Oh, well, I just took a guess. He didn't give us a date. Have a good day. My dad opened the envelope wearing a mask because I quote, what if he filled it with cocaine? The note inside just said, I love you in his writing, red ink, my favorite color.
I was about 5 or 6, I went to my local kindergarten, and I was as carefree as a child can be. The greatest of my worries being if my mom forgets to pick me up from school. She never does and every day we walk from school to home and vice versa since it was a good walking distance. We lived in a compound that's kind of secluded and mostly inhabited by old people or boarding students who went to the university near it. This morning started out like any other. My mom picks me up and we're walking along the small path in our compound along with four other people, three high schoolers, two of which were walking together and a female college student. She was holding a handkerchief over her head because of the heat. The sun was high up and glaring in the middle of the day that you wouldn't expect anything to happen, but it did. We were quite far back from this group. When I turn around and see a man join us, he's clearly not from there. He had a bright neon green bag in front of him which was slightly opened, one of his hands inside of it. His clothes were kind of dusty, but most of all, he was glaring at us. It was just us five walking in this quiet compound, and my little self didn't think much of it. Up until my mom squeezed my hand and started speed walking. At first I was confused, but I knew the only thing that could trigger this was that there was a danger behind us, and it came in the form of the stranger that was following us closely behind. I kept looking back discreetly, although it was probably obvious, and still he kept staring at all of us, getting closer and closer. I looked up at my mom trying to ask what was going on, but her low murmurs didn't really translate well for me, except my ears picking up on the word knife. That's when I felt my stomach drop. My stupid little legs weren't fast enough. Factor in, my mom's older age, she was around 50, compared to our other companions. We were the easy target. We were pretty much at the back, but our house was near and I focused on that. Because if I thought about the threat behind us, my legs would feel like jelly and I'd end up slowing down. Still, I couldn't resist looking back. He just kept getting closer and closer, shortening the distance between us. I remember thinking about how I wanted to scream for help, desperately looking at these houses that seemed empty, wanting to go inside, but my mom's firm grip kept me going. Anyways, we lived here too. I never really knew if the others were aware of it, not much until later. One of the high schoolers left to a house over the basketball court and further down the path, the path veered off to a different trail that led to the main highway. So it was just us and the female college student, Goody. At this point, the man was also speed walking and catching up, but our apartment was merely a few steps away, and my mom and I dashed towards it, up the stairs and into the comfort of our own home. The man gave us one last glare, but he continued to walk. My heart was pounding against my chest. My mom had left me to lock the door. While she stared out the window, she kept repeating, he has a knife, I saw it. He's holding a knife. I run towards the window and catch a glimpse of the girl, still clutching that handkerchief above her head, looking behind her in fear and alarm as the man continued to follow her, his bright neon bag in front of him, now wide open, his hand still inside, as he kept getting closer and closer. I don't really know what happened after, only of my mom's recollection of the events. She had noticed the man suddenly come up behind us too, and her suspicions were raised when he didn't try to walk past us like the others, but made maintain a close distance between us. And then she saw the knife, hidden in his bag, holding on to it as he stared at us. I hope that girl's okay, and that man was detained or something, but it's been years now and I don't really know what happened to her. Don't really know if I'd like to. This happened about 5 years ago. I was around 16 to 17 years old. I always enjoyed walking. I would spend at least 1 hour a day walking the roads around where I lived. One day I was out doing my normal route, walking down my street that my house was on, taking a right out to the main street, and following it until I got to the end. There I would cross the crosswalk and retrace my steps to go home. On this particular day, I was about 20 feet from where I would leave the main road on my journey back home. I had my headphones in, blasting music as always, which can be a bad habit as I was young walking alone, but since it was daylight and the roads were pretty busy, I figured I was safe. But man, was I ever off with that assumption. As I was about to pass the entrance of a side street before leaving this main road, a black Ford F-150 pulled up. He stopped and gestures for me to walk in front of him, so I do so. I was about to go on my merry way when I barely heard someone trying to talk to me. I turned down my music, taking out my headphones as I looked to see the man in the black Ford still stopped at the entrance of the side road. I looked at him puzzled trying to figure out if he was talking to me. I pointed at myself and he grinned, nodding. What's a beautiful girl like you doing out here, he asked. I laughed awkwardly. Uh, walking? I replied, seeing as the answer should have been obvious. It's a beautiful day for that, he commented, just seeming to make small talk. Yeah, I stated before going to turn around and continue my route home. Wait, the man called. I stopped and turned around, just trying to be polite. Even though the encounter was odd, I didn't see too many red flags yet. The man continued to compliment me. I grew incredibly uncomfortable at this point, seeing as this man had it been his mid-40s. He had a bit of a receding hairline with black hair, a nose with a protruding bridge, blue eyes that were surrounded by slight 
wrinkles and was dressed in a dress shirt. So I instantly brought up my age. I was hoping saying this would get this fully grown adult man to back off, but he didn't. Oh, that's okay. Come on, sweetheart. Get in the truck. That's when I started panicking. Red flags shooting up everywhere. Stranger danger. I laughed nervously, looking at the cars around me to see if anyone was noticing what was happening. Nobody did. No, that's fine. My house isn't far. No, really. Get in the truck. I'll bring you home. No. Come on, just get in here with me. He called as I turned and started walking away. I was hoping he'd just drive off somewhere else, but he didn't. Instead, he drove extremely slow following me, complimenting me, and trying to pressure me to his truck. I thought fast of multiple options for different scenarios, but I chose a simple one. I pulled out my phone, and while still walking, I lifted it up to my ear, pretending to loudly answer a call. Hey dad, yeah no, I'm just on interstreet name here. I'll be home in about 10 minutes. I stopped pretending to listen to a reply. Okay, you're outside waiting for me? Awesome, yeah we can do that when I get back. Love you. After he heard me say that, he took off, tires screeching. I ran back home and made it back within about 6 minutes, actually calling my dad on the way, who made a call to the police, who showed up shortly after and took my statement and description. Turns out there was a man on the loose in my area who was exposing himself to kids and trying to pick them up. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I started a new job about 6 years ago, it was great. Really liked all my co-workers and the job itself is really awesome and I still love it. This was before the pandemic and everyone was in the office every day. I work in a large multi-floor, multi-wing building filled with numerous businesses and agencies. I started getting into a routine. We have a gym and locker room in our building. I would go work out before I was on the clock and shower, get ready, etc. I'd go get breakfast at the next building over most mornings at around the same time. I'd go on walk breaks with co-workers at pretty much the same time every day. It was very regimented. In the morning when I worked out, everyone had a pretty set schedule. We didn't know each other, but there was kind of an unspoken pattern. A co-worker would finish and shower before me, then I'd go, then the head maintenance guy for the building, and so on. This is where it all begins. One morning like every other, I get out of the shower and I'm in the small locker area and there's this little older man over at the sinks. He's not doing anything but looking at himself in the mirror, but you could tell he was just loitering. Weird, but whatever. A few days later, he's there again. Then he's there every morning at the same time and he's definitely looking at me while I change. This creeps me out so I stop working out in the morning. Then after a few weeks we're walking back from getting breakfast and he's walking the other way towards the other building. I tell my coworker that's the guy that would always be in the locker room watching me get dressed. After a few more days he's walking the other way from us getting breakfast every day and he looks right at me every time. So I make an excuse and stop going for breakfast. At our 9am walk around the building he starts just appearing and walking the opposite direction from us every day. Literally everyone walked around the building in the same direction except for this guy and he'd stare at me as we passed. I'd tell the coworker who was a woman about the guy and what had happened and she just laughed it off. The only reason he'd go the opposite direction is to make sure he saw me. Our 1pm walk around the building, wouldn't you know it, he's there walking the other way and staring. So I just stopped going on walks at work. This is where the real magic begins. I have no clue where this guy worked in our building. I would come into our hallway every morning at the same time. From the time I went through the door to the time I got into my office, it was maybe 15 seconds. We were on the first floor and at the end of our wing is a staircase. Every morning as I'd come into our wing, he would pop out the stairwell and come walking the opposite direction and stare at me as we passed each other. One morning, I'm walking into the bathroom to go number two. I stop and blow my nose real quick. As I'm walking to the back stall, he comes into the bathroom. We have two urinals, two stalls in this particular bathroom. No one is there but us. He comes into the stall next to me, widens out his feet so his shoe is under the divider and on my side of the stall. This dude is tiny, maybe 5 foot so he'd have to almost be doing the splits. Then he lets out this deep loud moan after about 30 seconds then leaves. I start telling all of my co-workers, most of them laugh. I felt so creeped out and helpless, like what do I do? Any guy I work with that I tell this about laughs at me. The women just shrug it off or have an excuse for why he is always there. So I ask one co-worker to pick any event at any time during the day to prove he will show up. So we decide to go out for a walk at noon. After 5 or 6 days there he is. Now she believes me. Everyone in the office knows now. I have told my wife all about this and she is supportive. She has had her share of workplace creepers as well. I get to read the texts and emails. My closest coworker and I decide to start working out at 1.30pm every day. I want to get my gym time in but I don't want to do it alone. After about a week and a half, guess who starts showing up every day? He'd just come in and loiter around. Mind you, the guy has never tried to talk to me before and vice versa. Two guys 
Lance lifting weights and this little old creepy guy just sitting there watching me. Here's where it hits the peak. My lifting buddy had a cut out early one day. My stalker is there with us. I was just going to leave, but screw that, I don't want to let this little weirdo control my life anymore. There is an elevated padded stretching platform on the weight side of our gym. He takes his shoes off, lays on his back, and starts doing hip thrusts in the air and holding it while he stares right at me. I'm walking around trying to pretend I don't notice him while he follows me with his eyes, pelvis elevated in the air. After 20 minutes of this, he puts his shoes back on and goes into the locker room. I'm texting my lifting partner and wife the whole time telling them this is going on. My wife tells me to confront him, I don't. I get in the locker room to grab my bag and he's at the sink. The top couple buttons of his shirt unbuttoned and he's rubbing water all over himself while looking at me in the reflection in the mirror. That was it for me. I started working from home almost exclusively after that, then the pandemic hit and I've been remote ever since. This happened Sunday night. I got into a very huge fight with my mom and it was very emotional and intense to say the least. We made up and said goodnight to each other but I was still pissed off. So my impulsive self decided I was going to take off for the night, I just wanted to cool off. I went into my backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started to walk around. Mind you, it was midnight, I didn't even have a phone in case something happened or a weapon for self protection. For a bit of a layout of my story, down the street from my house, which is a neighborhood road, there is a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool, school there are large, tall hedges that sort of hide the pickup slash drop off that's in front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road and a street lamp on the same corner. I made my way down to the corner on the church's side. I was very bored and cold but it's not like I could call a friend to pick me up and hang out for the night. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like forever, I was getting no luck and then I saw a guy from across the main road and I called for him. I didn't have any weird feelings about him, he was harmless and he let me use his phone but I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come and get me. Before he left, he asked if I had a knife on me or something. I said honestly, I forgot mine at home. And he handed me a small but very sharp switch blade and told me to keep it, to stay safe and have a good night. After watching him walk into the dark heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars passed by often. I started to pass the hedges and I glanced over to the left of me where the school was. I saw a large silhouette of a man slowly creeping around and in front of the doors to the small preschool. He was tall and looked like he was strong, broad shoulders too. It took me half a second to realize he stopped and saw me too. I went into flight mode and immediately nooked out of there and ran across the busy street because it was empty at the moment and kept sprinting until I was five streets down and realized he wasn't following me. About 30 minutes had gone by and I decided it was time I made my way home. I eventually crossed the street and was facing the main road walking down to the church and take a left and get home. It was silent and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then I heard a car speeding down the road and I turned my head back to see if it was a large white suburban. I dismissed it thinking nothing of it as it turned right a few streets down across the road. I started to turn the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again and saw it was starting to come out of the same road it just turned into. I don't know what told me to run but I did. I ran into the parking lot of the church and started to see headlights turn into the street. I threw myself onto the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. I was trying to stay silent at the same time because the suburban's headlight reflected off the walls of the building as it pulled into the parking lot. It made a few laps from what I could sneak a peek of and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes before it turned out and drove into the main road. I waited it out a bit longer and pulled the knife out listening for anything and everything. Once I realized I was probably in the clear, I ran back home. I'm a French student doing a master's in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I live alone in an apartment in a building where there are only students. I'm 22, enjoying life peacefully. To give you a bit of context, I live in a calm, good neighborhood. The only noises I'd hear are the tram or parties in the building since a lot of students are there. One night around 10 p.m., I hear a knock on my door. I live on the third floor, and to get to my front door, you have to open the main door which needs a key. And then you need to open the door to my corridor with the same key. So people who want to come into my door must have the key, call me or ring at the door so I could open the doors for them from my apartment. Nothing of this happened, I just heard a knock on my door. I usually open the door without a second thought, whether it's my landlord or a neighbor asking for something. As I told you, I feel pretty safe in the building, but this time, for some reason, I had a bad feeling about this. I didn't move at first. I thought the person would just leave. I'd finished my assignments. However, the knocking continued for 30 seconds. I said, yeah, in English. The person knocking doesn't say anything. I ask in English again, who is it? 
it. The voice answers in English, it's Uber Eats, which is weird, because Dutch always speaks Dutch and I recognize the voices and accents of everyone on my floor who have the key to access the floor. So it wasn't a neighbor, it wasn't my landlord, it was somebody claiming to come from Uber Eats, but the issue is I didn't order anything from Uber Eats that day. The voice was unfamiliar, in case it's a prank or a neighbor pulling a joke, it was also a deep voice, at least 40 and probably smoker. I replied that, I didn't order anything, you must have it wrong. After a few seconds, the knocking continues in the same voice says, I'm pretty sure you did, I have an order under your name. I start panicking, I look around to pick up a knife in case he breaks the door because the knocking was getting a bit louder. I checked if my door is locked, it wasn't. I was literally 10 centimeters away from him. My front door was the only thing keeping him from me, and I'm glad it doesn't open from the outside. You need a key to open it even if it's not locked. I step back and I ask again, what's the name? He seems to be thinking for a few seconds, then a final knock occurs. It was loud and it translated some anger or frustration. Finally, I hear him going down the emergency stairs right next to my apartment. The steps were heavy and the person was clearly in a hurry. I don't know what he wanted or what would have happened to me if I had opened the door as I usually do. I still haven't understood how he got through the two doors and why he did come specifically to the last apartment on the third floor. Did he try others before? I posted a post about it on the WhatsApp group we have in the building. No one saw anything suspicious. No one opened the door for anyone. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town, and there were 7 houses in the area spread out on a 2.5 acre wooded lots or larger each. There were no large wild animals, there aren't bears or large animals in the region, and people didn't meander there or show up lost. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years I lived there, so please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was and he would sometimes walk over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside at my window to chat. My bed was right next to the window. I'd open the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out, the light was on over the side door entrance or already home. Light was off. One time during the summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of a car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond as he probably didn't hear me. Then I came up with a not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked down from the second floor and out my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14 inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel and if you stepped off of the rounds in the church of gravel slash rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd been in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods slow and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore I hunched down and waited in silence wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry and he saw me sneak out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening slash checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tippy-toed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing slash crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window but got no answer. Then I heard someone or something fall and grunt pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough I didn't mistake it and it sent 
sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semi-circle hole connected to the house dug out for about 3 or 4 feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. There's no way Terry would have fallen in our window well. We have been playing hide and seek in many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints, plus pass in the woods like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. That's when I realized this wasn't a fun game and someone or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks as whatever it was stepping in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour but I'm pretty sure I didn't have patience back then to wait that long. I never heard it leave but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. There are a few things I'm certain of. It wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in 2.5 plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dog scared them away. When I was 25, there was a short time I was staying at my aunt's. It was her, my two cousins, and I. She lives in a nice apartment complex, and her unit is on the lower level. Her living room has a lot of windows that she keeps open for fresh air and for her cats to people watch. Her unit happens to be on the corner near a grassy courtyard path. When I had first moved in, I noticed a man who gave me an off vibe. My cousins and aunts said he lived upstairs and two units over, recovering from hard drugs that permanently messed him up. His parents paid for him to stay there as they didn't want him with them. They also said other than hearing him mumble and say weird things, no one ever had an issue. My aunt works nights and leaves at 3am. My younger cousin works nights and leaves at 2am. That usually left my same aged cousin and I the only two there until we leave for work around 8. For context, it is a very open living room to dining room plan. My aunt always has people staying over, so she has a second couch in the dining room in place for a table. This is where I slept. She stayed on the one in the living room. My aunt has also never been one to lock her doors until this incident. One night I'm on my phone trying to sleep at about 1am and hear a man yelling. He's yelling don't shoot and banging on the door to the right of ours. Two male college students live there and just told him he had the wrong apartment and to leave. He says sorry and walks off. I am looking through the kitchen window which is in direct line of sight from my couch bed and it's the weird neighbor who sees me and grins. He then walks back to his home. I was unsettled but not enough to wake anyone else up over it. Told my family nonchalantly that the next day in a lol that was weird way. My cousin and I watch a movie and head off to bed. I have a very hard time staying asleep but I woke up this time to the feeling of someone watching me. I check my phone and it's around 3.30am, so I know it's not my aunt or cousin. I sit up and figure I'll go watch TV on my aunt's couch since she was gone already. The feeling gets stronger as I am in the living room. Then I see the shadow of a person standing still in the grass courtyard looking in. I froze. I immediately go back to my couch to get my phone. As I do, the person is gone. I am now trying to calm myself down and think of waking my cousin up when I hear the creepy man's voice. He is now at the kitchen window which looks out directly in front of her front door. I drop to the floor out of his line of sight and start frantically trying to call my cousin. The man is now saying things to the window slash front door like, I'm going to hurt you and I'm unarmed over and over again. His face is up against the window. Then he starts talking about wanting to pet the cats he saw through the window. I can't get a hold of my cousin. It's been about 20 minutes of this at this point. In this situation, I didn't have many options. I could jump up and run for a knife, but I need to go to the kitchen. I could try to respond and ask him to leave, but I've learned when you underestimate crazy, you lose every time. I now hear him knocking and knocking while repeating his nonsense. I'm doing that ridiculous looking army crawl snake slither across the floor down the hall now. I see the door handle start to turn. I'm about to jump up when my cousin bursts out of his room directly across from the front door. Now, he's not the biggest guy, but he was intimidatingly mad at the circus show taking place at his front door. He starts yelling at the guy that he needs to get off of his porch and that he's calling the cops. The 
man tries to say, I'm unarmed. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't be afraid. My cousin goes off and yells, that's dandy. It's 4 a.m. You need to leave or I'll call the cops. So this guy backs up with his hands in the air and leaves. Needless to say, we didn't go back to sleep. My aunt was called, who called the apartment manager. The next day when I came home from work, his parents were there packing moving boxes in a truck from his place. Maybe he was trying to get me to open the door by seeming friendly. Maybe he had a bad trip and really wanted to pet a cat to feel better. We will never know. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests there are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was that that ran in front of our car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually dart out in front of cars, not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switched on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I stepped out of the car and walked towards the woods. I don't see anything, but now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. Suddenly, the car's horn blast. It's not a beep 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 that you get if you'd say your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked, his skin was covered in dirt and mud. He looked back at us and then he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I I was trying to look for whatever was in the area that initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to assumed the man was probably on drugs. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This happened like 12 years ago. I was 14 and my sister was 12. It was during summer vacation and we were hanging out just the two of us outside, midday. We lived in a smallish town where during weekdays it was pretty empty because adults were at work. Anyway, we'd been messing around, picking flowers and other random stuff when we decided to cut through a massive field of undeveloped land on the edge of our suburb. It was technically a shortcut to get home, but it wasn't the best idea because it was really bumpy, potted land that other kids and teens left all sorts of stuff laying in. Well, our bad decision came around and bit us. We hadn't made it very far in the field when my sister got two bad things at once. Some sort of twisted metal, maybe an old piece of tool, pierced right through her foam flip-flop and into her foot, and right after it happened she shrieked, jerked, and twisted that ankle on the uneven even ground. She started crying and howling and I was worried. The metal hadn't gone too deep and I was able to stop the bleeding with the hem of my shirt, but she couldn't walk anymore obviously. Our parents weren't available, didn't know where we were, and this was before I had a cell phone. My sister was still on the ground crying and I was trying to calm her down when something made me feel like looking up. 
Y'all, it was the feeling of being watched. Out of the field, across the road, standing on the corner in the distance was some random guy watching us. He was too far away for me to see him clearly. All I could tell for sure was that he was blonde, probably adult, and dressed too warmly for July. He was all alone, stock still, just staring at us. I looked back at my sister and basically said to get on my back, I was carrying her home. We were leaving right now. Now, I had to carefully pick my way through this stupid field of my own bad flip-flops, with my crying sister on my back. Luckily, she was tiny, but I was no linebacker either. It had rained a day ago, and the field had puddles of water in the low spots. We were both kind of wet, from her falling when she got hurt. I swiveled back to check if he was still watching us, and he was. Not only was he watching us, but he'd crossed the road and entered the field. Now he was standing stock still again and just watching. Ice in the veins doesn't describe it. One of the scariest moments of my life up to that point. My sister looked when I looked, saw my face, and started crying even harder. I just shook her a bit on my back and whispered something like, stop it. I need to concentrate on getting us home. Watch him and tell me if he starts following again. Just be quiet. So that's what we did. I started walking again as fast as I could without getting hurt. My sister watched him while I carried her. After less than a minute, she whispered to me that he was following again. How fast? Just walking. Is he watching us? Yes. I told her to tell me if anything changed and kept going. I stomped through puddles and I couldn't see into when I had to, hoping there was nothing sharp in them. I lost a flip-flop in the mud and just kept going. We we were about three-fourths of the way through the massive field when my sister whispered that I least wanted to hear. He was speeding up. I turned us right around, so we were facing him head on, and as loud as I could, I yelled something like, hey, we see you, leave us alone, I'll call the cops. Nothing. He'd stop again when I stopped, but gave no sign whatsoever he'd heard me. Just nothing. I turned us around again and kept going. My poor little sister was shaking like a leaf and just saying my name over and over again. It was awful, and there was nothing I could do but keep going. Eventually, he started following again, at a slow pace. I finally made it into our suburb, out of the muddy field and onto solid concrete told my sister to hold on as tight as she could and booked it. Started running with her on my back as fast as I could. We couldn't see him anymore. Didn't know what he was doing or where he was. Every muscle hurt from carrying her so far. My bare foot was all scratched up from the road, but I didn't stop. I kept moving. With my sister looking out behind us, it felt like my heart was going to explode. After what felt like forever, I made it to our house. Ran across the yard, up the drive, put down my sister, who started crying again. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely use my key. We made it in safely and called my mom. She had us lock every door and window and came rushing home. But nothing happened after that. He never found us, so we never saw him again. So a few years ago, I, a 17-year-old female at the time, would attend community college at the outskirts of my hometown. I would take an hour and a half long bus drive because both of my parents worked and my other siblings were too young to drive. The outskirts of my town, despite being the literal outskirts, are more populated than you expect, with strip malls and apartment buildings. The bus would drop me off about four blocks from my university, which isn't too far. I always enjoyed those few minutes. Anyway, this one time, I left my phone at the library. Using my brother's phone, I called a friend who worked at the school library during the late evening shift, 7 to 9, and he'd said he'd bring my phone to me. But he lived closer to the college than I did, so I told him I'd just meet him at his shift and pick it up myself. He said, okay, and I boarded the bus at around 6. Now, I get off the bus at my usual spot and the place looked deserted. I'd never been there that late at night and maybe it was because it was a weekday that people were home or I don't know. I had my brother's phone in my pocket and just clutched it tighter and tighter picking up my speed until I was practically jogging. I'm nearing to a corner when a flash of light goes off to my right. There, in the shadows, is a sleazy looking man. He's balding with a tourist shirt unbuttoned halfway. He was wearing sunglasses at night and was wearing some gold jewelry. And most importantly, he had just taken a picture of me. In the instant that I saw the flash go off, I knew it was coming from his phone. Now, I think it's important to understand our positioning. He was pressed against a building to my right, right at the corner I had turned. I was about 10 feet away from him. To my left, on the same side of the street, was a car with blacked out windows and no license plates, directly across the sidewalk from the man. The car was parked with the driver's seat facing me, so that it was on the wrong side of the road, because America drives on the right side as opposed to the left. I had slowed down at that point as I began to debate my next move, cross the street and continue walking, make a break for the school, turn 180 and leave my phone at the library, or approach the potentially dangerous man. I did the stupidest thing possible and approached the man. Anyway, I 
demanded to know what he was doing. He looked taken aback. I could see his brain short circuiting because I was demanding to know what he was doing. He eventually sputtered about how he was just standing here. I said no, I saw you take that picture of me. His face fell. He started saying no he hadn't done that. Why would he want a picture of me? I had imagined it. I asked to see his gallery which is extremely risky because who knows what I could have seen. He slowly pulls up his gallery and as it's opening, I see a blurry picture of me in the distance. I didn't think I'd get that far. Granted, I had been running on adrenaline during our whole interaction but this really made me pause. I told him to delete it. Then a door slammed shut. I just knew it was the parked car. My brain cleared up and I hightailed it to the school. I could hear a single pair of footsteps behind me but I sure wasn't going to turn around and check who it was. The car started but they would have to have to do a U-turn on a relatively narrow street just to be able to follow me. I think that's what saved my life. The fact that the car was parked facing the wrong direction. I reached the school out of breath and in tears. My friend opened the building for me and I explained what had happened. He locked us in while he called the police and we waited for them. But the sleazy guy and his buddy were never found. Anyway, my mom had gotten out of work by that point and I called her to ask to pick me up. We waited with my friend till the end of his shift and drove him home too. Needless to say, I carry a mace with me everywhere I go now and I'm yet to find a police report stating a guy matching his description had been arrested. To be honest, I don't think the police believed me fully, but who knows. I'm a single male, 33 years old, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which if you're familiar with, the geography of this area is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood making it hard to sleep. So this night I decided to watch a stand-up special instead. Keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay and didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. I remember dozing off around 11 o'clock. It was effortless which meant I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either end creating a tucked in feeling. And all of a sudden, I'm not sleeping anymore. I am woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice says maintenance. I just sat there, sitting bolt upright on my couch. I knew something was off. I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15am. I didn't move. The floors of my apartment are old wood and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever was knocking to know someone was at home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would. But but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I have a partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. I saw an old looking green SUV sitting in the no parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and it drove off. I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place as you would need a key to do so. I don't know what his intentions were but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15am claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. So I'm a 23 year old female. I live in a townhouse with my two children, two and six months old. My fiance did live with us until two weeks ago when I caught him trying to have relationships with other women and made him move out. That's important to the story. I'm a stay at home mom and when he did live with us, my ex worked evenings. Let me set the scene. We live in a tiny house in northern Pennsylvania. My line of townhouses sits in front of a big field that runs to a line of woods. As far as I'm aware, these woods stretch out for at least a few miles and I'm not aware of any houses in there or any roads that lead through them. My living room has three windows that look to the field and my bedroom on the second floor only has one window that faces that way as well. People do tend to walk their dogs back in the field and kids sometimes play back there but I rarely ever see anyone close to my house. For that reason I tend to leave my blinds and curtains open because I guess I just enjoy the view. So in July of 2019 I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. All the lights were off but I had my window and blinds open since it was 
so warm. I was looking out the window and I noticed small red and white lights just outside. I got up and looked to realize that the lights were coming from a drone. I ran downstairs to where my fiance at the time was sitting in the living room and ran to the window. I told him what I saw but of course when he went to look it was gone. I was paranoid that the drone could have had a camera on it and someone was watching me with it. I kept my blinds closed for a while after that. Fast forward to January of this year. I guess I stupidly got comfortable and assumed that whoever it was flying the drone was a one-time creep. My blinds were open and I had just gotten out of the shower. I was sitting on my bed pretty much naked except for my underwear, scrolling on my phone when out of the corner of my eye I saw lights again out of the dark window. It was that drone again. I ran out of the room and waited for a few minutes. I peeked back into my room and it was gone. I quickly shut my blinds and got dressed. Honestly, I felt sick at how stupid I was to leave my window open again, especially when I was practically naked. Now for the real disturbing part, my two year old son and I were out in the field two weeks ago, three days after I kicked my boyfriend playing ball. I had my six month old strapped to me in a baby carrier. Probably about a half hour after we had been out there, I heard a slight worrying noise coming towards us. I looked up and saw the drone flying towards us. I looked around and didn't see anyone. It stopped right over us. I freaked and grabbed my son and dragged him into the house, looking back at the tree line every so often as we went. I knew they had to be hiding in there. I went inside, closed the blinds, and called my mom and told her about the situation. She told me just to keep an eye out. I said I would. My son likes to line his toys up against the window, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to open them up just an inch or so. A little while later, after we ate dinner and it was almost dark, I was feeding my six-month-old and my son was playing. He was standing over by the window, lining up his toys. He started saying, Dada, Dada. I assumed he was just missing his father and dismissed him by saying he was going to see him that weekend. He kept saying, Dada, Dada, though. I looked up and saw him pointing to the window under the little gap the blinds didn't cover. I froze. I remember remember that he calls any man with facial hair dada because it reminds him of his father but there was no way someone would be bold enough to actually come up to my window not when my neighbors are literally right there anyone could see them but there aren't any lights back there so unless someone actually stepped out of their house i guess nobody would see them maybe it was my ex but he should be at work at that time i ran to the window and moved my son i didn't want to lift the blinds but honestly i was sure it had to be the person who had been creeping on me for the past year and i wanted to see who it was i pushed the the blinds up and was looking at a man who I definitely had never seen before. Crouching in front of me, he was bald with a mustache and goatee. I have no idea how old he was. He could have been anywhere from 30 to 50. When he saw me, he smiled and stood up. I yelled and told him to screw off and that I was going to call the cops. He just stood there, smiling at me like some freak. I was about to close the blinds again when he said something I couldn't hear. I told him to leave again and he said, louder this time, I just want to talk to you. I shook my head no and yelled the same thing to him. He started slapping his hands on the window yelling no 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 over and over. I grabbed my phone scared he was going to try to break in. I dialed 911. My kids were crying from the yelling and I felt on the verge of tears. I told the operator what was going on. The whole time I was on the phone the man was pounding on my window screaming now. He was yelling all kinds of nonsense and I only caught some of it. He said he's been watching me for months. I'm beautiful. He wants to come with them. He'll kill my children if I don't. The operator told me to go into an upstairs room and hide until the police arrive. My town doesn't have a police department, so we rely on the state police. She said it would be about 20 minutes, but to stay on the phone with her. The man was practically punching my window now and was just screaming like a maniac. I was about to grab my kids and run upstairs when I heard someone else screaming. The man bolted. I looked out and saw my neighbor and his girlfriend. I opened the window and my neighbor said that he heard the man, so he ran around the building. He said when the guy heard him, he ran back to the woods and disappeared in the tree line. They said they also called the police. I thanked them a hundred times. The police arrived 10 minutes later. They did a quick search around the buildings and found the man and arrested him. I don't know why that guy targeted me or why he waited so long to do something. I'm just happy my neighbors were there to intervene or who knows what would have happened. I was about 7 years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left puts you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are window doors we always kept locked 
locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights have been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops, gun owner family in a quiet rural West Virginia neighborhood, etc. I asked her what she was talking about and she looked equally surprised as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. One night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, tall white male, wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago in my mid-twenties that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. At the time, I just turned 17 and was still pretty naive. I live in England, so it is legal to work in a bar and serve alcohol supervised, but not to drink alcohol. Not that it stopped me. I worked in a working men's club filled with middle-aged elderly people. Most were really nice. I sold bingo tickets twice for a week for my dad's cousin and I was pretty good at it. It's not typical to get tips here, but I earned more in tips than I did my actual wage. On a Saturday, my dad would come with me to have a drink with my elder sister while they played competitive darts in the main bar overlooking my booth. This one particular night, there was a middle-aged average looking guy. A little on the plump side, but generally unnoticeable. On the first round of selling tickets, he was at the fruit machine opposite the entire time, looking over at me occasionally. The second round, he approached me, asked me what I was selling, how bingo worked, etc. Clearly had never played before, but hey, everyone starts somewhere, right? He bought some tickets and offered to buy me a drink. I declined and informed him I was underage. By now, I had a bit of an uneasy vibe and didn't want to take a drink from a guy I don't know. He then offered a cola complimenting me a little too hard. Again declined and went on my way to help with the game in the main hall. Part of my job. Third time, he stood against the wall adjacent to me and just watched me work. He'd waited until the queue calmed down and bragged about how much money he had and now he wants to be my sugar dad. How cute I am commenting on my figure. I was trapped in my booth. I was late into the main hall so the concert chairman, guy who calls out the bingo numbers and gives out winnings, comes out and asks what was going on. This guy claims we were just talking. I apologized to the chairman and he walked me to the hall. Said he could see I was freaked out so I told him everything. He made the bar staff aware who also made my boss, my dad's cousin, aware also. Last round of selling tickets, he doesn't even wait for me to get back in my booth. He grabs my butt, telling me how he wants to be my sugar dad once again. Tries to push me against the wall and is suddenly span around. Not just by my dad but my boss and numerous staff members and customers who heard and saw what went down. He started arguing his innocence until my dad not so politely introduced himself. He knew he was screwed. My dad punched him in the nose, blood running down his face. Everyone picked him up like a plank of wood and threw him out the closed door. Never saw him after that. Everyone checked up on me to make sure I was okay. My sister covered the rest of the shift and I had a free bar tab for two months. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
I was 22 and living on my own for the first time when this happened. I had just gotten off work around 11 in the afternoon. To reach my apartment building, I could either walk on the sidewalk or cut across this communal garden. I saved about one whole minute of walking time by cutting through the communal garden, but being young and stupid, a lot of times I took the shortcut. That night, I got that weird feeling to not take the shortcut. I kept to the sidewalk, but there's no one else around. When I got past the garden, all of a sudden, this large man pops up from its exit path. There was no way he could have been in front of me or just behind me as I was walking. I would have noticed him. The only logical explanation was he had been hiding in the pitch black garden. A drunk who had been sleeping it off. No, my body was screaming at me to get out of there. I began walking faster. My dad had taught me to always carry my keys in my fist with the key pointed out in case I needed to punch someone, so I had that. But I'm 5 foot 4 and probably weighed 110 pounds. This guy was tall and big. My only chance was to outpace him. I'm speed walking at this point and I feel him matching my pace getting closer. He's breathing heavily. I feel this angry energy coming off of him, but my apartment building is right there, so I put on a burst of speed. When I reach the entrance, two people are leaving and hold the door for me. And hit both. I don't know why I didn't tell them I thought this guy was following me. My mind froze and I was just trying to get inside my apartment. Plus, I was still trying to rationalize it. Maybe he was visiting someone in the building. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. Don't be paranoid. Besides, it took only a couple seconds for them to be out the door. I had missed my chance. I'm climbing the stairs as fast as I can. It's a three-story building and I live on the third floor. He's climbing the stairs, too, still right behind me. I get to my floor, which has four apartments on the right side and four on the left. I pass by apartments one and two. He's still right behind me. I stop at apartment three and he stops in front of the apartment 4 where I know he doesn't live. He hasn't said anything, just breathing hard and I think there's no way I'm going to open my apartment door and have him push me inside and assault me or worse. He also has it knocked on the door of apartment 4. Worth noting is that the apartments are U-shaped, with mine and my neighbor's door being very close together. So I bang my own apartment door as loud as I can but yell my neighbor's name. Hey Kevin, let me end. This startles the guy, even more so when my own apartment door doesn't open but Kevin's does. Kevin sees the guy standing right in front of his door and and asked 20 once. The guy starts mumbling something about the wrong apartment, but I have my own door open so fast that I am inside my place in a flash, locking the door behind me. I grab my cordless phone to call the police, but I hear Kevin through the door, telling this guy he needs to leave. The guy does. Kevin knocks on my door, asks if I'm okay, I thank him, say that I am, but inside I am still frozen, adrenaline pumping, scared. I thank him again and tell him to have a good night, lock my door again. I have my phone in my hand, ready to call the police, but I start trying to rationalize it again. What exactly happened? A guy followed me home but then said he had the wrong apartment. Are the cops going to care about something minor like that? I try to calm myself down but I'm also berating myself. Why didn't I run the instant I felt him following me? Why didn't I tell the people we passed when the front door opened that I thought I was being chased? Worse, why didn't I tell Kevin that the second he opened his door and saved me? He could have let me inside his apartment and we could have called the cops together. But because of my stupidity, everything felt so ambiguous and I was questioning myself. A couple of weeks later, I'm visiting my grandparents and my grandfather is reading the paper. He tells me that a woman was assaulted in the apartment building across the street from mine. It's the same guy. He had multiple convictions for assault and had recently been released on parole. For context, I am a 20 year old female and at the time of these events I was around 12 and 13. So I grew up in a very rural area, like my town was so small it was legally considered a village. My house was one of four on a span of 40 acres. My childhood home, my grandparents house right up the street, and two neighbors. One of the neighbors we will call him T had been living across near my family for as long as I can remember and he rented out a trailer he owned which was inhabited by the fourth neighbor we will call him Jay. Jay and his girlfriend who we will call had moved in a few months before these events and I hadn't really met them. I knew of them but hadn't interacted with them directly the day I met Jay and it was extremely awkward as I was a kid and didn't really want to talk to them. But my grandma had made me go with her to drop off some vegetables she had grown in her garden. When they came out after my grandma knocked on the trailer door I was first struck by how they looked. I know that sounds bad but I'm not judging. My grandma started the conversation and I tried to be polite as I was raised to be by introducing myself when told to do so. I wasn't really able to finish my sentence as I noticed Jay was staring at me very intently. 
fighting. He looked like he was either mad or hungry, or both. Not the creepiest off the bat as they both seemed polite enough and I brushed off the stare as just him trying to be polite, looking at me as I spoke to him as most people do. The creepy part is that as time went on he began to try and be near me more and more. He'd ride his bike past our house over and over for what seemed like hours while me and my brother played catch in the yard. Then he began to go to church with me, my brother and my grandparents. He'd make sure to sit right next to me in the back seat of the car as he rode with us. If my brother tried to sit in the middle so I wasn't right next to Jay he threw a fit about how my brother was squishing him against the door. Then he began coming to my grandma's house when she'd have me and my brother after school offering to tutor me with various subjects. What really scared me was that I had begun to see him walking near our house at night trying to shine a flashlight into my window. He tried various things to get close to me, tried to convince my parents to let him teach me how to golf, tried to help me practice my catching positions for softball, tried to get me to go with him and into the movies. And none of these things ever included my brother. Olive, things finally came to a head when I was playing with my dog outside in our front yard and he started repeatedly doing laps on his bike down the road again, staring at me like he did the day we met. I was extremely uncomfortable. I've always had very good intuition about people and something was always just off with him. But that day I was terrified. He parked his bike right in the middle of the road and got off. He started walking towards me at almost a jog and I just kept backing away. What happened next is why I believe that dogs are a better judge of character than people could ever hope to be. My boxer ran up to him and launched herself onto him when he was about six feet from me. She tore it to his arm and I saw blood. I screamed and my mom ran out shortly after. She was trying to pull my dog off of him but as soon as she was able to, holding onto the dog's collar she started yelling at him asking him why he was in our yard with me alone. He couldn't answer her and just started running back to his bike riding back to the trailer. My grandma ended up driving him to the hospital as Jay and it didn't have a car and I learned later he got 16 stitches. He never gave a reason as to why he was approaching me and they moved out shortly after. I haven't seen him since and still terrified to this day to run into him again. I want to tell this story to warn others. I, an 18 year old female, live in Maryland, USA. I work at a very popular burger restaurant. I work at the pavement window, which is where I stand all night. I'm very friendly. I know sometimes a smile and a compliment can make someone's day a little better. Just the same night, before the creeper came, I had a customer tell me I was so happy and she loved me for it. That gave me the courage and energy to survive this next interaction. I'm used to the awkward comments and stares from old men. I'm sure it's my friendliness that attracts them. Our uniforms are not revealing. They think I'm naive. Maybe I am. A lot more than I thought. I'm fully aware of the dangers of trafficking. This particular old man came through just before 6. He pretended to not hear his order, then laughed like it was a joke between two friends. This is not a common, it's an old man thing. No red flags, yet. I tell him his total and he hands me all but the change. When he does this, he waves the money around, making me chase it. I was able to snatch the cash, but again, it was just an old man thing. Not concerned, yet. He stared at the company name on my shirt and asked if that was my name. I don't wear a name tag for this reason. I joked that I was going to change my name permanently to that. He perked up. At this point I should state that he was white, mid 60s to 70s, driving a small white SUV with a kayak on top. He had some scrub on his face and was holding a phone to his ear this entire time. When I finally began to engage with him, he moved the phone to be facing me. Looking back, I believe he was recording me. At no point did he speak into the phone or acknowledge it in any way. He probed with more pressing questions. Here's the thing, I have the same last name as someone from US history. Most old people like talking about that stuff, so I told him my last name. He didn't reflect or laugh. He just accepted and continued asking questions. That's when I started to get this sinking feeling. He still owed me change. I told him. He grabbed another dollar and handed it to me, but he wouldn't let go. He wanted to know my first name, and I dodged answering because I was getting creeped out. He wouldn't let go of the money and was practically drooling for more data about me. I gave him a name I don't use and he smiled, finally letting go. I got his change and told him to have a nice day. I then immediately left the window and told one of my coworkers about the weird experience. He returned just two hours later. I didn't recognize his car on the cameras until he got to my window. I hadn't thought too much about about our interaction and was busy texting my dad about whether or not a chicken sandwich was a burger. My stomach dropped when I saw his face. I have many regulars, all of whom might have been happy to see. I hope he doesn't become one. I'll call the police. He smiled and said, hey, the one 
with the last name. I half smiled back. He wished for the days when we all wore masks. I tell him his total and he makes me chase the money again for the entire time. He had his phone against his ear facing me. He starts asking even more intimate questions about me. I lie or dodge them best I can, giving him zero correct answers, wanting our interaction to be as short as possible. Some of the questions he asked me, how often do you work? What time do you leave? How old are you? For that one, I knew he wouldn't leave without a number, and I had a nasty feeling the younger wouldn't be the better. So I said, probably 20s. He joked about me being legal. I made a face and tried to get his change even faster. He asked if I had a boyfriend. I was getting more and more nervous, so my answers started getting more sarcastic. I told him boys are trouble. He specifically talked about himself and said he'd treat me right. I handed him his receipt and told him to have a great night. He threw his hands in the air and was saying, don't be like that, I'll treat you right. Right. I shut my window and said bye. He made a bit more of a fuss, but eventually drove forward. From his question about when I got off work, I believed he was watching the restaurant. I was shaky by this time and called my mom. She immediately drove up. I talked to my manager and I was a little unsure of the car's color, so he checked the camera for me. Shout out to my manager. He's the best. I continued at my window, watching for the old guy, but I didn't see him again. I left an hour early and gave my manager specific instructions to not place a girl at my window. Tigred. These interactions are unfortunately what caused formerly happy and cheerful service workers to become sour and quiet. I think I'll be taking a couple days off. I had already had another job lined up and I'm excited to start it. I'm currently traveling sea with my two brothers. We just arrived in Saigon this morning. In the evening after dinner and a few beers me and my two brothers decided to sit on a bench in Haldan Park and have a quick smoke. We were chatting away sat on the bench when I noticed a Vietnamese man repeatedly looking at us and walking in circles very near where we were sitting. At first I wasn't too concerned about him however my spider senses were alerted. Then a minute or two later I noticed another Vietnamese man dressed as a grab delivery driver acting suspicious and repeatedly looking at me and my brothers. The stalkers were both on the phone and I believe they were communicating with each other. Being in a foreign country this alerted us heavily and we decided to leave however it was a good 600 meter walk to the park exit. As we were walking, I noticed both Vietnamese men had got on mopeds and were following us through the park, stopping behind trees and watching us. They then overtook us and sat at a bench further down the path waiting for us to cross their path. Being aware of this, we left the path and started walking on muddy grass as the crow flies to the nearest exit, avoiding the two men who were still watching us and clearly had bad intentions. We are 100 meters from the exit when my younger brother looks behind us to see one of the men sprinting towards us. My younger brother took stance, standing his ground and asked the man what he wanted. The man's posture became very small and he began talking very quietly. Both me and my younger brother kept a good distance and told him to leave us alone as we walked backwards towards the exit, noticing the second assailant was also approaching us wearing motorcycle gear. However, my oldest brother decided instead of trying to get out of the situation, he got closer to the whispery Vietnamese man to hear what he was saying. Both me and my younger brother were yelling at him to get out of here, but he was being an idiot. It took the Vietnamese guy five seconds to win my oldest brother's trust. Then out of nowhere when my older brother was leaning and very close trying to hear the whispery man, the guy grabbed my brother's crotch. He was shocked. I was ready to fight, expecting to be robbed or something, but the crotch grab was super unexpected and a real curveball. After the crotch grab, we started shouting and approached the men in an aggressive manner in a fighting stance. This slowed down their approach enough for us to make a dash for the park exit. The whole situation was unexpected and we didn't engage in any violence towards the men, just shouting at them. They walked out the exit into the busy city and walked around for a while marking sure we were not being followed before heading back to the hotel. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened. It was during May and I stayed after school with half of my grade due to an award show. It was conducted by the literature department and our principal. Lee and my group actually won the best message award for our short film. Anyways, after the award show was over me and my friends went back to our classroom to change into more comfortable clothes and to spend some more time together while we waited for our parents to come pick us up. Only five of us were in that classroom. As time went by, three of my friends left with their parents. It was only me and my best friend in the classroom. 30 minutes later, her dad called her to say they were waiting for her on the school's yard. By the way, our classroom is on the third and highest floor. Together, we walked down the stairs to the ground floor. She asked me if I wanted to come outside with her and maybe wait in the waiting area next to the security. To this day, I cursed myself for not saying yes. Instead, I said no and decided to wait in the waiting area inside our building. I could have went to my principal's office 
office and wait with her since she liked spending time with me and talking to me. If you couldn't tell I was a nerd and one of the top people in my grade. Anyways, in my school there were five couches in the waiting area for both students and parents. As I was walking to the waiting area I saw a janitor but didn't think much of it. I put my bags down but as I was about to sit down I had a weird feeling like he was watching me and my moves. I felt too uneasy to sit down so I stayed standing up while holding my bags in case I had to run or throw them to save myself. As a reflex I raised my head and looked at him. He continued to look at me. It was as if we were in a race where neither of us were looking away. Believe me when I say I wanted to look away but couldn't. Maybe it was because I saw him as a threat or maybe it was because I was too scared and uncomfortable to move. He had this weird smirk on his face but since it was getting dark I couldn't exactly tell. I don't know how long we looked at each other but I broke out of my trance when I saw my classmate from the previous year walking outside the building. In a desperate attempt I waved at her and she saw it. Then I remember her coming in and walking towards me saying, I saw someone waving to which I replied with, oh it was me. I thought you left and was surprised to see you so I waved at you. Actually if you don't mind can you walk me to the waiting area next to the security. As we were walking outside I looked back and saw the janitor still staring at me. I was wearing high heels, a short score and a tight shirt but it was an award show and we wanted to dress up. I don't think that these sort of stuff happened to women because of what they wear but I do think he was staring at me because of my attire. At the waiting area next to the security I was so anxious while waiting for my mom, thinking what if he comes in here? Even when my mom came and when I got in the car I was shaking slightly and wasn't in the headspace to speak about anything. So I told my mom that we got an award but that I was too tired to speak. Also, to anyone wondering, I only told this story to two females I used to work with outside of school. I never had the courage to tell my parents or anyone in my school. However, after this incident, I tried to not be alone at school and always have someone with me in case something like this were to happen again. One of the reasons I never told anyone was the fact that nothing physically abusive happened and I probably couldn't prove anything. This was a hard dose of reality for me since I realized that females weren't safe anywhere not even in their high schools. Writing this makes me feel better in a way that I can finally let it out of my system. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. It was about 10 in the afternoon and I was staying at a hotel in downtown Chicago right by Lower Wecker Drive. I had just gotten an Uber Eats delivery because they weren't doing room service because of COVID. Hot bellies. Important later. I was listening to music but I had my hood up because it was freezing. I was smoking and this guy walked up to me and asked for a few cigarettes. I gave him one and my lighter to use. Come on you could give me more than that I thought if I just gave him another cigarette he'd leave so I gave him another one. I expected him to say thank you, give me my lighter back, and leave. He didn't do any of those things. He was standing right in front of me and I started to get anxious. I moved back and I'm essentially against the window for the area where you check in. He just kept standing there and then he noticed my bag of food. Can I have some of your food? I told him I was sorry that it was just a sandwich and soup because my husband ordered food from a different restaurant. Well at least give me half the sandwich then. I apologized again and said no. Then he started getting closer to me. I realized I needed to get away but he blocked me. Do give my lighter back I thought I needed to pretend I wasn't freaking out. I put out my cigarette and put it back in the pack. I don't have any food and I could freeze to death. I'm sorry you don't have food. I don't know what else to say. I didn't want to say hey you're wearing a really nice looking coat and fancy sneakers. So give me some of your food that he was right up in my face and I was scared because he seemed to be getting more angry. I'm sorry I can't please move yes you can. At this point I was terrified he was going to hit me or something so I banged on the window and the people at the check in desk ignored me. He got really angry and started yelling incoherently. Then like a miracle my mom called and I answered I started crying hysterically and I started saying mom. The, the, thank god oh my god oh my god this guy won't leave me alone. My mom told me to do anything to get away. At that moment the guy stepped back and looked around. There was no one around but I took advantage of him being distracted and pushed past him and ran inside. I was crying so hard I could barely get words out. I was so scared and I realized because I tried to get help and nothing happened. If my mom hadn't called I don't know what would have happened. Later I thought even if I gave him the soup it would be like when I gave him a cigarette and it wasn't enough. I did go back down for a cigarette later but I stayed by the revolving door. This woman was also smoking and I told her what happened. She showed me her mace and said all women should have it.
She gives in context, I've been homeless with my mom and her emotional support animal for the last few months. When we first became homeless, it was my first year of college. Where I live, college is free for the first two years. And my college, after I gave them an explanation, gave me and my mom a hotel room for a few weeks. The hotel room was fine, nothing special but was probably better than most considering it was like $170 per night. About two days into our stay, we went downstairs to do laundry, but the washers in the hotel was too much expensive for us. So I texted her and was waiting by it for my her to pull the car up so we could go to a laundromat instead. While I was waiting, I was on my phone so I didn't notice my mom pull up and she yelled to me to hurry up and get in the car. While I grabbed the dog and my clothes, I noticed she was talking to the man two doors down from our room. Our room was on the second floor so I thought it was weird that she started a conversation from the car to someone upstairs so when I got in the car, I asked her about it. She proceeded to tell me after she yelled at me to hurry up, he had responded to her that he'd be down in a minute. So she was explaining to him that she was talking to me. We both thought it was weird that he responded like that to her, but I brushed it off that maybe he was waiting for someone from Uber or something. That was until we got back to see his door slightly open and him staring out of it with just his face. I tried to brush it off again because I thought that maybe he was still waiting for an Uber or Lyft or something. Because he had everything in his room turned off and it was still quite cold out being in the beginning of spring. I would see this man staring out of his room with all of his lights off periodically about half the time I left or was coming back to the room. My mom, who is a heavy smoker, would get scared by the man staring at her and would come back inside the room early. So throughout our stay, we tried our best to avoid the man if we could. If he opened his door, we went back inside. If we went outside or got back from somewhere and he was staring, we'd avoid eye contact. A little later that night, I went out to the car for something and saw a couple sitting on the stairs talking about something but I didn't think much of it. Later that night, it was probably about 3 in the morning, I was gaming with my friends and my mom was up watching TV. We're both night owls, when all of a sudden our dog started barking at the door. We thought this was weird since she had never just barked randomly at the door, only really barking when she wanted food we were eating or when she wanted to play. I grabbed her and put her in my lap, petted her while I played to calm her down. Her barking at the door became something she did often during our stay there and it was almost exclusively at night within the hours of 2am to 7am. We didn't figure out what her barking was about till the end of our stay in the hotel. Our last day there, we saw that couple moving out of their room. Turned out they were next to us, and my mom got to talkie with them while I was putting our stuff in the car. It turned out the couple was movie rooms because the man from two doors down was harassing the couple, knocking on their door and singing to the woman through the door late at night. Our dog was more than likely barking at the man whenever he approached our room, as one night we were awoken by what sounded like a knock before our dog started barking but by the time I checked the door there was no one there. He was probably trying to do a similar thing he did to that couple with us, and with him staring out the door he was more than likely mentally unwell. And while I hope he gets the help he needs, I also hope he didn't do something potentially harmful to anyone else who ended up in the rooms next to him. I tend to go running and walk my dog anywhere between midnight and 5 in the morning. I wear it for safety. Also, my puppy is a new addition to my nightly routine as I've only had him for a year. I know as a young woman in her 20s it's not smart, but I've been doing it for quite some time. It's where I go to clear my head and feel safe though it is ironically very unsafe I suppose. I just moved to a new area and though it should be safer than the inner city, I've been having enough odd things happen to make me scratch my head. Tonight, around 4.45 and 5 in the morning as I'm walking my dog in the neighborhoods across the intersection, a silver Toyota is very slowly driving up behind me. Before it passes, it pulls back and reverses. I assume it's someone parking or pulling into their driveway. At this point, I'd already crossed the street to avoid another oddly idling car, so even as I tried to rationalize it, I was on high alert. To backtrack, originally, I'd been walking on the left side and crossed to the right because the first car had pulled up then been idling there for quite some time as my dog and I slowly made our way up the street towards it. I always play it safe this early, late, so I crossed just in case it was a weird person. As the Toyota reverses, a man steps out of the first car, which is now diagonally from me, looks at me, looks at my dog, locks his car, and heads across the street away from me. This was a T intersection for reference. I'm not sure if this other car is of relevance. However, as I'm paying attention to this, I still note the second car that had reversed into a spot in the street and had it moved. No one had gotten in or gotten out. I stay vigilant as there's usually not too much activity in the suburbs around this time unless it's the weekend and people are partying late. Two cars on 
the same street. Same behavior was incredibly odd. I breathed a sigh of relief as first guy who had looked at me several times at this point as he crossed the street and right before he got in, finally left into the apartment complex gate. Sometimes I wonder if I look suspicious to being out so late. I finally make it to the top of the T and go right and there's only one block until a main road then from there I can cross to my apartment. There's usually a few cars here and there at this time. I make it to the well lit main street and relax. The second I let my guard down as if on quit the silver Toyota pulls past and reverses towards me. Note that before I had it passed just idled behind me and now he was reversing in front of me. My gut clutches and I knew it was one of those moments. I go cut me. Decisions. I hesitate. He's about 5 to 10 yards ahead. I considered walking past normally and running if things got weird but decided to trust my gut and cross the street. Just as I check traffic to see if I can cross, he steps out. I consider running again. I see no one coming. Not a car in sight. It's a tanned, bald man holding a cigarette. It was particularly strange because rarely have I had people step out of their vehicle to try and do something to me. In my experience, if you ignore whoever is trying to lure you into their car and don't get close, they just drive off. It's why I avoid vehicles in general to not give a chance of contact. He circled all the way around the car to the sidewalk, looks at me then just says, oh, I thought you needed a ride as if he realized something. It was the way he said it, just like that, not a question. As I'm answering, he's already leaving the curb. No, sir. Then he just went back to his driver's side, hops in and drives off. It was just strange. He said it like a statement and basically barely waited for my response. I wonder what he was planning to do and why he had second thoughts. I'll never stop my nighttime adventures, but one day I might not have any more luck left. My name is Slade. I'm 25, born and raised in Arizona. This literally just happened to me, so I decided to bring it here to all of you wonderful people this evening. I'm a huge stoner and don't drive. I decided to take a bus a few miles down to the dispensary. This was at about 8.30 in the afternoon. Wanted to get a new Indica card. Purple Punch, it's my favorite by far. Doubt it. Walked back towards the bus stop to go back home. As I walked closer to the bus bench, I noticed a guy sitting there. Didn't think much of it. I'm antisocial, so I always go into any social setting ready to be absolutely absolutely silent. However, I didn't get a chance this time, because as I'm sitting down he starts asking me something dot dot dot, but I had my headphones on and couldn't quite hear what he said so I took my headphones off and asked what was that. Then he responds, did you want to get your hair cut? Well staring at me dot dot dot, with very wide eyes dot dot dot, not blinking dot dot dot, if I were a bitty man. I'd say he was on something. I definitely wasn't expecting that question and I just awkwardly say oh, uh, I'm alright. I then noticed he was wearing an Arizona Cardinals uniform and I just so happened to be an Arizona Cardinals fan. So since my entire socializing ability revolves around sports, I decided to ask, are you an Arizona Cardinals fan? He then looks at me funny for a split second. No, I just got this a few months ago. He says, I then ask, oh, dot dot, so how long have you been cutting hair? Without blinking, he answered, just picked it up a few months ago. Who taught you how to cut hair? I asked, even more sketched out at this point. His eyes shifted and then he says, I learned on my own dot dot dot, come on man, let me touch you up in the back. Mind you, he was consistently pushing to cut my hair throughout this conversation. I even told him like I don't have any cash on me right now, indicating that like I couldn't even pay for this service even if I wanted a dot dot dot, but he just answers but that's no problem. I got my clippers in my bag now, come on. So, I decided to just be real with the guy, listen, I'm real sorry, I just don't feel very comfortable getting haircuts from people I don't know dot 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 and like at night and stuff, you feel me. This dude never changed facial expressions this entire interaction, he finally goes through that, continues to glare into my soul. I decided decided in that moment it was time to get out of there. Luckily this bus stop was right in front of our local gas station. So I just walked in there for a few minutes just to kill time because unfortunately that bus wasn't showing up for another 17 minutes. I didn't want to stay long because I didn't want the employees to think I was steely or something so I waited only about 6 to 7 minutes and literally as I'm walking out. There I see the haircut guy walking in, still staring at me. Luckily I walked past him and I just noped out of there to another bus stop down the street. Bus finally got there. I saw the dude at the back of the bus, but he didn't bother me anymore and I made sure to keep my eyes the complete opposite of his direction the entire time. This happened almost 15 years ago when I was 7. My best friend's mom would babysit my brother and I before and after school. My mom would usually drop us off at our house around 6A in the morning. She would make us breakfast and the three of us would walk to our elementary that was less than 10 minutes away. For preface, we would walk through an adjacent neighborhood through this small wooded area that had an enclosed bridge and that led us to the back of our elementary. The elementary sits back in a long tree line that runs about half a mile north and another mile south. Anyways, we're about to get to the turn where we 
walk into the tree line to the bridge and this guy comes cruising down the street. At first, I don't even think we noticed him considering how young we were, but right when he's about 10 feet away from us, he slows down to virtually 0 miles per hour. There was nothing that stood out about his appearance either. He was middle aged, white male, very generic. Well, we all stare at the car and start walking super slowly. If we stop, he would stop. If we walk, he would slowly go. During this whole ordeal, he has a blank expression on his face. Not anger, no smirk, just this sinister deadness almost. This went on for probably 5 minutes because we were too scared he'd jump out of the car if we turned our backs on him and I was mainly scared for my little brother. Finally, he speeds off and we run the rest of the way to school. Immediately go to the principal's office and at this point we are bawling. We gave them our version of the story, his description, and whatever else a 7 year old is actually capable of giving. They take action by calling the cops and our parents. The cops come and we explain where it happened in the story again. Then our parents ended up taking us out of school. From then on, we weren't allowed to walk to school anymore and our babysitter would take us. The reason this ended up being so creepy is because apparently there had been reports around that time of a guy who would sit under the bridge we walked over right by the school and watch people. They didn't know if he was homeless or if it was this other guy who we encountered. They never caught the guy and we never saw him again. One night my mom asked me to throw out the trash I live in a tiny residential complex meaning six to seven small buildings together bounded by a common walls and fencing. It also has a two small parks in it so my area is pretty safe. Not a lot of people enter here because it's a bit secluded. That night not a lot of people were present and I was going towards the garbage can which was right outside the complex. It was dark when I first noticed this guy we made eye contact and I could tell he was struggling a little to find the address. I just ignored him and threw the trash into the can. While returning he was still there in the dark darkest corner and again I eyed him suspiciously. I really like to help people with addresses. So he called me towards him and said he lost his job in COVID and now has to do this but is not very good at directions. I still was standing at a safe distance because I found this guy suspicious. I asked him where he wanted to go and he answered a location opposite to where I live. I asked to use Google but then he took out his phone and said this is my company phone I don't know how to use it please tell me how to. I just told him to type the address and well he already knew how to use the Google Maps because the address was already typed in but still kept asking me how to. I didn't realize then, but he was trying to get me closer to his bike. I was cautious, so I took the phone from his hand and started the maps and handed it to him. He was still asking obvious questions, but I already started walking away. Then he started saying thanks in a very sweet voice that gave me the chills. He was complimenting me how sweet of a girl I am. I waited before going to my building in case he was following me. You might think the interaction I had with him wasn't that creepy, but here's the deal. After a few days, I heard a similar story of the delivery guy asking for the same address from my friend but the creepy part was he gave her the phone and started jacking it in front of her. He even threw a used tissue on her feet while wiping his kids with the tissue in front of her and then trying to touch her. I then heard the same story from another friend but her story was even worse. She met the same person as well in our local area doing all of the same stuff and jacking it in front of her. He somehow got her number and found her house. He called her and told her that he knew where she lives and how he likes her and all. Turns out a lot of girls of my age group saw and helped this guy and saw him pulling out his thing in front of them and jacking it. I was the only lucky person to not witness it. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was little I lived in an apartment complex that consisted of two buildings with a slight gap in between them. It was only about 50 feet so I'd often walk by myself to go visit my mom's best friend in the other building. The apartments were surrounded by thick woods that had blackberry brambles so thick you couldn't stick your hand in without getting torn up by thorns. One afternoon I went to my mother's best friend's apartment to deliver Girl Scout cookies and stayed later than I meant to because I was fascinated by her aquariums. It had started to get dark by the time I was leaving but I wasn't scared because the buildings were so so close. I had taken about 10 steps when my inner voice started screaming. I'm older now so I recognized what it was but at the time it was like being overwhelmed with a feeling in my gut. I looked into the woods across the parking lot and saw the intense red glow from someone taking a drag on a cigarette. I turned back towards my apartment, trying to pretend I hadn't seen anything but then I heard the sound of something large moving in the woods. I turned my head for just a moment and there was a gaunt, scary looking man starting to run at me. I took off, screaming bloody murder, knowing I was less than 50 feet away from 
from the safety of my apartment. I could hear his feet sloppy the pavement behind me and he was gaining on me. I was nearly on my porch steps when my uncle, who lived next door, opened his door to see why I was screaming bloody murder. I collapsed into his arms screaming about the man chasing me from the woods but by the time Mike opened his door, the man was gone. At first they didn't believe me because there had been nobody there but I was so hysterical they decided to check it out. They noticed an area that had been disturbed in the blackberry brambles but they were so thick, Mike had to use his machete to cut through them. About two feet into the area of the disturbance, there was a small clearing with a pile of cigarette butts where the man had been standing, watching and waiting for me. The man chasing me had disappeared so they think he ran between the buildings when I started to get close to my apartment door. So about a week after this incident, my mother's boyfriend and I were riding dirt bikes through the woods by our apartment. There was a retainer pond that we liked to fish at so we were headed out that day to see if we could catch anything. We discovered a campsite on the trail that hadn't been there a few weeks prior and Russ decided to check it out. It was just a tent, cooler, a fire pit, and trash strewn everywhere. The trash part really bugged Russ because we believe in the leave it better than you found it principal and I could tell he was pissed. As we approached the tent, he announced himself to see if anyone was there and when they didn't respond, he pulled back the zipper of the tent. After looking inside for a moment, he ordered me to back up but the damage had already been done since I had gotten a clear look at what was in the tent. Attached to the walls and literally the floor was some of the most brutal and sadistic adult magazine content anyone could imagine. And the worst part of it was, the graffiti that had been added after the fact, most of the models had their eyes scratched out, lines across their throat like they'd been cut and there was blood drawn on dripping out of their orifices. It's been over 30 years since this happened and the images still splash bright upon my memory. There was a torn sleeping pad and the pad looked like it had a substantial stain that could have been blood. Russ stood there in silence for a minute then told me to get on my bike because we were going home. When we got home he called the sheriff then led them out to the torture tent in the woods. They destroyed the campsite and it was never spoken of again. I never put two and two together as a child but as I got older when I thought about it I realized how unbelievably lucky I am. So this happened about seven months ago. I was visiting San Diego for job interviews and staying at my favorite hotel in Sorrento Mesa. For a background, I'm a 40 year old man and a pretty big guy. I'm six foot one and a former club bouncer. Now, onto the weirdness. On my third night, I was up pretty late after hanging out with some old friends after my interviews. I got back to the hotel around two in the morning with some Sunny's donuts. After eating a few, drinking a few more, and watching South Park, I decided to have a smoke before going to bed. This made it now around three in the morning. So I go downstairs, walk out front to the smoking area by the fountain, but there's another couple who are also staying at the hotel already there. I didn't want to impose, so I decided to just walk around the outside parts of the hotel while I smoked. I walked around the pool, the barbecue area, the basketball courts, then started back for the side door. As I did, a black sedan drove up alongside me and stopped. The window rolled down, and a tiny Asian woman asked if I knew how to get out of the parking lot and back to the street. Now, from where we were when she asked me, this was literally in a straight line about 150 feet in front of her, so I thought she was drunk or just blind. So I just politely said yes, just keep going straight, and turn left at the tree. She then asked me if I could get in the car and show her. Now, again, I'm a former club bouncer. There was absolutely no intimidation factor, but for some reason, I instantly felt uneasy. Again, it was literally right in front of her, she could see the road. Also, the windows were all tinted far more than they should have been, and I honestly couldn't tell if anyone else was in the car. I used the smoking as an excuse to not get in the car, but she she said she didn't mind and gave me a very creepy smile. I politely declined and again pointed out that the road was literally right there so I'd just be walking back in 5 seconds anyway. She again asked if I would get in and show her. This was feeling like a weird kid slash ice cream truck situation. I mean guys, how often do decently good looking women just drive up and ask you to get in their car at 3 in the morning in a hotel parking lot? Nothing about it was right. Again, I politely declined as I finished my smoke and was luckily already standing right at the hotel side door when all this started so I just went in. The woman just drove off as she rolled up the window right exactly to the exit she just asked me to show her to. So I told the front desk about it and they said they'd keep an eye out but I'm quite sure nothing was ever done or came of it. Just one of those things that really makes me wonder why did she want me in the car so badly for? It had to be some kind of scam. I just wonder exactly how much danger I was in.
I live in Sacramento, California, where every summer we have the state fair. I was in my late teens and my friend and I decided to check out the fair together. Parking was $10 and we were cheap and decided to park across the street. Well, a few streets deep in from across the street because a lot of people had the same idea. The fair was typical fair stuff and we had fun. It was almost 10 in the afternoon and we decided to get out of there. The fair was lit up with lights and chaos, but the further we got away from it and the deeper we got into the back streets across the street from the fair, the darker it got and the less people you saw. My friend faced me and said maybe I should get my mace out just in case and we both laughed because both of our families at different points had given us mace to stay safe. But because we were young and dumb we thought we were invincible. My friend drove so she was digging in her purse looking for her keys and slowed down while doing so and I was a few feet ahead of her. At that moment the fair fireworks started popping off in the sky and I turned around to look for several seconds it was walking backward while doing so. I turned around and at the moment as I was passing a creepy gray van a man popped out behind it and grabbed me for forcefully with both arms around me and started picking me up. Immediately my friend ran up and sprayed Mace in his face and she was able to do so because the Mace happened to be attached to her keychain which she just got out of her purse. She accidentally got some Mace in my eyes and it hurt but even though my eyes were burning, I vividly remember opening them up enough to see that there was this cloud of Mace floating in front of the guy's eyes as they were wide open as if the Mace did not affect him at all. Then he said calmly in a creepy voice I was just looking at her. We both screamed bloody murder and he let me go and we ran all the way to her car and got the heck out of Dodge. The weird thing is we didn't even go to straight to the police that night because I wasn't sure if that was enough of an offense to do so which I am in my 40s now and know that it is. I should have gone straight to the police then. I tried calling the non-emergency line the next day to report it as I was suffering from red and swollen eyes from the mace and I was being placed on hold and not being taken seriously so I eventually let it go and moved on with my life. A week later I heard in the news that there was a man wanted by police that lingered around the American River trails who was abducting women and taking them into his van and assaulting them. I always wonder what would have happened if my friend wasn't there. Would I even be here? I have never been so thankful to be maced in the face. Ladies dot 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 even men. Carry mace or some type of self-defense tool. It's an unpredictable scary place out there sometimes. This happened almost 10 years ago when I was about 18. I wanted to go pick up some groceries at our local Walmart. It was around 11 in the afternoon at night and I just got off work. I usually have no problem going anywhere by myself, but on this specific night my inner self was telling me to invite my friend to tag along. I am roughly 5 feet tall, female, and 105 pounds, but I don't get spooked too easily and always carry pepper spray with me. Anyways, I call my friend to ask if she'll accompany me and I go and pick her up. We walk into the produce side of Walmart and almost right away I noticed this man staring at us very intently. He was around 5 foot 5, kind of heavy, had a Hawaiian shirt on, and looked of Hawaiian decent. So we're over by the fresh produce and I am keeping my eye on him as he pretends to be looking at bread but clearly keeps putting things back. I turn my back for a second to grab something, then I hear a male's voice ask, Hey, do you guys know of anywhere I can get food this late? For more background information, eat. I lived in a city of about 50,000 people. Right across from this Walmart was an Applebee's at McDonald's a quarter mile up the road and other various places to get food. Plus, we were in the middle of a bill mart, so I don't beat around the bush and flatly tell him about a couple restaurants around where we were. He then asks, well, what's fun to do around here? It's late at night, so nothing really to do except maybe go to Applebee's or a local bar. I tell him Applebee's is open and we have bars downtown, but that's all I am aware of. He proceeds to ask what we're doing when we leave and I tell him we have to leave now. He apologizes and says he didn't mean to be creepy, so we walk away and are looking for the frozen aisle when I spot him on the opposite side walking by. I tell my friend I had a bad feeling about him since we walked in and wanted to test out if he was following us. We walk a few more aisles and sure enough he is on the other end nonchalantly walking by pretending not to see us. I backtrack a couple of aisles to get something and he walks up pretending to look at things I finally ask if I can help him with something. I think I threw him off guard by being so direct because he stutters and asks what aisle the milk or something is in. I tell him and we leave to check out. Well, what do you know? He's in the checkout right next to us with a pack of gum, no milk or whatever else he was looking at. He finishes first and watches us as he leaves the store. We thinking he's gone by now tells my friend let's just run to the car. So we run out to the car, looking around to make sure we don't see him. Now here's the super creepy part. As I am leaving the parking lot, we spot him sitting on the trunk of his car watching people leave Walmart. I drive by to get his license plate number. He sees us and rushes into his car. I speed off as quickly as possible so he doesn't see where I went. I then call the cops and tell them what happened and relayed the license play to them. So creepy Hawaiian shirt guy who was supposedly looking for a place to eat while in the middle of Walmart, please let's never meet again. 
This happened about a month ago. For a bit of background, me, my cousin, and my brother took classes over the summer at a local college. Lee and my cousin took a biology class, while my brother took a precalculus class. My brother's class ends later than our class giving us a two-hour window where we'd sit around the college to wait for him. During the encounter, we were waiting for him at the cafeteria, passing the time. After a while, this woman in a wheelchair shows up in front of some vending machines a couple feet in front of us. I paid it no mind, but she sat in front of that vending machine for 10 minutes 15 minutes and started to play loud music. It startled me and so I looked up at her. She then looked at us and asked, do any of you boys have 10 cents I could use for the vending machine? I had two five dollar bills in my pocket in case I needed some food, so I gave her a five and I got handed back my change. Then she asked for another favor. This time it was to bring her to a parking lot near the football stadium where her ride would be waiting. She said she had never been there and needed some guidance. I figured there was no harm in helping her so I took the handles, but she immediately stopped me and asked for my cousin instead. I was being pretty oblivious during this entire encounter so I didn't even realize how strange that request was and didn't notice many of the strange things she did until later. And I also want to clarify that she was able to move on her own just fine so the request for a push at all was strange too. And as my cousin was pushing her she kept looking back at me and giving an uncanny smile like it was meant to be a friendly smile but it came off more like she had some sort of malicious intent. After we arrived she looks at us and asks could you two stay with me until my ride comes. Still giving us the smile but we reluctantly agreed. You know, once I had to go back and forth from here and the other parking lot, it was so annoying, she recalls as we wait. Me and my cousin shuffled at this because we found this extremely unsettling. This was because it meant she lied to us about not knowing where she was going. Even stranger, she tells me about how she loves to smash glass bottles to tame her anger dot 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 like the glass bottles she had in her hands at that moment. I hadn't caught onto the strangeness yet, but my cousin was unnerved. He was trying to discreetly point out that no cameras were around me and that not many people were around, but I didn't catch any of it. At some points while we were waiting, this one car would keep circling the parking lot too. We asked if it was her ride, but she told us that her ride was a van. At that time, our ride came so we apologized and left. We've told many other people about this story and they all agreed that she was acting pretty strange. Later, I realized how it seemed like she was trying to hard to be friendly, how anxious she seemed, and how many of the things she said didn't match up and seemed off. The main thing that fueled me seeing this as odd was the fact that according to my cousin and his sibling, there was an email sent out warning people about a potential human trafficking scheme caught on campus. I couldn't confirm the validity of it because me and my brother aren't actually enrolled into the school and therefore don't get messages about anything going on around campus, but nevertheless, it's caused me to relook what happened through that lens. Shortly after I turned 18, back in the early 2000s, I got a job at the local movie rental place to help pay for my college. I worked there for about two years and during that time had been promoted to hold keys to the store and open and close the registers. This also meant that I was occasionally working by myself for short periods of time. One such morning, I was going through the morning procedures and putting returned movies back on the shelves. I was accustomed to greeting every customer no matter what, not only as a friendly gesture but as a part of the loss prevention protocol. Anyway, this particular morning morning I was taking the movie cart around and reshelving the movies and I heard the door ding on the other side of the store so I greet whoever it is with my voice raised high. How are you today? Normally they would give a reply back but I didn't get one this time. So I'm looking between the shelves for the person that came in and I see a middle aged baldy man looking around. He seemed normal at first but didn't really say anything when I asked him the next two times if he needed help. He pretty much ignored me, so I went about my business while keeping my eye on him. He was starting to make me nervous because he wasn't really looking at anything, just kind of making it look like he was looking at what was in front of him when his attention was focused elsewhere, seemingly at the ceiling. So I decided to give it one more try to let him know that I'm wondering what he's doing. Can I help you find anything? I asked as I walked past him to put a movie away. At this point, he'd been in the store nearly 20 minutes. He responded in such a way that made it clear that there was something off in his mind, facing me but with his eyes averted from my face, he says in a startling loud drawling voice of, you know, just browsing. So I politely said, okay, just let me know if I can help you with anything and went about my duties. He left shortly after this, at which point I let out a sigh of relief. A few days went by and I was opening by myself again. I went to start shelving the movies when the door dinged, and I again turned to greet whoever it was when I saw the same guy be lining it straight at me. I kind of panicked a little but stood my ground, and when he got right up to me, seriously so close I leaned back away from him. He lifted an open can of nuts and offered cashew. Oh no, thank you, I said. I asked if I could help him find anything and he didn't answer, and he went to the start of the wall where the movies that started with it were located. 
which was just a few feet to the left of where I was putting up the B or C movies. He was very obviously pretending to look at movie boxes by picking them up and flipping them over and then putting them back. He continued this and shuffled along behind me as I moved down the wall. After a few minutes of this, I got uncomfortable and took the car to the front counter, at which point he left the store. A few customers came and went, and I went back to shelving the movies. When I was around the M area of the movie wall, Cashew Guy came back and continued his pretend perusal of the movie boxes, always just a few feet to left of me. So, in the next area of the store, there were shelves that went a bit higher than the rest, and on the very top shelf, there were softcore movies. There was also a back room that contained the hard stuff, but I only went in that room one time right before I quit just to see what it was like. Anyway, I was shelving the movies with Cashew Guy near me, not saying anything to me until I get to softcore section. He reached for one of the boxes at the top, which made me shudder, and says to me in his loud, strange voice, I bet you have one of those big football player boyfriends. Thoroughly creeped out and disgusted, I go straight to the front counter and another male customer walks in. This guy finds what he's looking for and goes to the register. I whispered to this guy that there was a man bothering me and I asked if he would stay until the guy leaves. He shrugged and just kind of stood by the door awkwardly until Cashew Guy walked out. I thanked the guy and he left. I went back to the shelves and not five minutes later, Cashew Guy came back and again tried to engage me in an awkward conversation. I went to the front counter and called my mom. She and my sister were out getting lunch so I told her what was going on and they brought me something to eat. As soon as I picked up the phone, he left the store. He didn't come back that day. Next door to the movie place was an electronic store that was run by a very nice and talkative man. I never spoke to his wife, but I knew English wasn't her first language. He would come over and use our shrink wrap machine and talk and make us laugh. One evening after my encounter with the strange man, the nice guy from the store came in more serious than normal and warned us about a man that had come in while his wife was working alone and he was out getting food. The man was walking around picking things up and putting them back down in such a way that made him uncomfortable. I knew who it was right away. After a while, the nice guy from the store's wife asked if he was going to purchase something and he picked up a random house phone and asked how much it was. She told him and he got upset at the price. He took it to the counter anyway and when she rang him up, he tried to pay with a crumpled up check from his pocket. She refused to accept the check and he got angry, so she called her husband to come back and handle the situation. Her husband told the man that the check was suspicious and they normally wouldn't accept it as payment. He understood that there was something off with this guy and agreed to accept the check on a condition that the man give a phone number where he could be reached. He told him that if the check bounced, he was going to call him and the man would have to cover the cost of it all. The man agreed, but he knew it was a bad deal all the way around. He said that after the man left the store, he went and stood in the parking lot and just stared up at the sky for about 10 minutes. I figured by his description that it was the same man who had been bothering me. One day not long after the above, I go to the movie store to pick up my paycheck and the girl working tells me some man came in asking about me. She said he seemed off and she said she knew he was talking about me when he referenced my curly hair. He gave me the creeps, but I personally never saw the guy again. I found out why when a few days later the guy who owned the other store came in saying that, unsurprisingly, the check the man had paid with bounced. He called the number the man gave him a few times and talked to the man on the phone. Each time getting nowhere in the conversation, he did a pretty good impersonation of the startlingly loud drawling voice. Oh, yeah, um, okay. Anyway, he called one more time, and a woman answered. When he explained the situation, the woman said, I'm his mother, he's not here anymore, I had him committed, and the hospital picked him up this morning. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The town I lived in could not even be called that. It was a settlement of perhaps two dozen acreages clustered together near a lake and boasted just an elementary school with grades kindergarten through grade five and no stores. On this particular day, I was at that school playground alone, swinging and pondering life. None of my friends were around, but the solitude never bothered me. I was perfectly content, swinging and daydreaming as I often did. That is when I noticed the van behind me. It was your classic creepy van, older, large and boxy, white generic van. It what struck me as odd was how slow the van was driving, it could not have been driving faster than 10 miles per hour. Still swinging, I craned my neck and watched this van slowly creep along and then out of my line of vision. I thought that was the end of it when, a few minutes later, along comes the van again, ever slow, and this time, driving on the road in front of the park the best way to vision where I was is that of a square. Road wraps completely around the playground, which is situated on a slight hill. I watched the van creep along, turn left and out of sight and back behind me it came creeping along, ever slow and present. As I watched it, disappear for the second time, I recalled an incident that took place just two months prior. In the nearby town where I was attending school, a few kids in the grade below mine had been approached by a man as they walked home from school 
who offered them candy. He had allegedly been driving a white van. School officials had urged us to stay very vigilant. I began to run across the field, determined to beat the van to that road. Don't panic. I told myself, it's probably not the same guy. And that is when the idea hit me. Oh, the idiotic, dangerously foolish idea hit me. I was going to hide myself in a nearby bush, and as the van crept by, I would obtain its license plate and give it to the police. It would be too uzzy. 12-year-old self, what were you thinking? I was thinking, because I did just that. I hid in the bushes, and I waited, and waited. I waited to no avail. And as I waited, the logical part of my brain kicked in. This was an extremely lonely, well-concealed spot of land. Maybe, just maybe, trying to obtain this license plate was not a smart idea. I suddenly wanted very much not to be in that isolated bush. Abandoning my attempts at being Nancy Drew, I began the journey home with a sense of urgency. As I walked along the road, a dirt pavement, I took in my surroundings and saw no van. Perhaps it had left the area. I thought hopefully. I turned right, away from the school and playground, and began to walk towards my house. Safety lay just beyond the hairpin turn of a road that I was jaunting along. A loud screeching of tires came into my ear canal. I turned slightly and saw it. The white van. Where it came from, I did not know. What I did know was that I was extremely isolated and that it was speeding towards me. That is when the lizard brain took over. I no longer thought. I read. I was no longer a whole being. My sole purpose was to run. I can still feel my sweaty feet sliding around in my sandals. Still see my pink skirt frantically trying to keep up with my. Still hear those squealing tires. I flung myself down the hill. At the foot of it lay my house, my lifeline. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the van for the last time. It was haphazardly turning left and away from me. The next thing I knew, I was standing at the family deep freeze, a red freezy in my hand. Vaguely, I heard a faint voice, miles away. I was breathing heavily, hyperventilating really. What happened? What happened? My dad's face was white as a ghost. A hardened man. He looked truly afraid. I spat out the story and burst into tears. My dad hugged me. You're safe. He assured me. Then he left, determined to find this van. As he was gone, I run throughout the house, locking the doors when dad returned. He told me he had seen no van. It had disappeared into the afternoon sun. Dad phoned the police anyway, and he stressed the similarities between what happened to me to the reports of what happened to my schoolmates. Unfortunately, the police never came to talk me. I don't think they really cared. I stayed in the house for the next few days, afraid to venture out. As the days wore, I never gained my confidence to return to the park, and life went on. I never did see that van again. I still shudder to think about what may have happened all those years ago if I had let that van catch up to me. The people in this story are me, a family of four consisting of a mother, father, toddler, and baby. And, of course, our guests of honor, the creep. For context, I am a 17-year-old female. I was born and raised in Canada with a pretty sheltered life as my mother is very overprotective. But up until this point, I have never dealt with harassment before. For the summer, I am visiting my godmother in Italy. This is my first time leaving Canada. Since she works during the weekdays, I travel about on my own around Italy. For this story, I took a ferry to Ischia, a small island in Napoli to tour around. When I first arrived on the island, I made the plan to head to a small scenic park not too far from the port so I could plan my day. It was around 3 in the afternoon when I was at the park. Now the park itself made its way into a semi-forested area. The pathways were covered by trees and bushes alike so it's easy to get lost in there, at least for me. It was also pretty desolate at the time and gone from the public eye. I was sitting on the bench next to a playground for children, decked out with swings and slides. There was a family a little away from me playing at the playground. The playground resides in a little circle-like clearing in the park. On opposite sides of the clearing are the pathways that take you around the park. The paths have trees making a tunnel-like path so it can be hard to see down it unless you are directly in front of it. From where I was sitting on the bench, which was near the north pathway, I could directly see down the south pathway. Now I was sitting at this bench for a while, mind you, as Italy is pretty hot and I'm not used to the heat. My head was down looking at my phone so I wasn't exactly paying attention to the outside world but I would look up periodically to watch the family play. It was around now 4 in the afternoon, which was nearing when I had to leave to catch my ferry back. As I was about to pack up, I look up from my phone and see a guy standing in the path across from me, the south pathway. Now I wear glasses. My eyesight isn't that good, so I couldn't really make out what this guy was standing there for at first glance. I also didn't want it to be known that I had my eyes on him, so I would try to get a better look from my peripherals. After a minute of watching this guy and trying to figure out why he was staring at me, I come to a horrifying conclusion 
conclusion. To put it lightly, this guy was jacking off in public while watching me. It was light out and a literal family was not even 10 feet away from me. This was the first time I've ever experienced anything like this so I was scared. Let me make myself clear, I look like a teenager. I have acne and a baby face so it is very clear I am underage. As I was sitting there panicking about what to do, I see this guy move side to side on the path to get a better look at me. The creep looked unassuming, with some grey basketball shorts, a black graphic shirt, and a balding head. From what I could tell he was around his early 30s. I don't speak much Italian, and with how frazzled I was from this all, I could not utter a cohesive sentence. After sitting on the bench for another minute trying to calm down and think clearly, I pull out my translator app and type in a message to translate to Italian. Now to not alert this creep that I knew what he was doing, I stood up casually and began to make my way to the mother of the family who was with her young baby at the time. The father and the toddler I believe were got playing off a little farther in the trees as I could not see them. While shaking with nerves, I approached the mother and hold up my phone with the message on it without a word. Now from where the mother was, you could not see down the path, so she was none the wiser about what was happening. Roughly, my translated message went along the line of hello, sorry I do not speak much Italian, but I am in need of help. There is a creepy guy on the path over there watching me and I am scared. Now I know I probably should have made my situation more clear in the message, but I was freaking out and I didn't know how well my English would translate into Italian, so I kept it short. After the mother read the message, she got a concerned look on her face and asked me to show her where this guy was. Now we walked like five feet over to where the path begins to find the guy and he's gone. I assume he saw me walking towards the mother. Thankfully, I came to find out the mother speaks a little English, so I was able to communicate roughly what the creep was doing. Since she was with a baby, I didn't want her to go after the creep, but she was mad enough to attempt. Eventually, she told me her husband would be back soon and he spoke more fluently. Once he came back, I re-explained what happened and asked if I could follow them out of the park to a public area so I would not be left alone and vulnerable. While they were packing up their belongings, I called my godmother and gave her a brief rundown of the situation and that I'll be making my way back to the ferry. Now, I would love to say this is where my tale ends without any more troubles, but sadly, that was not how it went. After me and the family left the playground area, we we made our way to the opposite path from where the creep was to where I assumed was the exit to the park into the main road. While walking, the mother tried to comfort me, assuring the guy wouldn't follow me as he left as soon as he got a clue that I caught on. I thought differently as I could see this guy very clearly from where I was sitting and was not subtle about his staring. After walking a bit more throughout the path to the exit, I spot a familiar looking man walking back to the playground. Once I made eye contact with him, I immediately knew it was the creep from before, walking casually like nothing was wrong. Once he spotted me walking with the the family, he quickly made a turn onto a path that diverged from the main one. This creep was circling back to find me, assuming that I stayed at the playground or was walking alone to the exit. I lean over to the mother and quickly tell her that it was the same guy. Unfortunately, the path that the guy took to avoid us was the same one we needed to take to get to the exit. This dumb creep cornered himself without any way to leave except to pass by us. The father at that point had the baby in his arms and the toddler following closely behind him. The mother in a rage followed shortly after the creep cussing him out in a mix of English. English, Italian, and Spanish. This creep walked sheepishly off with his head tucked pretending he could not hear the lady yelling at him. Finally, after the angry mother stopped following the man, we made it to the exit of the park. I thanked them profusely and bid my farewells and made my way down to the port. That family saved me from a dangerous situation and I could not be more thankful for their comfort and protection. I often think about what could have happened had I left the park on my own, knowing this guy would have circled back for me. So for my first harassment experience, I give the rating negative 1 out of 5 stars would not recommend. So to the creepy guy in the park, let's not meet ever again. At the time of this happening, I, a 23-year-old female, was a teen and homeless in a big city. I just recently moved to that city and was on my way back to the shelter from the public library. I was taking a shortcut through an alley wide enough for a car to go through, and I noticed an old beat-up looking car come into the alley and driving slowly behind me. I figured they probably just didn't feel like they had enough room to pass me, so I picked up the pace and crossed the street. They drove to the same side of the street that I was on and kept pace with me. There was just one guy in the vehicle, looked to be in his mid-twenties and his Hispanic. He rolled down his window and said, Hey, are you okay? How old are you? I looked like I was about 14 and I'm pretty short, so I got that question a lot. I just responded, I'm fine and I'm not a minor if that's what you're asking. He asked me if I needed a ride and I politely declined. Then he starts telling me he's just really concerned and wanted to talk really insistently and smiling through almost this entire interaction. I asked him why we couldn't just talk on the street where we were and he dodges the question and again asks me if I'm sure that I don't want a ride. My gut was telling me he had 
bad intentions, and if I were as young as I looked I might have fallen for it. Instead, I looked around me to make sure I wasn't going to get ambushed, and walked up to his passenger window. I told him in the most threatening voice I could muster, I know you don't really want to talk. I'm sure you have worse things in mind, and I've memorized your license plates and I'm going straight to the police station. I better not ever see you again. I never saw him again. Unfortunately though, I forgot to write down his plates and the shelter curfew was going into effect soon and I didn't have time to file a report at the station. It didn't occur to me to call the non-emergency number. I also purchased as large of a knife as I legally could for self-defense. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For some context, my cousin and I are the same age. We are both women and currently 25 years old. She is only 5 days younger than me and her family rented a floor in my parents' house when we were toddlers, so we basically did everything together and spent all of our days together until we turned 5 when her family bought an apartment in another city. Since we had a very strong connection, almost codependent, it was very difficult for us to get used to not living together and 2 years later we have made an agreement with our parents that we will visit each other each weekend. And during the summer break she will spend one week of our place and I will spend the other week at their place and we will basically exchange like that until the end of the summer break. This went on for years. Since we were spending all our free time together, by the time we turned 10 we have already exhausted all of our adventure ideas in the backyard. Tree climbing, building a tree house, setting up tents, camping in the backyard and stuff. And we really needed something new, so we have decided to go fishing together every Friday on the river near my house. Now, of course we had no tools needed for a true fishing experience. We had a butterfly net that we would place in the water and on a good day we would catch a dozen of tiny fish with it. That was enough for our restaurant game. We would come back home, bake the fish under the sunlight, and then serve it and decorate it in plastic plates that we would later serve to our imaginary customers. We've done this for weeks and always made sure we were safe while doing it and that wasn't that difficult since it's a very peaceful neighborhood. And there was usually no one else at the river at the time we were there. But one day it was different. Very different. How I remember it. A couple of days ago the memory of this encounter suddenly spilled out in my mind. We were either 10 or 11 years old and it was Friday. She was at our place that week so we took the butterfly net and went fishing on the river. We were alone, sitting under a large willow tree right next to the river. Suddenly a man showed up from nowhere. He was standing a couple of meters away from us. He had a blackish hair with plenty shades of gray, so I'm guessing he was in his late 40s or early 50s. He had a dark blue shirt, a little smudged on the collar. He asked us what we were doing and we said we were fishing. He continued walking back and forth on that part of the shore. Then he came a little closer and we got up. He told us he was having issues with his wife and we just nodded our heads, trying to avoid the conversation and follow the don't talk to strangers rule. We didn't ask him anything. He took a flip phone out of his pocket and opened it in front of us. I have to show you my wife. He said, okay, we replied. When he found what he was looking for, he came even closer and turned the phone towards us. It was a picture of a completely naked woman sitting in a chair with her legs spread. We just nodded. He then proceeded to show us more pictures and it was quite clear that it wasn't his wife because the pictures were of the same woman. But all of them were naked, from head to toe, with their legs spread or in other very suggestive positions. Now that I think of it, the quality of the images, the fashion, and the aesthetics could be best described as adult content from the 70s. It could be that he took pictures from some old magazine or had them sent by someone. I remember I looked at my cousin and mouthed, it's not his wife, and she nodded. Isn't she beautiful? He asked. She is. I replied and my cousin nodded. We then remembered that we have left our net in the river so we went back to the willow tree and reached for the net. He was standing there, in the same spot as before, looking at his phone. He then showed us a very low quality picture of two naked men and another naked woman. This picture actually looked like pictures taken with a flip phone camera. This is me, he said and pointed at one of the men in the picture. We just nodded and said we had to go home. He then said the words that have been haunting me for days now. You think my wife is beautiful? Beautiful. She thinks you are beautiful too. She would love to meet you. Come with me to meet her and we can play together. No, we have to go home. I replied, you little party breaker. Maybe your friend doesn't want to go home. Come on, I want to play with you. He said and turned to my cousin. No, I really want to go home. My cousin replied, this is where the details of the memory stop. What I remember next is him giving up just not being there anymore and us leaving, giggling and laughing as we walked away and mocking his voice and his tone on our way back home. But I found it weird that only after so many years have I remembered remembered this situation and I brushed it off as a potential dream or false memory. But since his words kept echoing in my head, I called my cousin and described my memory word for word as I've described it here and she said that it did happen.
happen. Just slightly different from how I've remembered it. How my cousin remembers it, it happened. All the details are correct. But once she told him she really wants to go home. He was way too close and we were scared to start running or turn our backs. Since we thought that he could catch us, so we stayed there for a while and kept pretending like he was not there. We played with our cat, the tiny fish in a bucket filled with water, and talked about our fathers who work in the police and how they're so strong that they could kill a man with one punch. The man didn't believe our exaggerated story and he kept walking in circles around us, not too close, but he did keep an eye on us the entire time. And we waited, and waited, and waited, and at one point he went into the bushes behind us to take a piss. This is when we got up and started running. We ran across the bridge and kept running until we got to the part of the neighborhood where there are lots of houses. When we were already close to my house, I stopped in the middle of the road and said that my legs won't move, so she helped me get down on the side of the road and we sat there until I felt better. Today I know that what I experienced was a state of shock. Once I felt better, we went back home, threw away the fish, and decided to never go fishing again. For some background first, I'm a 29 year old woman. I live in an apartment in a sketchier side of my town, so I'm not unaccustomed to strange people pulling up and strange things happening. I've been through a home break in, so I'm very hyper vigilant when it comes to keeping myself and my home safe. I also smoke cigarettes, nasty habit I know, but heavy cats and not wanting my house to reek like smoke, I'll walk out to my balcony to smoke. That's exactly what I was doing when this happened. I was sitting on my balcony, smoking and just enjoying my night, when I notice a car I've never seen before pull into the back parking lot of my apartment right by my balcony. I initially felt a bit off, but I didn't want to come off as being the paranoid neighbor, so I keep sitting and smoking my cigarette. Then I hear footsteps making a beeline through my backyard, and there's a large and burly man that I've never seen before walking briskly through my backyard. Again, I still don't try to make much of it because they might be there for my neighbor. My anxiety is definitely on alert, but not in panic mode, until I realize he's going straight from my portion of the backyard. He then does something that is still freaking me out as I type this. He stops right in my backyard and looks up at me on my balcony, not saying a word. Now I'm in absolute panic mode. I audibly say, oh no, spring up, slam and lock my balcony door, run to my upstairs bathroom, and dial 911. I listen to every sound from downstairs while I stood panicking in my bathroom and truthfully it sounded like someone was messing with my back door. I don't know for sure because I was in hypervigilance. I do know he was in my backyard for a few minutes because I was in my bathroom for several minutes until I decided to peek out my balcony window. I saw him walk walking to his car and getting in. That also tells me that I don't think he was here to rob me, but something more sinister. Luckily, he was lazy because again, I live on the cheaper side of town, so you can imagine the quality of my doors and locks. I'm really hoping it was just some guy who was drunk, high, and had the wrong house, but my gut is telling me otherwise. Regardless, I hope we never meet again. I'm a woman in my 30s who lives alone in a small house at the head of a quiet cul-de-sac in the United Kingdom. The street is a maze of roads away from the main road, which means that other than delivery guys and the occasional salesperson, you very rarely see anyone that you don't recognize. I don't exactly know all my neighbors, but I know what they look like, and I know where they live. I can recognize their cars and stuff. This weirdness happened over the space of a few months several years back. I work from home so I'm usually in, and sometimes I don't have a lot to do. The first day was one of those lazy days. It was about 4 in the evening and I'm sitting on the sofa watching some daft stuff about alien cover-ups. Someone knocked on the door. I have a surveillance camera hidden in the wooden canopy above the front door so I checked to see who it was because I wasn't expecting any deliveries and I couldn't be bothered to deal with a salesperson. It was a woman who looked late to early 50s, very smartly dressed, like really expensive clothes and jewelry. Stuff I could never afford. Most people around here generally couldn't afford it either. We're not in an affluent area and this lady stuck out like a sore thumb. She looked flustered and agitated, glancing towards the back garden before trying to look through the tiny, frosted glass window on the front door. I noticed she was carrying a dog's lead, but I didn't see a dog. As it happens, at the far side of my back garden there are two hedges. There's the hedge that I own within my property boundaries, and there's a second hedge outside my boundary that's council owned along a small grassland where people walk dogs. I know for a fact there is a hole in the council owned hedge which I've reported it to the council at least a dozen times over the past decade, and they've done the square root of sod all about it because of my hedge. I can't reach it to do anything about it myself. Consequently, when I saw the dog's lead, I thought, okay, I bet her dog has gone through the hole. If it's a big dog, it's not getting into my garden, but if it's a small dog, it might be able to work its way through, and I've always got some cooked meat, so I figured I might be able to lure it out. I am a dog lover, so of course, I want to help this woman if I can. When I was a kid, my own dog went missing for a few weeks, and I thought I was never going to get him back. I was heartbroken for those weeks, but fortunately, we did get him back, and ever since I've been 
extremely sensitive to pets in need. I open the door and this woman gives me the weirdest look, like she was expecting someone completely different to answer the door and that I shouldn't be there. To be fair to her, my mom used to live here too so I didn't think much of that weird look to begin with. Maybe she was expecting my mom. I say hello and she just stares at me for the longest 30 seconds before she tries to look past me and asks to see Margaret. I don't know what it is about other people's mistakes, but whenever someone has the wrong number, I always end up apologizing as if it's my fault. So that's what I did, apologized and told her there was no Margaret at this address. Again, she gives me that look, only this time there's anger behind it. Yes, there is. She insists. It occurs to me at this point that I have a relative called Margaret, but she lives about 60 miles away and I haven't seen her in years. Nonetheless, just in case she's got her addresses muddled, I ask are you looking for Margaret? But she just hisses at me, you know exactly who I'm looking for. What have you done with her? I'm absolutely lost at this point. I've lived here 20 years and I know the name of the previous owner, so I know she's not asking for them. I also know the names of the neighbors and the names of the people who have lived on the street in the time I've been here and since moved. None of them are called Margaret, so all I can do is tell her she's got the wrong address. No, this is. You're lying. That was a tad alarming and she's at the right address. She's not knocked on the wrong door. However, she clearly thinks I've done something to somebody who to the best of my knowledge has never lived here. I don't know how long the previous owner had this house, but we must be talking about at least 30 years since anyone called Margaret might have lived here. It's at this point that I notice that she's subtly wrapped that dog lead around her now clenched fist like she's planning to use it as a weapon. In my youth, I did plenty of self-defense training so I'm not exactly scared of her as such, but I'm obviously getting a bit concerned about the situation that's brewing. I don't particularly wish to get involved in a brawl on my doorstep with a complete stranger. I'm torn between shutting the door in her face or trying to de-escalate the situation. In the end, I close the door a little so she's got less to aim at and tell her, look, I don't know who you're looking for but if you think something's happened to your friend, maybe we should just call the police and let them sort it out. Sure enough, the woman slams her fist with the lead wrapped around it into my door. I later discovered she'd struck the door hard enough to crack the frosted glass window in the middle of it. She's bleeding from doing it. It must have hurt, but she doesn't flinch or show any sign of pain. Any confidence I had in my self-defense classes started to waver here because I'm not used to people who don't feel pain. All I can think now is that she's on something and having a really bad trip, so at this point I put on my scariest voice and tell her to get back. I let her know I'm calling the police and if she's still here when they get here, she can deal with them because I'm not dealing with her anymore. She tries to stop me from closing the door but I shove her back and manage to get it closed and locked. I make a point to stand next to the door while I'm calling 999 so she could hear me. While I'm waiting for the police to turn up, I watch her on the surveillance feed. She moves out of shop multiple times, presumably to check the back of the house and I hear her calling out for Margaret. A few minutes before the police finally turn up, I see her kick over my wheelie bins in a rage but then the most chilling thing happens. She walks back to the front door and literally stares directly into my camera. That camera is pretty well hidden. I'm not saying that nobody could spot it, but most people would only know it was there if they'd been looking for it. Most people aren't looking for cameras, right? She knew it was there. She must have eyeballed it previously. When, I don't know, I later reviewed all of the footage I had from that day and she never made eye contact with it once. She never even looked in that direction. I only had about a week's worth of footage before the oldest footage is over in and I checked everything I had and she was only on camera that day. All I can think is she'd been here more than a week prior. While she's staring right into it, she flips me the finger and then makes a throat cutting gesture before walking off. I head to the window to watch her leave and she's walking like she doesn't have a care in the world. She doesn't look back, just wanders away. Police finally show up, take a statement, I give them a copy of the surveillance footage and that's that. I called a couple of times to follow up, but nothing. Nobody ever called me about it. I won't lie, that had me up for a few weeks. I moved the knife block closer to the door. I started staying up really late and not getting much sleep which really didn't help. On some nights I was so tired that I started experiencing auditory hallucinations. I'd hear people who weren't there talking and because this woman was the cause of all my stress, I heard her voice and the name Margaret most of all. Every time I heard the gate open it put me on edge. I review the surveillance footage every day. Eventually, as the weeks passed and I hadn't heard anything else I started to regain some of my comfort and just put it down to a weird experience. It didn't last. About four, maybe five weeks after the first encounter, she came back. It was just after midnight. I was in the living room mucking about on my phone with the TV on low volume for some background noise. I heard a car door slam and people 
peeked out the front window. A dark colored car was parked at the end of my driveway. I couldn't see what make or model it was, but it looked like some sort of estate car. I didn't see anyone moving about, but a minute or two later, the front gate swung open with its metallic groaning, and there was a knock on the door. Even when I'm not involved in a blood feud over imaginary Margaret's, I'm not going to answer the door at that time. I checked the surveillance camera. Its night vision mode is pretty bad, but I'm positive it's that woman again. I can even see what I think is the dog lead. And of course, she knows I'm watching her because she looks at the camera again and I tell you, when someone is already giving you the chills, the way night vision makes people's eyes look like soulless black voids doesn't do much to make you feel better. Suddenly, she yells out shut that racket off and come out here. Now, I had the TV on, but as I mentioned, it was on a very low volume. There's no way she could hear it from outside the front door. I couldn't even hear it if I walked into the hallway. I'm convinced at this point she's mentally unwell, so I call the police again. I want them to stay on the line, but they just tell me that someone will be over soon and to call them back immediately if things escalate. So I'm waiting, watching, and just hoping she doesn't start trying to smash a window or something. She kicks over my wheelie bins again and yells something else out, which I couldn't quite make out, but whatever it was, it was enough for one of the neighbors to come and investigate themselves. I watch the neighbor talkie with her for a minute. She's remonstrating about something, wagging her finger towards my front door, but my neighbor is eventually able to get her to leave. He even sticks around for a bit to make sure she's gone. Sadly, that also means she'd gone before the police turned up again and made me feel like I was a bother to them. Another statement, handing over more security footage, or nothing. I caught up with the neighbor the next day, and he apologized because it didn't occur to him to make a note of the registration plate but he told me that she'd said much the same thing as she'd said to me previously, that she wanted to know where Margaret was and what I'd done with her. I'm grasping for answers at this point. Even if she's mentally unwell, the fact she's sticking to this Margaret story and has the right address makes me think there's something more to this than somebody having a breakdown. Then it clicks, is Margaret her dog? Does she think that I've stolen her dog? Did she have a dog go through the hole in the back? Does she think I've hurt her dog? Is that what this is about? It'd be another few weeks before she came back. This time at 3 in the night, I've awoken by knocking on the door. A few minutes later, I hear tapping on the bedroom window. I know it's her. I can hear her saying things, but I can't really make them out because they're too muffled through the windows. It's like she didn't want to get the neighbor out again, so she's trying to keep it quiet. I jump out of bed and put some clothes on as quickly as I can. I try and follow her as best I can as she moves around the outside of the house from room to room knocking, tapping, and muttering. I think I hear a few coherent words like noise, racket, and I'm pretty sure she called me a slur, but maybe I was imagining that. I can't check the surveillance footage this time because she spray painted the lens, not that it'd matter much this time. She's not lingering by the front door. I think about calling the police again, but it's proven a waste of time so far and I get the feeling if I call them out a third time and she's gone, then they're just going to start accusing me of wasting their time even if I do have the evidence. They've not exactly been that helpful so far. In the end, I wait by the front door and listen for her. Eventually, she knocks again and I call out, is Margaret your dog? Dead silence. Nothing. I can't see anything through the frosted glass because it's too dark. I have no idea where she is and I don't want to turn the outside lights on. I don't even know why. She knows I'm in the house because I've called out to her, but I still don't want to draw any more attention to myself. I end up standing there for who knows how long. At least an hour, probably more because the sun starts coming up. My heart is going a mile a minute pretty much the whole time. Once it's bright enough, I start checking through windows to see if I can see her. Nope. Nothing. I tentatively open the front door and look outside. Still can't see her. I grab something to arm myself with just in case. Can't remember what now and check all around my house in the back garden. She's not there. As I'm heading back to the front door, I spot the oddest thing. The gate's closed. That gate is physically attached to the side of my house and when it opens and closes, it makes a fair bit of noise. You definitely hear it if someone opened or closed it when you were standing next to the front door but it's closed. So, what does that mean? Did she jump it somehow? It's possible, I guess, but I wouldn't want to try it. Anyway, I open the gate and head out to the end of the driveway. I look around and there's no sign of anyone. I turn back to the house and see she spray painted liar on the front of my house and left the dog lead on the floor beneath it. That was, thankfully, the last time I ever heard from or saw this woman but I think she still comes by sometimes. Ever since all this happened, I get these creeped out feelings occasionally at night and check out the window. I don't know whether I'm imagining it or what, but now and again, I swear I see a dark colored estate car out on the street. Not parked at the end of my driveway these days, but I just can't shake the feeling she's in there, watching my house. Perhaps she was looking for her dog and she keeps thinking that she'll see me with it. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
I was backpacking in the Balkans and as I wanted my trip to last long but I didn't have that much money I had to sacrifice comfort a lot of times. This was the reason I booked the midnight train in Greece from Thessaloniki to Athens. During my stay in Thessaloniki I mainly stayed in the center and the Bay Area which looked nice just like any other big European city. However the train station was in a different area. I had to check out from my hotel in the morning so I spent the whole day out in the city in the afternoon in the sketchy area where the train station was because I wanted to stay close to it so I could get there in a reasonable time in the afternoon and spend the night there so I couldn't have to walk around in that area at 11 at night. That part of the city looked a lot less appealing. It was full of garbage, graffiti, homeless people, and sketchy, creepy people. The train station wasn't that much better. It had a semi-closed and coffee shop in it. I stayed there as long as I could, but it closed at 8 in the night. While I was sitting in that coffee shop and looking down at my phone, I snapped my head around when I heard a loud noise. The guy dressed as a soldier rushed in the coffee shop and he was looking around like if he was searching for someone or something. Thing. The cough shop was really small. It was just maybe like five or six tables and there was only one guest besides me. He saw me for sure but didn't do anything. He went to the counter to order. He was speaking very loudly even though it was relatively quiet there. I found it weird but didn't think much of it especially because he was speaking in Greek which I didn't understand. The coffee shop closed at 8 in the night so I packed up my bags and went outside. There were a lot of weird people loitering there. They didn't look like they were waiting for a train. I say this because I wanted to take a look on the tracks in advance so I'll know how to get to my train in time and when I was doing that, my train came to the station and almost all of the people from the waiting room ran to the train, but they weren't getting on it nor greeting someone who got off. They were just walking up and down the track until the train set off. Also, they were all middle-aged men. There weren't any women or children among them. I went back to the waiting area and sat down on a bench. I was a bit nervous so I plugged in my earphones and I was browsing something on my phone. However, I wanted to still be able to hear the things around me so I wasn't listening to music or anything, which I'm glad I did it because not too long after I sat down I heard someone say next to me nice tattoo. Is it from up? I knew they said it to me because I have a tattoo from the movie up on my forearm so I pulled out my earphones and looked next to me. There was the soldier from before sitting next to me. It was weird he started talking to me in English automatically but I have a little Hungarian flag on my backpack which indicates that I'm not Greek. I replied to his question and we started talking. The conversation at first was pretty normal. We were talking about tattoos and movies then traveling. When I mentioned I wanted to visit Macedonia Macedonia in this trip, he got a little political and heated. He started talking about Greek politics and the relationship between Greece and Macedonia very angrily. Through the whole sea conversation, he was acting a bit weird. I can't explain why, but it looked like something was off about him. At first, I was relieved that I was next to a soldier in this sketchy place, but after a while, I started to question if he really was a soldier or just pretending to be one because he was creepy and he was constantly checking his bag but just from the outside he looked like there was a long object in it which could have been a gun but if he really is a military person then it could be normal i don't know the greek laws if they are allowed to carry their weapons off duty or not he asked me if i was traveling alone and for how long i planned to stay in athens i answered with honesty i told him i was alone and that i didn't plan to stay for long in athens as i was planning on catching a ferry from there he then asked me if i'd like to stay in his place for free but i declined he asked this a few more times but I said no every time and then the speakers turned on and they announced that the train to Athens will be here soon. So we both got up and started to head to the tracks. He said he needs to get his luggage from the luggage storage so we stopped there. It was right next to the steps to the train tracks. He took out a big, old, heavy suitcase from there. It looked like even he was suffering from its weight. Then he really loudly slammed the storage metal door. I don't know why he did this. It was unnecessarily loud. Everyone was looking at us. It really was loud. The whole station could have heard it. We then started walking up the stairs but he stopped and said he needed to use the restroom and asked me to wait for him there with his suitcase. He didn't even wait for my answer. He ran back to the waiting room. It was really odd. Why would he trust a stranger with his luggage and leave it with me? I stood there for a few minutes and was waiting for him but I started contemplating if I should just leave his suitcase there because I was afraid that I'd miss my train. I even thought about that. What if there was a bomb inside the suitcase? Otherwise why else would he leave his belongings with a random girl he just met? The fact that he was acting really strange didn't help with it either. I waited a few minutes, then he showed up. He asked me once again if I wanted to stay in his place in Athens, but I said no again. We got up to the tracks and our train just came in. He insisted on sitting next to each other, but I didn't want to sit next to him, so I said I have a seat reservation and that I'm really tired. I probably sleep through the night anyways. He said he'll ask the person working on the train if I can switch seats with a reservation. He left his luggage next to me once again and went to the nearest employee. This time I didn't stay there. I got up the train and looked for my seat. Fortunately, there were a lot of people so I blended in easily. I took my seat and a few minutes later a normal looking man sat next to me. Thankfully the soldier didn't come
looking for me and I've never seen him again, not even in the Athens train station. I know this story is not too extreme, but it still bugs me to this day to what were his intentions. Was he really a soldier and a nice guy, just a bit weird, with some kind of mental illness? Or a crazy psychopath pretending to be a soldier to look more trustworthy? This story takes place a few years ago while I was still with my ex-girlfriend. I, a 22 year old male, was 17 to 18 at this moment. I was living with my parents and we lived in a little town of 300 people. It's literally the campy with three farms in this town, which includes lots of fields. We had the habits of walking in those fields thanks to a little path which is really old. There's a place for only one car, a truck, and a tractor. It was the afternoon, around 5 to 6. We decided to eat some stuff in a field near the road, so we can see the road and people on the road can see us. The field, which belongs to my neighbor, who are okay with the fact that we're here, is separated from the road thanks to barbed wire. We smoke weed, we drink, we eat, and we listen to music, everything is alright. However, at one point, a car parked on the middle of the road and a guy went out of his car and is doing stuff in the bushes. At this point, I'm thinking okay, the dude is just picking stuff up like nuts or whatever because it's the end of the summer, but I keep an eye on him. I talk with my girlfriend just like I did all afternoon until then, and I look back at him. The guy is standing still, behind his car and he's looking right at us. Motionless, I don't say anything and look back at my girlfriend. I give another look about a minute later. The guy moved. He's now at the other side of his car and same thing. No bullshit. Just looking at us. The same process is about to be repeated two or more times with him at different locations around his car. I have chills and thinking this situation isn't normal at all. The guy suddenly went back into his car and moved away. At this moment, I told to my girlfriend to pack up your things or movie. She thinks I'm overreacting, thinking I'm paranoid because of the weed we smoked, but she listens to me. We're back on the road, going the other way the guy went. The road is a circle, every way leads back to my house. And guess who has turned around and is coming right behind us with his car. This guy, still looking at us while driving, he keeps his road and turns around to keep staring at us. This process repeats two times. At this moment, my girlfriend told me I was right, so we took his plate and tried to call my parents. The one is answering. The last time the guy passed at our level, I can clearly see something on his passenger seat week but I don't know what. But my neighbor came right behind him with his truck. I stopped my neighbor and told her what we just witnessed. She gets us in the truck. We went back to my parents' home. My dad is a cop, so I told him the plate. He looked at it. The car belonged to a grandma and was stolen. A few weeks later, everything is normal. I go take my bus in the next town, which is about a seven minute ride on my bike. It was still dark because it's pretty early in the morning. When I left my parents' home on my bike, I noticed light behind me. It was his car. I don't know how he knew I was there. Maybe Maybe it's pure bad luck for me, but I'm 100% sure it was his car. He followed me until I took a path which a car can't use, only bikes and pedestrians can take. I turned off my light and rode until I went to my bus in the complete dark in order to not be seen by this guy. I kept using this way for the next two years and I've never met him again. I used to work at a pizza shop down the street from 2 in the evening until they closed. I usually didn't get off until 11 at night or so. I had a car, but was close enough to walk so I did that most days to save gas. This particular night, I was doing my usual thing, jamming to one of my playlists, tired, but happy to have a good job and just generally happy with the way my life was going. Up ahead, about a block from my place, I see an attractive guy in dark clothing walking, but not with a purpose really. He was taller than me, maybe 6 feet tall or so, and had shaggy brown hair. The closer I got to him, the more I could tell he was really good looking. Like, even in the dark of night I was starting to get excited. His features kind of escaped me now, but I do remember his hair and his thick eyebrows. I took an earbud out and, because I'm from a dangerous city and never really cared about stranger danger, I decided to talk to him, maybe even flirt a little bit. How is your late night going? It's good, just looking to get drunk. Oh, that I can help with. I've got a mini bar at my place. I lived just down the street. That was, not verbatim, how the conversation went. During the walk back to my place, I got no red flags from this guy. He seemed totally normal and I was honestly thinking, wow, just through sheer luck I meet this super hunky guy and he seems cool and fun. I was beside myself really. So, we get to my apartment on the second floor. I jump into host mode and offer him to have a seat and make himself comfortable. The apartment is about 640 square feet so it's very small. Except for the bathroom, you can see the rest of the apartment from 
from any area. I head into the kitchen and while I'm pouring drinks, I glance back over at him. It was then that I noticed the first red flag. As I was asking him questions, he is more delayed with his answers, especially more so than he just was on our walk there. It was just odd to me. I go back over to the couch, pass him his drink and sit down next to him. So, what do you do for work? I asked. Oh, I'm not here for prostitution. He put his drink down on the table. What do you mean? I'm not after that either. He stands up. What you got? He asks me. His nice guy vernacular and friendly face are now gone. I'm having a hard time processing what he means by this. I said what you got. The second I stand up, he pushes me back. I fly across the room, hitting the floor, but not hard enough to pass out or anything. I get right back up, but he's already grabbed my laptop and my work bag. As I start towards him, he cuts around me and makes his way towards the front door. I'm right behind him when he makes it outside. I manage to grab hold of him and we tussle again in front of the door. Now I shout out, calling on help from the neighbors. It's late at night so no one comes. I'm shouting please help. I'm being robbed. The thing is, he has my laptop. It's not just any laptop. I hate to admit it, but my entire life was on that laptop at the time. Important photos that I did not have backed up, thousands of dollars of music programs, video game programming stuff for a development team I helped, really expensive software, stuff like that. It was, in my mind, irreplaceable. I give chase down the stairs, across the dog walk park and as I start to gain on him, we tussle again and the only thing I could focus on is my laptop. I knew that I had to, at any cost, get my laptop back. That was absolutely all I cared about. Somehow I get a grip on my laptop. I tug at it again and I guess he decides I'm not worth all of this struggle. He gets up and starts to take off again. I now realize he still has my work bag. It has my cell phone and wallet in it. I take off towards him again and this time, he shouts back at me, follow me and I'll stab you again. This makes me stop in my tracks and he gets away. Underneath a street lamp, along the sidewalk, I immediately inspect myself. Was I stabbed? No way. There's no way. Then I see blood running down my leg. I see blood on my arm. Two places where he cut me good. I'm scared, but the blood makes it look worse than it is. I decide that's enough. I got my laptop and that's all I really wanted anyway. I hobble back home and get inside and lock my door. I called the cops using my neighbor friend's phone the next day and filed a police report explaining the situation, showing the stab wounds and declining medical services. So, all that guy got was a crappy cell phone and a wallet with, like, $40 in it. The cop called my friend back several days later and said that they were not able to find the guy and that he would keep me posted. This was years ago so I don't know where the rock is now, but I have every electronic thing of importance backed up on multiple drives to this day. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was younger and just got into online college, I got my first apartment. I had three jobs and one was third shift, but I was more than ready for independence. While I had a great time there, I did have one problem, my new downstairs neighbor. So the other tenants are a bit older than I am, with one of them being an old man who lived there for 20 years. The other was an older woman with a small kid probably been here for three or four years and an empty apartment downstairs. I keep to myself so I never really spoke to any of them before until I noticed that there was a new move in. A man that seemed close to my age, maybe a little older older, black, greasy hair, and a little overweight, but in my experience living here, people seem nice, and I was happy to possibly have someone to say hello to. That possibility turned sour really quick when a casual hello turned into that trash stinks remarks from him when I was taking out the trash and snide remarks under his breath when I've done nothing, even remarking on my sister's lack of a bra when she came to visit me. Naturally, I was grossed out and annoyed that he had to comment on anyone, especially my sister, and told the landlord, nothing came of it, of course. One day, I was asleep, and someone came banging on my door. I had no idea who it was and my anxiety was beyond strong. I'm alone and never expect a knock that wasn't planned. It was the neighbor saying that I was being too loud and I need to stop harassing him. I explained through a closed door that I was asleep and that I was not making noise. He left and stopped down the stairs while muttering and calling me a rat for some reason. My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest. I went back to bed, only to hear him coming back up the stairs and bang on my door. When I addressed him again, he said that I was harassing him and that he's calling the cops because I'm still making noise. I told him to ask the other neighbor because there's no way that I could possibly be making noise when he is on the other side of the building. He thanks me politely before stomping off and continuing to call me a rat yet again. I tell the landlord right away that one of his tenants is acting hostile and I don't feel comfortable nor safe and he tells me he will look into it. I hear nothing for a week. It turned out it was the old neighbor hitting the floor with a stick like one of those classic cartoons because the rude neighbor was playing music too loud. I swear he should have known that as I'm on the other side. It was like he wanted an excuse to come speak to 
Maine. The following months it got worse. One day I walked out in a snowsuit so that I can play in the snow. He had to remark on my clothing being unnecessary, even when there's three feet of snow out. I forgot what I said in response, something like it's not his business, but he basically just said screw you. I just walked off to go play in the snow. It gave me little enjoyment because of the earlier interaction, so I went back home to get ready for work. The snowstorm got worse and I had just came back from my night shift. I see him alone in the parking lot with the car on and the windows up. I was on high alert as I carefully walked around and up the alley to my apartment. The second I close the door to go upstairs, I hear loud, wall shaking music. It's him. He's blasting his car music at max volume. In a snowstorm, at 3 in the morning, I was surprised and confused because what was his reasoning? He did it until 8 in the morning and I found out later it was despite the old neighbor for telling him his music is too loud. Soon it all started getting serious, cursing in the hallway and playing music louder. With the police knocking at our doors asking us about a noise disturbance and now a mutual hatred amongst the neighbors at the jerk who kept us all up. But that's not the worst part. I just got back from my night shift and it's 3 in the morning yet again. I'm dragging my tired feet over to the mailboxes that are right inside the townhouse door. As I'm looking through the advertisements and letters his door opens at the top of the stairs. My stomach tightens hoping I don't have to interact with him but drops when he starts speaking unintelligibly. At the top of the stairs he's gurgling and mumbling something. What? I said but he repeats the same weird sounds again only more aggressive. I felt something was more than off and got right around and out the door heading back to my car. Car. I thought I'd rather sleep in my car than possibly be attacked in the hallway, and as I'm having the thought, I hear the window above slam open. I freeze and then spin back around the edge of the corner. It's him, and he's looking for me out the window. I stand there for a moment listening to him, and he's speaking gibberish and yelling. I thought to myself that it was my chance to sneak upstairs, past his door, and into my apartment. I sped up the stairs and passed his door to the second flight of stairs. Right as I reach the top of second flight of stairs, his door swings open with a big slam that makes me jump and I hear him muttering and gibberishly speaking loudly while walking up the stairs. My heart is beating out of my ribcage as I am simultaneously walking and fishing my keys out of my bag. I kept fumbling the keys looking for the correct one in the dark hallway as I hear him walking up the last couple steps. I mentally told myself not to panic as I spot the correct key and slide it into the keyhole on the first go. I swing the door open and practically launch myself inside before slamming it shut behind me. I pause and hold my breath as I hear him just 5 feet from my door, muttering gibberish and calling me rat before walking back downstairs and out the building. I watched him through a crack in my window blind pacing back and forth, muttering, cursing, and at one point screaming before walking off into the night. With a little bit of relief, I head to bed hoping he doesn't come back. The next day, I get a text from the landlord. He says that guy was arrested and won't be coming back. Seems he was off his medication again and attaches a link in the text. Of course, I raised an eyebrow to that comma thinking, now you tell me. The following link showed a mugshot and a description of his nightly activity to include stealing from a turkey hill. Threatening cops that he'll shoot them, punching one of them and previous to all this it said, earlier in the night when he dropped his pants and rubbed himself against a window then ran around the town square while yelling. Never did see him again, just his family coming in and moving his stuff. So about 12 years ago, I was 9 years old, and I was home alone with my 12-year-old brother. We were supposed to go to my aunt's house to have lunch and wait for my mother there. We got up at 10.30 in the morning, I took a shower, then my brother. After that, we were both in the bathroom brushing our teeth and finishing up, when we heard someone knocking on our door. Since every time someone knocked at our door they turned out to be salesmen, we kind of waited for them to go away. After a couple of minutes, I went to see if they were still outside through the window, and no one was there. We continued getting ready when we saw a shadow go by through the bathroom window, which was kind of like a small square made with that kind of glass that makes everything behind it really blurry. We waited and saw in case it was just a bird flying by when a hand hit it, clear as day. We got scared. We didn't know what to do. My brother had his cell phone, so he immediately called the police. While it was ringing, we heard a loud bang at the door. Someone was brute forcing it. I don't know if they were kicking it or ramming it, but it was one of the most frightening things I've ever heard. My brother told me to lock the bathroom door, so I did. It took five bangs, so the perpetrator could finally bash open the door. Then the police answered. I remember the exact thing my brother said. He was whispering. His voice could barely be heard. Hello, there is someone in our house. I think they are stealing. Then a pause. We are at our address. Another pause. I'm with my little brother locked in our bathroom. Please hurry. While all that, I was sitting against the wall, hugging my knees. It was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences ever. I could hear the man going through all of our stuff, emptying stands, going up and down the stairs, opening cabinets. He even broke a few cups and plates. 
minutes. Then I heard the sound my cell phone does when it turns off and I remembered leaving it on the kitchen table. I felt so stupid for leaving it there. Things continued for a couple of minutes when we heard him trying to open the door to the bathroom. My brother got a hold of a big metal rod we had lying around there. He started kicking the door. Who was there? The man screamed. We said nothing. Another kick. Then another. I felt I was about to have an anxiety attack. My chest started to ache. I had chills and was really hot. I tried to remain calm but it was just too much. After that he stopped. We heard the door opening and then silence. We waited for almost 10 minutes before going out of the bathroom. The living room was a total mess. Lots of papers and books on the floor. Thought cabinets were open, cups and plates on the floor. In our mother's bedroom, the nightstand and the closet were open and everything inside them was all over the place. Upstairs, in our room, it was the same thing. In about 5 minutes, the man was able to go through everything we had and left a total mess. After that, my brother called my mom and she ordered us to go to my aunt's as soon as possible, so we did. When we got there, I was a little more relaxed. My aunt was waiting waiting us with ice cream, probably because my mom told her everything and she wanted to calm us down a bit. We went back home at about 7 and my mom told her boss she had a home emergency so she left early. She cleaned up the house and left everything the way it was before so we could be relaxed. I really appreciate her effort and my aunts to calm us down and do everything so we didn't have to think about it. According to my mom, the police got home after she arrived. She explained everything but because of lack of evidence, nothing could be done. The man was never caught and honestly I don't think they even tried to search for him. Him. The next days my mom was home with us. Now I tell the story as a funny anecdote. Luckily no one was hurt and he only took useless stuff. But at the time, I was really scared. To a 9 year old, an experience like that can have serious repercussions. I'm lucky it never came to that and I got over that after a couple of weeks. There's an abandoned house between my town and the town next to me on one of the country roads that connects us. I've been to it before and even went inside twice with my sister and my best friend. It's an old house that dates back centuries according to the bank records that I was able to find and you can just tell by the design. The house is two stories with a basement, has lots of furniture and objects strewn about inside, and is far from empty. You can tell that it hasn't been lived in for decades and whoever had previously owned it, it almost seemed like they just disappeared one day, leaving everything behind. The way I was able to get in before was through the cellar door in the basement, which is broken open and propped up with some big sticks. My first visits were around two years ago, and I hadn't gone back at all into that time. Another friend had expressed interest in seeing the house when I told him about my experience, and so, last summer, I told him that I'd take him to it. I never thought it was a dangerous trip, and told him that it's just an interesting place to explore. They parked across the street from the house, and the parking lot of one of the industrial buildings nearby. The road was a rural road, but it was far from unused, and we didn't want to be questioned by anyone. My friend, being braver than me despite my previous visits, led the way across the street and to the front of the house. He asked me a couple questions about it and what stuff I found in there. I told him that the kitchen still had expired food in it and that the upstairs had a board game set that I ended up bringing home with me. As we walked from the front of the house to the side leading to the back with the cellar, I made note that there was a lot more brush than when I had went last time. I had gone in the spray when I had gone with my sister and best friend, and I never experienced the thick brush that I was now carefully moving moving through. I made a comment to my friend that there was a lot more foliage than when I had gone before as we both tried to figure out a path to the cellar. Eventually, we pushed through some branches and found the cellar, broken and propped open, just as I had last seen it. We talked for a second about being nervous and I really took in the view of the cellar that led into this dark, abandoned house. I remember being really intimidated while looking at the opening and I made note that some of the sticks propping open the cellar didn't look familiar to me. I didn't state it out loud however as I thought it was just my anxiety. My friend and I discussed who should go first, and he said since I'm the expert, I should head in first. I was hesitant, but eventually, after a good five minutes of breathing and calming myself down, I started down the few steps of the cellar. It was an awkward entrance, as half the cellar was collapsed and left little room for maneuvering. You had to duck under the part of the cellar door that was still put together, then inch your feet down the steps, and finally turn your body sideways to fit through the small gap into the basement. I took a long time after ducking under the door, since my nerves came back for a second. I made it in fine, and my friend followed very quickly, which I appreciated. We both stood in the corner of the basement now, taking it in. I turned my phone's flashlight on, and he did too. There was a spider web in the path to the stairs up to the first floor. I looked around and found some sort of tool to knock the spider web down, and I took the tool and swiped it through the web. After that, I tossed the tool onto the concrete floor. My friend and I talked quietly, I don't remember what about, but afterwards, we fell silent for a second. Above us, I clearly heard footsteps on the boards above our heads. It almost seemed like 
like they were heading to the stairs that led down to the basement. I remember this part the best as I looked at my friend and he didn't seem to react to the footsteps I was hearing. I looked at him, suddenly very worried, and before I could even say anything, he said we need to go. He turned around and practically jumped up the stairs. I remember thinking he got out insanely fast. I could see him turn and reach his hand back to help me up. I was a bit slower, but I also quickly stepped up the stairs and he pulled me through the opening. I landed on my hands and knees after I escaped the cellar and I immediately stood up facing the weeds. I turned around to my friend, who was crouched, staring down the cellar. I said to him that we should get out of here and he turned away and told me to go first through the weeds. I pretty much just ran through the brush, definitely getting cut up by something, but we made it through them and back in front of the house very quickly. My friend kept urging me to go in front of him and he watched behind us before switching to flashing his light in the window on the first floor of the front of the house. I asked him what he was doing and if he was okay. He didn't really answer me at first, so I asked him if he heard the footsteps before we bolted out of the basement. He turned to me and said that he heard them, and that's why he was watching the cellar to see if anyone was following us out. He continued, saying that after he pulled me up, he turned to guide me away before he let go of my hand, and when he turned back, he saw the bare feet of someone standing at the bottom of the cellar. Because of the cellar's dilapidated structure, he could only see their feet and a part of their legs. At that point, that's when he told me to go through the weeds first. He never saw them come up the cellar stairs or move away from them before he followed me. I didn't believe him at first and thought he was just trying to scare me, but I could tell by the serious tone of his voice and the silent look he gave me after telling me that he wasn't trying to make me laugh or lighten the mood. I still asked if he was lying and he aggressively said that he wasn't. He told me that I heard the footsteps already so I knew something had to be in that house. We stood for a second, not really saying anything, before we both then agreed to go back across the street towards our car. We stood by our cars for a while, watching the house to see if anything or anyone would come out but nothing appeared. After talking for a bit about how crazy that was, and him reassuring me that he was telling the truth, it started to rain and we decided to call it a night. I fully believe him, and he's always stood by what he saw. I haven't gone back to that house since, and I like to tell myself that whoever was in that house was just a homeless person finding shelter. I still get shivers to this day, however, thinking about how close that person was to me as I scrambled up the cellar. Now this is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. Now for context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us, so what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I am about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally we'd see a small bit of blood like liquid and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously but nothing too bad, until the last time I had gone exploring abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to a lack of patients and lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. For context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place with flashlights we had on our person. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old toys, with chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls, and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent, until all all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt under our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door leading to the psychiatric ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five, most of them were very bold. We all looked at each other when my friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, I was not too fond of the idea, but with my group of friends there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else which I couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorway, some with doors open. I felt slightly claustrophobic and it felt a little hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is 
is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone here. It seems all fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety. But looking back, I think he was completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psychiatric ward. When another friend swiftly told us to stop, we came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking toward the sounds. We considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building. But we couldn't do that to them. The closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right which had the smell of rotting meat. In front of us was a dead deer. Its insides were spilled all over the floor staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and vomited all over the floor. That's what we heard whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green shirt stained with what I assumed was blood and torn tan pants. He did not have any socks and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with a haunting grin that sent shivers down our spine. You guys here for the feast. He said each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, I could still see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature I could see. As we sat behind the metal door catching our breath for a second, all looking at each for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went back to do a routine search of the area and found the man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psychiatric ward before it closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off of the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of diseases and sickness from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were future rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but nothing has been confirmed. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was 10, my parents and I went to visit my grandmother for spring break. My cousin also came to visit and we decided we wanted to go to the gym for the day. My grandmother dropped us off and said she would come and pick us up in 4 hours. On that day the gym was empty, there were a couple of adults in the exercise room but that's it. We went to the basketball court and after 2 hours of playing tag and shooting baskets, we were bored. I've never been the biggest fan of swimming but this gym had a pretty cool pool so we changed into our bathing suits and headed in there. The pool was empty except for the lifeguard. We played a bunch of games and swam laps, but after about an hour, there wasn't much left to do and there was no one except us to hang out with to keep things interesting. So, we decided to play a game of seeing how long we could hold our breath underwater. We stood in the shallow end near the clock on the wall so we could time ourselves. Instead of fully submerging, we just stuck our heads face down in the water. We did this a couple of times and I was winning. On your last round, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I figured it was my cousin giving up and telling me that I won. But instead, it was the lifeguard who told me to knock it off or she was going to have to ask us to leave the pool. Since we were tired of being in the pool, we figured we would get out, get dressed, and go back to the basketball court until my grandmother picked us up. We only had an hour left anyway, so the water was freezing. As we got out, the lifeguard stopped us and asked if we wanted to go into the sauna to warm up and dry off. The sign said 18 years or older, so of course, we were super excited that she allowed us to do that. She walked us to the sauna and unlocked the door. The door was glass and the interior was made entirely out of wood. Inside, above the door, there was a clock, probably to help make sure you were not in there for an unsafe amount of time. The lifeguard stand was adjacent to the sauna, but if you looked out the door, you could clearly see it. She followed us in and went over to the thermometer encased in plastic and unlocked it so she could crank up the heat. I figured that she must have to turn it on each time, so I didn't think anything of it. Both my cousin and I were very short girls, and so we couldn't see the temperature that was printed on the thermometer knob, but I know she was turning up the heat. Then she left and shut the door behind her. I felt I saw her lock the door too, but I thought to myself, why would she lock the door when we might want to get out? I checked the clock and decided we should get out in 10 or 15 minutes. It was already plenty warm in the sauna, but now the room was blazing. It felt nice because I was so cold from the pool. After about 15 minutes, it was starting to get a little bit too hot, and my cousin agreed that we should leave so we could get dressed. I went to turn the knob on the door, but it wasn't budging. I thought maybe it was jammed, so I shook it, but it still wasn't opening, and then I let my cousin try. She couldn't get it open either. We figured the lifeguard would be back in a couple of minutes, so we sat 
sat back down and waited. The room was getting hotter now too and I really wanted to leave. I got up and started banging on the door and shaking, twisting the knob trying to get the lifeguard's attention. My cousin got up and joined me. We started screaming at the top of our lungs for her to let us out but she just stared straight ahead. I don't think there's any way that she couldn't have noticed or heard two little girls banging and kicking the door and screaming. Now we had been in there for about 25 minutes. It was so hot in the sauna that it hurt to breathe. It felt like my lungs were on fire. My eyes and skin were burning. We sat back down and put our towels over our heads because they were still a little damp and it made it easier to breathe. I was so worried about my cousin as she is a couple of years younger than me. I looked at the clock and saw that we had been there for 35 minutes. I got up and walked to the door again and saw the lifeguard still just staring straight ahead. Again, I tried to get her attention by screaming that we needed out and banging on the door as hard as I could but still nothing. I was starting to get pretty dizzy so I went to go sit back down but the wooden seats at the sauna burned my skin. My towel was completely dry so I put it underneath me to sit on. My hair was also dry but I wrapped it across my face to cover my nose and I squinted my eyes so that they didn't burn as bad but I could still watch if anyone walked past the door. It helped a little bit. My cousin was laying face down with the towel over her head not moving or saying anything so I nudged her to make sure that she was still okay. She was but I could tell that we really needed to get out of there soon because she seemed a bit disappointed oriented. It had been 45 minutes now and I was extremely nauseous. There was no way that the lifeguard would forget that we were in there and I thought she would have to come back soon but there was this little voice in my head telling me that maybe she purposely locked us in there. Finally, a man walked past the door towards the pool but for some reason I just couldn't get up. My whole body was on fire and I felt so dizzy. Luckily this man wasn't going to the pool. He wanted to be let into the sauna and came back with a lifeguard. I saw them walking this way and immediately jumped up to grab my cousin. I knew now that for sure she had locked us in there because she pulled out her keys to unlock the door and let the man in. I didn't want to take any chances of us being trapped in there any longer so as the man was trying to walk in, I was trying to shove our way out. As we were going out the lifeguard started trying to shut the door and push us back with it. The man was clearly confused about what was going on and said I think they want out. The lifeguard let out a sigh and opened the door fully and we ran away as fast as we could into the changing room. We only had about 10 minutes before a grandmother was supposed to pick us up. We were both so shaken by what just happened that we didn't say anything to each other as we got dressed or on the car ride home. When we got back to the house, my parents were making us dinner and I told them the story of what just happened. They thought that I must have been exaggerating and they didn't believe me. I truly think that that woman was going to let us cook alive in there. The only bit of doubt that I have is what would have happened if we actually died. She obviously would have gotten the blame. What was her end game? And I'm 21 now but I think about this interaction all the time and when I'm in small spaces or I get too warm, I still have panic attacks. No one believes this story and I get it, it's pretty absurd. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask for opinions, but do you think that this could have been some crazy misunderstanding or do you think that she really just left us in there to die? I apologize if there are some errors or things that may not make sense. This is the perspective my my story told from me and a part by a friend. This happened to be the weekend of Halloween and I personally don't like talking about it, but I have been told by my friend to share it to get it off of my chest. Me and a friend were invited to a house party just for college students in the richer area of the town, so the house was huge with an anchor of land and pool area. This party was themed to be a little naughty, so my friend dressed in a sexy nurse outfit and I dressed as a belly dancer. Majority of the party took place in the house as there was maybe like 70 people with the house being very spacious so not too difficult to get around. I'm not much of a drinker, but I did have some juice that was available. Some friends pulled me and my friend did over to take some pictures and I set my drink down. After what felt like an hour of just taking pictures, I found my cup and took another sip, not even worrying that I left my cup alone for a while. Then a man came up to me who looked to be in his late 20s, early 30s. He said my boyfriend's name and said he's been trying to call me. That's when I realized I didn't have my phone on me. I have loads of respect for my boyfriend. We always make sure to stay in contact with each other and since he had to work I promised I would contact him but I had just forgotten. The man said it's urgent and said I can use his phone to call at one of the rooms. So not thinking at all, I followed the man. If my boyfriend really wanted to call me, then I knew it would be something terrible. As we entered the room, I felt as if I just ran a mile and felt winded. The man closed the door behind me and sat me on the bed and gave me his phone. I started to feel more weak, like I just got a migraine and just couldn't call. Then I was helped to lay down and within seconds, I was out cold. I woke up later, not sure where I was or what even happened. I found my friend ripping a napkin on my tummy while yelling. It took me a bit to come back to reality and I realized I was in a bedroom with my friend cleaning some stuff off of me. That's when I had a panic attack and just realized that I quite possibly have been used. 
my friend calmed me down and told me that didn't happen. She explained that she couldn't find me anywhere and assumed I went to the bathroom. But after like some minutes, I still didn't show. So she went looking for me, eventually checking the bedrooms and found me laying in bed with the guy sucking something out of my belly button. Apparently he was playing shots with my unconscious body and sucking alcohol out of my belly button, licking salt from my chest and kissing my lips. She didn't know how long this went on for, but I immediately felt sick and even coughed up from just the thought. Thankfully, my boyfriend got off of work early after my friend told him what happened. He picked me up while my friend asked around about the guy, but of course, no one knew who or recognized him. I was taken to urgent care and looked at. Thankfully, nothing was wrong with me and the drug in my drink didn't cause any further harm than just knocking me out. I wish the story ends here, but I started to receive texts from a random guy. At first, he was just asking me random things and I just didn't reply. But then it showed me a picture of my torso and started saying creepy things to me and even giving me the impression he's stalking me. This is still going on today, just texting me randomly. I've had the idea to try to bait him one of these days to finally have backup to catch him, but I don't know how smart he can be and what he will do to me if things don't go as planned. I have contacted the police and asked what I can do. They took my phone in to copy the texts I received, but I'm sort of doubtful it will go anywhere. I honestly just believe it was a stranger who had bad intentions at the time and acted upon it. I'm not really even upset anymore. Anymore. I just want to continue with my life and better myself from any other future events. Alright, this happened to me about 3 years ago. It was brought up recently with my friends and they suggested that I post it here. I have gone through therapy for this and trained in firearms because this was the creepiest night of my life. I spent a night in what felt like a horror movie and it's still so vivid. It was a Wednesday night in the summer. I was off work, my husband was out of town, and our son was staying at his grandma's for the night. I was home alone with my dogs, an 80 pound Australian mix and my 80 pound German Shepherd slash Pit Bull mix. This particular night I remembered that the trash picked up comes the next day. I decided to turn on Game of Thrones for a bit, then I would take the trash out. All of a sudden, I realize it's 1.30 in the morning and I still haven't taken the trash to the curb. My house has two solid iron gates, one in the front and one to the side door slash backyard. Lighting on our street isn't that great, but it's a quiet neighborhood with a lot of families and you rarely hear about crime here. I looked out the window by habit before I took the trash out and saw who I thought was my neighbor smoking a cigarette outside of his gate across the street, looking directly at me. For context, this is a normal occurrence. My neighbor across the street hides smoking cigarettes from his wife, so he typically does it late at night in front of his gate. I get off of work late, so I usually see him and we wave, chat a little, then I go inside and he makes the joke he didn't see me smoking if my wife asks. So I'm bothered by seeing the guy, I go outside, grab my trash cans, open my squeaky iron gate, and take them out to the curb. I did not have my glasses on at the time, so as usual I waved and said hello. However, the guy, who I thought was my neighbor, threw down the cigarette and quickly walked off down the street. It took a minute for me to register that he was not my neighbor. I was a little creeped out because he was clearly staring into my window from the opposite sidewalk but also maybe it was a guy taking a night walk and just stopped for a cigarette. I thought I probably weirded him out as much as he weirded me out. Went back inside and laid on the couch with my dogs to keep watching Game of Thrones. At some point, I fell asleep and I woke up hearing my gate squeak and my German Shepherd mix growling. He's extremely protective of our family at home, but he's also the kind of dog you could take anywhere because he's so friendly in public. My Australian mix is more passive but his sheer size and scary bark tends to deter people. He's very friendly though. I quickly got up and pulled back my curtain. My gate was still shut and I didn't see anything. My dog however continued to growl at my front door. I looked out another window which had a better view of my front yard and porch. I didn't see anything. Eventually my dog settled back down with my other dog but I was still uneasy. I ended up watching television again because I couldn't go back to sleep. About an hour later I definitely heard my gate squeak. We are the only ones with a heavy cast iron gate and the noise it makes is so distinct. So I look out the curtain while my dogs are continuing to softly growl. My gate is halfway open but I don't see anyone. At this point, I'm panicking. In my panic, I couldn't find my phone. I grabbed my wooden baseball bat out of our room, crouched down, and started going through the couch cushions to get my phone. My dogs are oddly still quietly growling instead of barking, so I assumed no one was there. The minute I find my phone, my front door handle starts shaking. I run to the side door to let my German Shepherd mix out. I know he'll protect me and he can jump the six foot back gate. My Australian mix, going crazy, busts out one of our door side lights. I heard the guy say oh crap and immediately I let out my German Shepherd pit bull mix. I jumped up to look out the window, saw my dog latch on the guy's hand. 
the guy starts screaming and takes off down the street, my dog chasing him. I then become terrified he'll hurt my dog, so I run out with my baseball bat, screaming my dog's name over and over. The next thing I know, my dog is prancing down the street back to me, happy with blood all over his face. I call the police. They took another hour or so to show up and didn't seem to take me too seriously. They said they'd call local hospitals, but I never heard back. I called my husband Bali and he got on the next flight home. I stayed at his mom's for a few days, too terrified to go home. I did buy my dog's giant steaks for being so good and saving me. I don't know what that guy wanted, but since then I've been trained in firearms and self-defense. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I used to be employed as a child protection worker. A report came through about a stepfather who was being abusive to his children. I was given the investigation by my team leader. When I interviewed the oldest child with the police, she had very visible physical injuries and told me exactly what had happened. I'll spare the details, but it was horrific. As the children were in his sole care, we knew that they needed to be removed immediately. We sent a team of two workers out to the children's school while myself and a colleague called the stepfather into the office. I lead the interview and it was horrible. He didn't even try to deny that he had hurt his stepchild, basically saying that's my kid, I'll do what I want and you can't stop me. When I served him with the paperwork, he absolutely lost his mind. He was swearing and screaming and said if we were outside this building right now, I would kill you. We ended up running out of the interview room, pressing our emergency alarm and I even had to make a police report about the whole thing. It got really messy. The next day, we had court for the children and my manager decided I shouldn't attend due to everything that had happened the previous day. My colleague who attended told me that this man was at court and yelled several times something to the effect of where is that worker who took my kids. I remember feeling a little freaked out, but it's not uncommon to hear things similar to this when you have to remove a child. It's understandable that emotions are very high. You build a bit of a resilience working in this field, and overall I mainly felt relieved that those children had been placed with an aunt and were safe. About two weeks later, I had to stay back late at the office on an unrelated job. It was about nine at night when I finished and I was the only person there. I walked out the back of the building to my car. It was really dark, but when I got close, I thought, I saw a shadow moving at the front of my car just for a second and then it was gone. I was about 20 meters away at this point but it startled me. I stood there for a second just looking at my car wondering if I was just being paranoid. While staring into the darkness I started hearing tiny rustling noises. Safe to say I freaked myself out and sprinted back to the building. I called my boyfriend to come and pick me up explaining what had happened. By the time he drove up to the front doors I had convinced myself I was being silly and asked him to drive me around to my car. He circled around it with the headlights shining shining on my car I could very clearly see that all four of my tires had been slashed. I was an absolute mess that night and called the police immediately. I was pretty sure that this man was responsible but as I hadn't seen him I couldn't say for sure. I took a few days off and came back to a meeting with my manager who had put together a safety plan for me and the other staff. She organized to have a security guard escort us to our cars and said very clearly that no one was to stay in the building after hours alone. Then about a week later a letter was delivered to the office addressed to me. Any mail that comes into the office goes through our reception staff. Our lovely receptionist opened it and it was a note that said you're as good as dead. The words were typed and printed. She was an older woman and burst into tears when she read it. It didn't say who had sent it, but I am convinced it was the same man. Over the next few weeks, letters kept coming, each one getting longer. They addressed me as a bit in a home record saying that I kidnap and abuse children. It was just horrible, horrible stuff. The threats in the letters were the worst. The person writing them threatened to torture, kill, find out where I live and to burn down the entire building. To be honest, the police were less than helpful. They basically said that given the nature of our work, they couldn't conclusively say it was this man, although they had questioned him. To me, it all seemed like a pretty massive coincidence. I'd never had anything like this happen before. They did say they were taking the letters very seriously and tracking down where they'd been posted from, but I never heard anything back about that. My workplace took the threats very seriously too. All of the security was bumped up across the building and all staff completed refresher training on emergency management. One day on the way home from work, I I noticed that a car was following me. At first, I thought I was being paranoid, so I drove down a bunch of little streets, double backed onto the same route in a way that would make absolutely no sense. Even after all that, a dark green Camry was still paced a little way behind me. I freaked out, but had already planned in my head what I was going to do in this situation. I headed straight to the police station, 
planning to pull right up to the front of the building and beep my horn until I had someone's attention. The second I pulled into the police station, the green Camry drove straight past and disappeared down a nearby side street. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, too scared to get out of the car in case they came back around the corner. It dawned on me that in my panic, I'd forgotten to get the license plate. That upsets me to this day. I told the police what I knew, but they told me that the man didn't have any car registered in his name. This was the final straw for me. I was a nervous wreck. I was looking around constantly at work and at home. I knew that he lived relatively close to me, so I even stopped going grocery shopping in case I ran into him. I stayed on stress leave for a month and heard from colleagues that the letters kept arriving. I was very honestly ready to quit, but then COVID happened. It really changed everything. Everyone went into lockdown and all access to the office was restricted. I started back working from home, driving a work car to and from appointments. I didn't go into the office regularly anymore, only allowed in small working groups when absolutely necessary. Over the next year, the letters slowed and eventually stopped. By the time we were allowed back in the office, there hadn't been any sign of this man for almost seven months. About a year later, I left child protection. I don't know what happened with those children, but my hope is that they are happy and safe with their family. And as for the man who I believe stalked and threatened me for doing my job, let's not meet ever, ever again. A few years back, when I was around 18, I entered a very rebellious phase in my life. I have always been a prodigy child, always did as I was told, never stayed out late, didn't smoke, then a drink, scored the highest in all my classes. All my family and friends thought I was the perfect kid, but then something changed. I was on a lot of medication due to my health and I started going through depression. I started acting up like never before. I stopped going to school. I would stay in bed all day, didn't talk to anyone, and then slowly I started talking to strangers online. Initially, it was just talking to them online. I would talk to a few people until I found someone interesting. Would dedicate all my time talking to them until they no longer held my interest. And then moved on to the next person. This went on for about a year. Then I eventually started meeting these people in person. Most of these meetings were sexual and I was very reckless. I slept around with more people than I'd like to admit. And regardless of my lack of concern for own safety, I somehow never met anyone that had any evil intentions. We'd meet a couple of times, do the dirty, and then how was that? Until I met this one guy. I was talking to a couple of guys at that time. I wasn't in any sort of relationship. So this guy starts talking to me and asks me about my hobbies, my interests, what I do. I told him I do not smoke or drink and he was shocked. I told him it wasn't that I'd never done it. I tried but just felt like it wasn't my thing. We talked for a couple of weeks. I ended up talking about how I've been going through depression and at first he just listened. Eventually he started telling me I should try smoking. It would help me relieve anxiety and stress and I always turned it down. But he was relentless. After a month or so of talking online, we decided to mate. We had never had any sort of sexual conversation or anything, so we were just going to meet as friends. I was supposed to meet another guy, an acquaintance, for something I needed. So I suggested to the online chat guy that we meet briefly for lunch and then he can drop me off to the other guy's place. He agreed and we decided on where and when to go. The day we were supposed to meet, we met at a local cafe. We had brunch and then I got in his car for him to drop me off at the place I had to go. It was a good 45 minute drive so I put on some songs and decided to relax. Five minutes into the drive, he offered me a cigarette. I declined. He insisted and kept insisting until I gave up and agreed. I opened the box and there was only one cigarette in there. I told him it was his last one and asked if he was sure he wanted me to smoke it since he would have enjoyed it more than I he said yes. I took the cigarette out and there was something odd about it. It didn't look like it was store bought. It rather looked like it had been rolled by hand. But then again, I had never smoked enough cigarettes to be sure so I lit it and smoked it. I couldn't smoke even half of it. It made me inexplicably nauseous. So I gave up halfway through and offered it to him. Instead of smoking it, he put it out and threw it away. I thought that was weird, but assumed he probably didn't want to smoke while driving. 30 minutes into the ride, I started feeling very sick. My whole body was shaking. I was extremely nauseous and I could barely keep my eyes open. I kept telling him I wasn't feeling good and that maybe we should go to the nearest emergency room instead of where we were going. But he kept telling me to relax and lay back. Everything about that ride felt off. I told him to stop the car and drop me off wherever we were. He refused. All I could think of was pulling out my phone and calling for the police. When he noticed what I was doing, he immediately stopped the car and I got off. I couldn't stand. So I sat on the roadside and called the guy I was supposed to visit. He immediately drove to where I was and picked me, took me to his place where I threw up all over his living room. Multiple times. For the next hour and half, I just laid on the couch, my whole body shaking and constantly throwing up. 
The guy brought me water, gave me some electrolytes, and kept insisting on going to the hospital, but I refused. I had no idea what I had smoked, but I was sure it wasn't just plain old cigarettes. I was scared if it had been some illegal drug, and if the hospital caught on, I would get into trouble. And I absolutely did not want my parents to find out what I had been up to. So I laid there, kept throwing up, and letting whatever that stuff was to get out of my system. All these years later, I am now married to the guy who picked me up from the roadside and helped me through an insanely embarrassing time. this story takes place about five days ago. I'm still shaken up over it. I'm an 18 year old female and my parents and I packed up our stuff and made the long drive to our new home up north from our small and dinky apartment in central Florida. I can't lie, I was very excited about this move. Attending college in the spring, finally getting to start my dream career, and so many other things I couldn't or didn't get to do in Florida. On the first night of our drive, we stopped at a hotel in what appeared to be a shady area. It was kind of scary as it was set up right outside of a closed down gas station with boards and graffiti written all over them. From my parents' experience and what I've seen on television, these aren't the types of places you want to go lurking around in. My dad, who's usually very calm and collected, was on edge the whole night since the door to our room didn't close all the way. We had to prop one of the hotel chairs against the door and use the deadbolt to have even the slightest bit of comfort. I thought it couldn't get much worse than that, but I was so wrong. The second night, we stopped at a small town in North Carolina. We had our two cats with us, so we had to find a hotel that was pet friendly. We came across one of those hotels and booked a room for the night. While my parents were making sure nothing shifted in the car, I sat in the passenger seat of my mom's car with my little buddy trying to calm him down. He seemed more agitated than normal. About half an hour after pulling into the parking lot, we grabbed the cats and our essentials. Emotions were running high, so we were all on edge about getting to our new home in the next day or two, depending on the amount of sleep we got. We loaded our things into a cart and approached the hotel's side door. My mom pulled out the key card and it took a while for the door to finally unlock but the second we heard it click, a woman started yelling at us. We all looked up and saw her frantically running towards us. Her voice was frantic. The panic in her voice still sends shivers down my spine every time I think about it. She wore a long dark blue jacket, her hair in a messy ponytail that was tucked inside her hoodie. She either looked really tired, like she hadn't slept in a year, or she had gone through something horrible. She was panting, muttering the words, call the police, call the police, there's something wrong with that baby. There was no child with her, nor did we see any kids in sight. My initial thought was that maybe there was a kid near the front of the building that was seriously hurt, or there was a car accident we were too busy unloading to hear the collision. The woman kept telling us to call police, but my mom told her she didn't have her phone on her. I always carry mine on me, and me being the kind-hearted person I try to be, I offered to call for her. But the moment I pulled out my phone, my dad snatched it out of my hand. The lady then said, it's really bad, you need to come and say. My mom told her she didn't want to see, and that we should go inside so the lady could go to the front desk and get help. At first, she was screaming, no, no, I don't need their help, I need your help. But my mom kept insisting that we go inside. At this point, my little buddy was whining and clawing at his pet carrier trying to either get out or attack this lady. My boy might look like a sweet ball but if provoked, he's a scratchy machine. The lady took one look at him and attempted to reach for him, saying, yeah, let's get the babies inside. The way she said that was creepy. This time she sounded like she was on drugs or had bad intentions. I scooped up my cat before she could touch him and we led her to the front desk where she told the hotel worker the same story she told us. The hotel worker tried to calm her down, and while the lady was distracted, my parents and I walked toward the elevator and started getting inside. As I looked back at the lobby, I saw the woman staring at us, her eyes full of anger now. She then started charging at us, and before I even had a chance to react, my mom pushed me and my furry baby into the elevator, them standing in front to protect me. I could see the woman still running towards us as the elevator was closing. I remembered the small screen near the elevator in the lobby, showing which floor the elevator was heading to, so to stop this crazy lady from harassing us all night. We pushed all the floor buttons and we stopped on every floor. First the second, the third, the fourth, then the fifth. After the fifth floor, we pressed the button back to our original floor and quickly piled into the room. Silence. My heart was pounding the entire time. My body started shaking at what just happened. As I got my cat out of the carrier, I heard my mom and dad talking about that lady. My dad speculated that maybe she had a mental illness or was on drugs, whereas my mom said she could have been a trafficker with the way she was trying to get 
get us to come with her and see the supposed situation. That's when my heart broke. I try so hard to see the good in people, but at the same time, I try to keep the best distance I can. But this was the first time someone ever approached me. I was so gullible to almost believe her story. My guard had slipped. I tried to hold back my guilt in fear as best I could, but I ended up breaking down. My mom hugged me, saying everything was going to be okay. But no matter how many times she and dad kept saying that, my body continued shaking and my paranoia lasted throughout the night. Even at the slightest creak, I shot up from the bed and looked out the peephole thinking the lady had found us. Luckily, she wasn't there. That night, we all decided we were going to get up around sunrise and reach home before nightfall. No more hotel stops, no more creepy people, and no more shady areas. As we checked out the next morning, the same employee from the last night was there and we asked her what had happened after we got into the elevator. The worker told us after that, the crazy lady left in a huff, her hands clenched into fists, but then the worker revealed a detail that my mind keeps going back to. When she turned to go after us, she saw a syringe in the crazy lady's jean pocket. I don't know if she had already used it or was planning to use it on me and my family. It makes me wonder what the outcome would have been had my parents not been there and if I had given the lady my phone instead of offering to call for her. Would she have sold us into trafficking? Would she have robbed us while we were injected with whatever she was on? Anyway, we made it to our new home two days ago, but the fear of that night still eats away at me. It goes to show that no matter how panicked and frightened someone may sound or act, you truly don't know if they're in genuine trouble or if they have bad intentions after gaining a random stranger's trust. Please be careful out there, guys. I, unfortunately, had to learn the hard way that not everyone in this world is a good person. I'm just happy to still be alive and safe. I hope I never see that crazy lady again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I'm a young guy with a nighttime job living in an area of town that has gotten pretty sketchy the past decade or so. The police are here at least once a month to sort out some violent or drug related crime. I'm a very routine focused person, so for the past 8 years before going to work at 1.30 in the morning, I always take my dog out for a walk around 1 in the morning. In fall of last year, I went for the routine dog walk one misty night at 1 in the morning like I usually do. I made a right turn after exiting the gate, and just as I passed the corner of my apartment building, I noticed a fuzzy shape on the ground just outside the gate of the neighboring building. I stopped in my tracks and took in what I was looking at. I determined it was just a cat laying on its side on the pavement. I thought this was odd, but since I know my dog would most certainly bark at it and wake up the entire neighborhood, I chose to turn around and take a different route for the walk than usual. For the rest of this walk, I was reflecting on that cat. There was something very off about the cat just laying relaxed on the ground in the middle of the night with no people around. Once my walk had looped me back to my gate, I decided to turn the corner again and see if the cat was still there. Sure enough, it was still there. Same position and everything. Now I thought this scene was even more odd. I took my dog up to the apartment, put my work clothes on, grabbed my car keys and headed out. As I exited the elevator, the image of the relaxed cat laying outside was still in the back of my mind, perplexing me. Instead of going into the underground garage, I decided to instead go out of the main gate one last time to check if the cat was still there. I exited, turned the corner and once again, the cat was still laying there. Since my dog wasn't with me this time, I just just approached it this time to check if the cat was okay. When I got to it and looked down, I stared at it for a good long while. The cat wasn't breathing at all, it was dead, no question about it. I had my suspicions this might have been the case so I wasn't entirely shocked, but something was still so off about it. The cat wouldn't just lay down in the middle of a paved sidewalk to die of natural causes, I thought. There was no noticeable blood on or around it, so I began thinking the cat might have jumped from one of the balconies. Just as that thought hit me, a raspy voice spoke to me from above. Yep, there she is. The voice said in a very matter-of-fact type of tone. I got spooked and quickly glanced up through the mist. I saw a middle-aged woman on the fifth floor balcony leaning over the railing, looking down on me with a lit cigarette in her hand. When our eyes met, a cold shiver shot through the top of my scalp all the way down to my toes in an instant. I may have misinterpreted her facial expression due to the fog, but I could swear she was smiling when our eyes met. Without responding, I immediately turned and quickly walked over to my gate. As I walked, I could hear her laughing. I practically sprinted to my car in the garage. Once I sat down inside, I considered whether I should call the police or not, as every aspect of what I had just witnessed gave me the impression that this neighbor of mine had killed the cat. I dialed the number but decided not to, as they might want me to stick around for questioning which might get me late to work. So I went on with my night as usual, doing my best to forget about the incident for now. When I got home later, the cat wasn't there anymore. About a week later, I walked past a neighbor living in the same building 
as me. We had some usual neighborly small talk, but she interrupted herself to ask me whether I heard about what happened in the other building last week. I said I didn't. She told me that a woman on the fifth floor had thrown her cat down from the balcony in a rage because it peed on the living room carpet. The cat had apparently not died immediately, but all its legs were broken from the initial impact with the concrete pavement. Police were called around 5 in the morning when another dog walker saw the cat. The woman had still been out on the balcony by this point, talking to the guy while he called the police. I believe the woman's other cats were taken away from her and she was fined a few thousand dollars. She still lives there and I sometimes see her leaning on the balcony railing when I'm walking my dog. I've never interacted with her after that and I sincerely hope she never speaks to me again. I have this friend, for the sake of the story I'll just call him Ryan, who I believe has been stalking me for the past two weeks if not longer. I'll give some background information then get into the problem I'm in. Thanks in advance for any advice and help. We met back in 2014 in high school. He was always a quiet but nice and easygoing guy. We grew very close and I saw him as a brother. He didn't have a very smooth childhood. He saw his parents argue a lot, often for years. His mom even cheated on his dad and he saw the effect it had on him and the whole family. But you wouldn't suspect anything out of the order ordinary just meeting him at first. Around 2016, he started to become a bit paranoid and would seem a bit pessimistic at times. He never had many friends, neither did I for that matter. We had two other friends together that we saw often, and we were the only ones he trusted. I saw him have this strange panic attack where he ran out of a restaurant we were at and he ran to a nearby park and yelled at people. I called his dad to come get him and he got him in the car and gave him a pill. Apparently, this has been the second time this happened recently then. Fast forward to June 2021. In between that last episode, slash attack to now Ryan seemed normal as could be, but I noticed he was a bit off and has been since then. He met a girl in college months before that he says he fell madly in love with but she rejected him when he asked her on a date and blocked him on everything right after graduation. It took a massive toll on his emotional and mental state. He had another episode where he ran outside his house and actually provoked someone and they punched him in self-defense and then his parents took him to the hospital during that summer and was officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. So, from late 2021 until now I've noticed he's quieter, still cracks jokes, and can have a decent conversation with them, and still seems like a nice guy. But there's some stuff recently that I truly think is alarming, and this is why I'm making this post. So, I'll cut to the chase. For the last six weeks, we've hung out three times. This was actually after a hiatus where we didn't see each other since February this year because I started working more hours and went to night shift. Each of those three hangouts, I've noticed he looks at me in a really strange way, like he's horny and imagining me naked or imagining himself hurting me. He also mentions how he's still in love with that girl from school but proceeds to call her names and wants to kill her right after. He has said this numerous times and even mentions going to the elementary school she goes to. He sent me a picture of that school on Google Maps with arrows pointed at it and firework emojis last week. He also admitted to having parked outside her home and sitting there for hours about five times back in 2021. For the past week, he has been insisting on hanging out several times a day, and when I was at Chili's with my parents on site, he sent me a message saying Chili's. He's able to see me since I'm on the Snap Map on Snapchat since I use the app often to talk to other friends. When I went to the mall right after he said you're going to the mall again, you were there yesterday. Which is true. I went to the mall twice once with mom and then with both my parents the day later to get some stuff since one of our favorite stores was closing so we wanted to check out good deals. On the drive home that day he messaged me saying he didn't work today, we should have hung out. I replied maybe Wednesday. So, the day after. On Sunday he again insisted on seeing me but I went to go play soccer instead with other friends and then went to go do laundry afterwards and when I was at the laundromat he sent me a soccer ball emoji and a laundry emoji indicating he saw me on the snap map. Here's the thing, he keeps mentioning where I am and it's always within 10 minutes of me being on my phone. He's actually done this for the last two years but never this frequent it used to be like twice a month and I brushed it off, but now I'm noticing something actually concerning. He has also been calling me boyfriend and sending heart emojis the past week, and when I told him I might see him this week, he said you think I can wait that long to see my boyfriend. This past Sunday, I didn't reply to him for four hours and he kept asking if I'm mad and then said he wants me to reply no longer than a minute after he texts me each time. I have the feeling he's just constantly on his phone looking for when I'm active on social media and I really don't know why. He also admitted to me a month ago that he makes fake profiles to be able to gain access to that one girl's Instagram and look at her pictures and he says he jacks off to them. All of this is concerning. He currently doesn't have a job and hasn't had one for the last two years. I'm the only friend he sees and talks to and I feel he's developed a compulsion or fixation or dependence or a mix of all three on me and as I mentioned he has said he wants to kill the girl that used to be in his class and he knows where she lives and he knows where she works. I have not mentioned my thoughts on this to him again out of fear. He currently takes medication daily and he said he's been seeing a 
new therapist for just a month now, but I don't know if any of those are even working. I am asking for any advice on how to approach this and what to do. My concern is that if I tell anyone like the police or the girl, he will find out and retaliate by hurting me or my family as he knows where I live. Any help is appreciated. This happened about 20 years ago. I was 9 years old at the time, but my parents have also told me their side of the story on a bunch of different occasions, so that should help. My parents are both biologists. They met at work and from there it's history. The place where they worked at the time was a government building dedicated to biology research used in government projects turned towards the public, meaning they were the ones studying the environment and making environmental protection laws around their studies. This being a massive, old government building, it always had a security guard present, day and night. During the day, these security guards would mostly just stay at reception and greet people, but at night they would go do their rounds and make sure there were no intruders because of all the science equipment and computers kept in the building. One of these guards is the let's not meet guy. Initially, he seemed like the nicest person. He was really nice to me, and frankly, all the memories I have from him before this were really nice. He would greet me and talk to me in the nicest way every time my parents brought me to work. He would make me paper planes, which he was surprisingly good at, and throw them around with me and he would stay with me at reception in the days my parents had to work into the night. Obviously, for me, that would get really boring, really really fast, so he'd keep the company and entertain me. Mostly, we would talk, play with the paper planes and watch television. It all seemed nice enough, nice enough for my parents to trust him with me, which was probably their biggest mistake. One night, my parents had to work even later than usual. I think it was around 10 at night and they were still at it, so this guy, who was on the night shift, decided to take me around the building with him to do his rounds. We started on the top floor, checking all the rooms and the exterior part on the roof. Every room was so dark that I'd always stay a little behind and wait for him to turn on the lights. Then we stepped down to the second floor, where my parents office and labs were. We checked the opposite side of the building, going into labs with massive extractors, microscopes, and every kind of science equipment you might think of. We walked down the stairs to the first floor, where most of the administration rooms were. I still remember seeing some maps on the walls and embalmed fish everywhere serving as decorations. First floor was all clear, so it was time to check the two basement levels. I thought it would have made sense to check the labs on the right side first, as the left side had a flight of stairs at the end leading up to where my parents were, but for some reason he decided we'd go check that side first. We checked all the labs, but I noticed his pace was accelerating and he was starting to look and sound happier. Excited even. Once again, we checked all the labs, all the quarters from one end to the other, turning the lights on ahead of us and turning them off behind us when we left. When we got to the last area, he turned all the lights on and we went inside. There were three separate offices on each side of the lab, and on the first one, he hurried towards the printer, opened it up, took out two pieces of paper, and made two quick paper planes. That's when everything changed. He picked up one of the planes, went outside of the office, and threw it towards the end of the room. Then he told me the one he just threw was mine and that we could throw them around in there. I ran to the other side of the room to pick my plane up, excited to play with it, and suddenly the lights went off. When I turned around to check what was happening, I saw him getting out of the lab, turning the lights off and locking the door. I ran to the door, punched it and kicked it while screaming for him to open, panic taking over me because of how scared I was of being in the dark at the time. Through the glass on the door, I could see him scurrying away in the corridors, turning the lights off as he went and disappearing after turning a corner. I'm pretty sure that everything I felt and every shadow and creepy monster I saw in there while waiting was part of my imagination because of how scared I was. I balled up against a corner and could see shadows moving around me in the dark. I could only cry, lost, without knowing what was happening and why he was doing that. My parents finished work eventually, and when they did, they packed up their things and made their way to the lobby to pick me up and go home. When they got there, the security guard was at reception, but I was nowhere to be found. They panicked, of course, must have shouted a hundred different cuss words at the guy and I'm not sure how my dad didn't murder him right then and there, but when they first asked the guy where I was and what he had done with me, he simply said that he had gone to do the rounds with me and I must have gotten lost somewhere. This is a building that would take you about an hour and half to check from top to bottom, even if you're rushing, so it must have gotten lost somewhere is not exactly helpful. They looked for hours without finding me. It was only when I saw a light far at the end of the corridors leading to the lab I was in that I got the courage to stand up, rush towards the door and start punching it as hard as I could. They finally found me there and made the guard unlock the door to get me out. I don't really remember sleeping that night, and if I did, it must have been out of exhaustion, but I know I made my mom stay in the bedroom with me the entire night. Of course my parents made a complaint against the guard, and when they did and the guy started being investigated, 
He was fired and arrested, not because of locking me away where he probably hoped no one would find me, but because he had been partnering up with other criminals to steal computers and equipment from the building to sell in some shady market along with the information in the hard drives and make money off it. By then, he had stolen a lot of old computers without anyone realizing, and who knows what his plans were for me that night. I'm not convinced that locking a crying child in the middle of the darkness, hidden away in some room is exactly the most normal behavior if you're not trying to hide them and come get them later when everyone has left and sell them as part of your product. Luckily, he never had the chance to do that, and I really hope he never got to do it to any other kid. This is about weird encounters I've had with a music teacher when I was a kid. I, a 20 year old female, took orchestra classes when I was in middle school. Now, it's important to mention that I was an incredibly quiet and shy kid back then and had trouble with confrontation. When I was in 6th grade, our first orchestra teacher left the position and they rehired our new teacher. Our new teacher, I'll call him Mr. Smith, was generally disliked by everyone. He was in his 50s to early 60s and to an 11 year old, very tall. He was already imposing because of this, but what made it worse was how he treated his female students. One day in class, we were all struggling to play a song correctly. Mr. Smith became frustrated and didn't think any of us understood the beat of the song. He looked around the class, saying he needed a volunteer. Everyone became silent, including me, but I had the misfortune of locking eyes with him. He then called my name and waved me up to the front of the room. What happened next was not something anyone was expecting. I picked up my instrument to take up fraud with me, and he said, no, leave your instrument. Just you. I was very confused, but did as he said. I walked up to his side, and he instructed me to stand in front of him. At this point, the class was beginning to snicker, and I was just very uncomfortable. Move closer. I took a small step towards him, and at this point I was too scared to look at his face. All I could see was his button shirt in front of me. He made me walk closer until I was inches from him. Then, he moved my arm up and put my hand in his. He proceeded to make me slow dance with him for what felt like forever as he counted the beat. I let go of his hand at one point and tried walking back to my seat, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me back saying not yet. After this was over and I went on to my other classes, I learned that in each period of the day, he had chosen a female student to dance with him, regardless if the class was struggling to understand the beat. Unfortunately, this was not the end of what felt like unwanted attention from him. He would somehow find me in the hallways and would try to have talks with me about anything, even though I mostly kept to myself and didn't cause trouble in class. It got to a point that my friends understood how I felt and knew to say something to me when they saw him. And every time, without fail, he always managed to put his his hands on my shoulders when he talked to me, even if I was already backed against a wall. He wouldn't let me leave, and I was too scared to say anything. He could find me in a crowd, easily. He didn't do anything to my knowledge that was punishable, but to me, something always felt off about him. So to my creepy music teacher, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I work at a truck stop in Massachusetts in the United States. There is a 24 hour bathroom and gas station in this truck stop. One day after work, where my restaurant closed at 12 at night, I decided to go and sit with my friend who works at the gas station. His name is Jake for this story. He's 30 years old, as I usually did from about 12 at night to 2 and 3 at night. It was an average night at the beginning as there were not many customers. I sat there and drank my beer and relaxed while he fared with the customers buying gas and scratchers. At about 1.30 at night there were some more customers coming in. I saw two cars park around the same time, one at a gas pump, one in front of the store. Obviously this is normal as we always look toward the front door when somebody drove up, especially because we'd either be smoking pot or doing something else. I remember hearing the vehicles pull up and looking upwards toward the customers a few seconds later. I saw a lady walking from the pumps with what looked like a young girl who was likely related to her, and another car parked in front of where the clerk's window is. I saw the woman walk up to the door with her daughter, and another gentleman was walking behind them into the store. As the older woman opened the door after walking over from a pump, her daughter took a left turn, seemingly headed to the bathroom as a lot of customers on our rest stop for travelers, and a 24-7 restroom is pretty rare in my state. I saw a man get out of his vehicle which was parked right in front of the cashier's window which is Jake's window. The mother walked in and we greeted her as usual, whereas right after we watched the man walk up and open our front door. The man pulled on the gas station slash store's front door and then looked to his left. I was watching both customers with both eyes and it was in 
indeed strange when I watched his eyes veer to the left. Suddenly, he let go of the front doors as he quickly decided to speed around the corner. Like I said already, I saw this woman's daughter go in that direction, which is the only way to any other section of the truck stop at this point, and the bathroom. So I looked at my friend who I was keeping company during his 10 at night to 6 in the morning shift. I said quietly, but also decently loud, does that look weird? He looked at me with eyes that said more than words with the swift saying it does to me. Keep in mind, a lot of Massachusetts states trooper pull up to this location as there are very little rest stops within 20 miles as we are in a more urban area. No trooper pulled up this time, however. I didn't know much of what to do, so I turned around as the mother bought items, and I opened the doors that led into the dining room of the rest stop. Since I worked at the fast food restaurant here at 4, I knew about almost everything. I just walked slightly around the corner and peeked past the cash machine where both of the bathrooms were. When you first walked into the 24-hour restrooms, the immediate left is the men's restroom. If you continue to walk about 8 feet farther past the wall and look to your left, you'll see the women's room. So I slightly hid myself and looked through the glass door which we had locked about 3 hours and 30 minutes before. I didn't really see the woman's daughter pass. When I looked up, I could see the same man, clearly passing right by the first hallway where the men's restroom was into the hallway where there was no room, except the women's room. I waited until I really knew he had certainly entered the restroom. I really did not want to take any chances. I unlocked the door and I pushed myself through and the women's restroom door was already closed. On the camera footage all you can see is me push the door open with an arm cocked back, slightly moving, then the door closes. I ended up punching a man in his face, then I kicked him with the side of his head. He fell backwards and hit the back of his head on the sink. I got completely terrified and called the police. I told them I had assaulted a man in the women's restroom of our local truck stop but thought it was for a good reason. State troopers had arrived after not even three minutes. I already had my hands up in the gas station and air section. They asked me what had happened and I told them everything. After the state troopers witnessed the camera footage recorded by the gas station into the rest stop bathroom, they made a decision. The state troopers came up to me and said any driver who was stopped by a law enforcement officer for a traffic violation and is not wearing a safety belt can be fined $25. They charged me a $20 fine. I will not name any officers that were involved in this situation. I do not know what happened to the possible creep, and frankly, I really will never care for the rest of my life. I don't think I really saved anybody, but I hope that day I made somebody really rethink their decision in doing what they wanted to. This happened at a travel hockey tournament. I've never had an experience like this before, so it was shocking as somebody who has been playing for 13 years. At the time, I was a 13-year-old female. However, at 13, I gained the privilege of being able to walk around in public without having an adult's eyes on me 24-7. In hindsight, probably not the best decision of my dad. I was on a co-ed team this year, and all of the kids were 13 and 14. We were headed down nearby DC for a tournament in December. Our team manager booked a hotel that was in the projects. I'm talking hearing a gun shot and seeing abandoned houses nearby when I pulled into the parking lot of this hotel. This was already a red flag, but I continued to unload my suitcase from my dad's truck and grab my backpack too. As we were headed towards the doors of the hotel, I heard a man behind me calling some girl's name. I think he was screaming Annie or something that sounded like that. I turned around just to see if he was anywhere near us and he was standing next to a large pillar connected to the hotel. This man had bloodshot red eyes It was definitely on some sort of substance. I decided to start walking faster and my dad must have thought the same thing as me because we started hightailing it to the hotel doors. Less than a minute had passed once we reached the hotel doors, probably about 10 seconds. I decided to look back to see if this man was still there, but he disappeared. Eventually, my teammates all texted the group chat saying they had arrived and they were hanging down in the lobby. I rushed to the elevator to go join them. I clicked the start button which leads to the lobby, but when the door opened, it wasn't the lobby. The elevator had taken me to the basement. I was frightened because it kind of looked like the back rooms except tile flooring with some 60s music playing faintly. I took a peek outside the elevator door and there was absolutely nobody in sight. I tried the start button again, absolutely horrified from that. I didn't feel myself go up or down. The door opened to the basement again. I figured maybe the start button was the basement and it was just different from other hotels. Maybe I just had made a mistake and was supposed to press floor 1 to get to the lobby. I hit the floor 1 button. This time it took me to a hallway. The button lead me to the first floor of hotel rooms, still not taking me to the lobby. At this point I started 
started to get confused and an eerie feeling overcame me, I decided to head back onto the elevator, go to my floor, and walk down the stairs. I knew my entire team was roomed on the third floor, so I felt more comfortable walking down the stairs from there. I went up to floor 3 and got off of the elevator. On my way to the stairs, I saw weird crumbs in front of a hotel door and bent down to take a look at what it was. It was weed on the floor. I was kind of taken aback a bit. The person on the inside must have heard me because the door opened. The crazy man from the parking lot was the one behind the door. After seeing this, I bolted to the stairwell and ran down the stairs. I was running so fast that I was skipping some steps. I even ended up accidentally tripping at one point but I got up as fast as my little legs could carry me. I made it down to the lobby and my team saw me in a panic. They all asked me what's wrong and I explained my story. I got a few looks from them and they probably thought I was delusional. But one of the boys convinced the whole team to follow me onto the elevator so I could show them in person what happened. I clicked the start button and lo and behold, the door reopened without any movement from the elevator. This was the same elevator and same button I had pressed previously. I still have no explanation behind this. The weekend ended up continuing but being completely normal until we had to leave for our last game. We all were standing in the lobby about to leave. We walked out into the park parking lot to see that one of the cars had been broken into and it was my teammates. This car had a back window that was pretty big so you could see what was inside of the trunk. Well, turns out that somebody had broken into the vehicle thinking it was full of something valuable. The only thing left behind in the trunk was both of my teammates sticks so he definitely wasn't looking for equipment. Jokes on him though because hockey equipment smells absolutely rancid and he probably had a not so nice surprise when opening up the bag. The hotel workers actually checked the cameras and guess who it showed? The crazy man from the parky lot. So, crazy man, let's not meet. This happened not too long after I moved to England. Back then, and still to this day, my country's living conditions weren't great, with everything getting worse every year, low salaries and high cost of living, so I decided I had enough. Not too long before that, my best friend had moved to England with her boyfriend and her dog. They lived in a house with a spare room, so we planned it out, and I moved to their house and shared the rent while I tried to find a job in my own place. We didn't last too long in that house, though, and two weeks after I moved in, we moved into a different house. The house itself was supposed to be better, but the neighborhood it was in. Well, let's just say it had a lot to improve on. The problem, though, was that my friends had the dog, and most nights they would get into huge fights about who was the most tired from work who worked the hardest, who did the most at home, and other nonsense I didn't have the patience for, so I would end up offering to take the dog for his walk just so I didn't have to listen to them anymore. They would usually go pretty well, I think especially because this was around the pandemic time, so there were a lot less people on the street. One night, though, was different. When I offered to take the dog and walked out of the house with him, I had this strange feeling going on, like that night I shouldn't have offered to go and should have just stayed home. Then again, maybe it's best it was me and not my friend. Back then I was 25 going on 26, well built and broad shouldered and could easily take a fight, even though I'm not a very tall guy, so it probably presented a bigger threat than my friend. I went down the stairs, walked out of the building with a trash bag in hand, dumped the bag and went on my way to the close entrance. As always, when I got to the main road, because I like to keep the walks different and fresh for the dog, I looked both ways to decide which way to go. That's when, to my left, I noticed this guy jogging in my direction. What troubled me, though, was that he was jogging a completely normal day to day clothes. Not dressed to go out for a run at all, Thinking I didn't want to be judgy people and didn't want to be feeling uneasy, I decided to just walk the other way and try to ignore the guy running my way. If it was the case, I would cross the road and see what happened. I wasn't the only one feeling uncomfortable, though, as the dog was refusing to just go about her way. He was an intense dog, with a massive focus when it came to trouble and was a mix between a bulldog and a Portuguese hunting dog breed. So he was medium-sized, muscular, and had this habit of staring people down in a way that would make everyone uncomfortable. And that's just what he did then. I turned to my right, started walking down the street, having to pull the dog along every 5 seconds because he wouldn't stop turning around and observing the guy who was still about 30 seconds jogging away from us. Of course, I kept my eye on the guy as well, taking advantage of having to pull the dog along to keep measuring how far the guy was from us, and when he was starting to get too close for comfort, I decided to cross the street. If he was just running past, he would be on his way. If there was something else happening, he would cross the street as well. Of course, that's exactly what happened. When I started crossing the street, the guy crossed it behind me, and then I decided to actually stop and let the dog stare the guy down to see what would come out of this. It was like I had messed 
everything up for him. He looked surprised, stopped running, and walked past us with both me and the dog eyeing him. He then lifted his hands like he was surrendering and said, Hey brother, all good, all good, to which I just replied, all good, you, yeah, boss, yeah, he said. Then he walked ahead of us and finished crossing the road, and I went back to the same side of the road I was on to begin with and thought that would be it. No trouble, just a slight misunderstanding. That's when the guy stopped, turned around, saw I was not on his side of the road anymore, and did the weirdest thing. He took two steps back up the road and hid behind a tree, like he was hiding from someone else that was ahead on the street. This made me even more uncomfortable, and I was now having to control my shaking legs, adrenaline and increasing heartbeat, and not let any signals give my discomfort away. I ignored it, kept walking ahead, walked past the guy on the opposite side of the road, looked him in the eye again to warn him without having to say anything. I kept walking. Ten more steps was all it took. With this weird guy behind me, I heard something shuffle ahead in the street. Initially, I thought this could be a fox, but stopped when I decided the shuffling sounded like it was coming from something way bigger than a fox or a dog. Another person, maybe. Then I saw it. There was someone else hiding behind one of the upcoming house's trash can, waiting for me to get there. I could see a part of their back showing up from one of the sides. I don't know if me and the dog could have taken them on or not, but I decided then I wouldn't risk it for me, let alone risk the dog's life. I turned around and started walking up the street again. Walked past the first guy, who was still huddled behind the same tree, nodded at him, said goodnight, and left. The surprise in his face confirmed everything to me. They were not expecting me to understand what was going on, were not expecting me to turn around and simply walk away, and the first guy was not expecting me to still interact with him at all. For the night, I decided to just let the dog do his business in the little grass area behind our building, and that was it. Considering that this was a very dangerous and high crime neighborhood which keeps getting worse, and a month later my boss's son and his friends were mugged at knife point with a machete just up the road from where this happened, I think I made the right choice that night. So this happened a while back. I was probably around 10 or 11 years old. Meeting my brother, Alex, was around 8 to 9 years old. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes to do when I noticed something was off. I didn't see anything at first, but I just knew that something was wrong. So my brother and I start walking home. As the only two who got off at our stop were him and I this blue and silver beat up truck drives past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped. It just kept going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandmother always told me to do with him as he's my baby brother and I want nothing to happen to him. Nothing happens at first but then the same truck drives around again, driving our way this time. There was a cul-de-sac at the end of our road. It was driving slower this time and went up the road and turned out of sight. Now Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to the other side road, right off the main road the man just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving, real slow, down the street towards us again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I don't know how I knew, but I did. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions, just run. And we did. In our driveway, which is about a hundred feet long, there is a row of bushes and pine trees that divide our home from the next door neighbor. I dragged him in there and told him to be quiet and I'd explain later. I watched as the same truck drove down and around the cul-de-sac again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying and I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. I was more worried for him than for myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister. I had to protect him. I looked at him and said that the truck was following us, and I told him to not be scared. I said I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and it seemed to calm him down a little. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened, and out came a man. He was tall, skinny, and messy. Short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting this dude's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car. He started it and drove away slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run. When I count to three, we are going to run behind the house to the back door. Okay, he agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across 
of our driveway and into our front yard to go around the house. As soon as we left our spot, I heard it. The sound of accelerating. He saw us. He was waiting for us to leave. He chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key, which was about 20 feet away from me. The garage door was open. I swear to god I saw this man round the opposite corner of the house that we did as I entered the house. We entered and I slammed it shut, locking it and dead bolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. My grandmother made a safe word for us that was a normal everyday word word that we could use if we were in danger, just had to scream it basically. It woke my aunt who worked the night shift and was sleeping. We told her everything and she stayed up with us until my grandmother got home. They called the police and that was my first ever interaction with an officer. The man was never caught. To this day, I don't know what he wanted but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother or I would be right now if she hadn't. So, to the messy man in the blue and silver truck, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. So I'm a new Uber Eats driver, only been going about a month. I was just completing an order in the middle part of town, not too suburbs, but also not too bad. I live in a major city, so going in and out of very income level places is normal. As I walked up to my customers, I see there's a man, a woman in the doorway, and another woman across from them on the sidewalk. The woman in the doorway is standing timidly behind the guy, and his jaw looks firm. She doesn't break eye contact with me as I walk up, but I tried not to pay it much mind. The guy accepted it, said thanks, and rushed him and his girl into the building. I started to walk back to my car when I noticed the woman from before gently calling for me to stop. She was gently saying hey and I almost didn't catch it. However, I did notice her trying to keep pace with me on my way to my car. That sent my haunches up and I did a quick little one-two step to get a bit in front of her. Jumped into my car without breaking eye contact with her. Click pushed the lock button on my door and she still proceeded to try and reach for my passenger side door as if to open it. She heard the door click and stopped on her way to grab it. She bent down to look at me through my window and her eyes looked far off and bleary. She kept mouthing something but just like before her voice was very quiet and I couldn't hear her. I cracked my window just a bit so I could hear her but not enough that she could get a hand inside. I said hello. I was pretending to be callous and hard but I am very soft and easily intimidated. I'm not good with confrontation and in most dangerous situations I tend to panic. I'm really proud of myself at this point that I was quick enough to think of all of these safe solutions. She starts just talking in circles about what are you doing? Where are you going? And you can't deliver for Uber. You're in high school. Keep in mind that I do have a baby face but I am 30 years old. I'm polite but curt with her and tell her yes I am doing deliveries and now I have to go. Did you need something or did you need any help? She keeps trying to talk in circles but as I'm about to insist that I am peeling out she says hey let me come with you. I get this weird feeling in the back of my neck because she looks like what she said was a perfectly sane request and still did not break eye contact with me. Also keep in mind that this entire time she's been speaking with a very gentle and quiet voice as if she was talking to a small scared animal. I say no thanks. She insists saying just trust me I'm going to go with you just trust me. Again this point getting more nervous I say no thanks I'm about to drive off you should step back so I don't run over your feet. She tries to get closer maybe thinking that if she doesn't move I won't move. She's sadly mistaken and I start rolling slowly forward saying you better step back I'm about to crush your feet. She kept laughing to some unknown joke in her own mind saying you're so funny you're so funny. I peeled out of there and confusedly looked back in my rearview mirror. I never come across someone like that before and I've been in much rougher neighborhoods than this so I was very confused. I called my husband who was used to living in the rougher part of my large city and said that she could have potentially been trying to trap me so that another person or car could roll up on my driver's side and potentially jump me or try to steal my car. I'm always glad for his insight because of my shelteredness I have no idea about all of these strategies that people have to get one up on you. Hello, I wish to tell you where my fear of going in water comes from. It's something I was never ashamed but I never told the real details to anyone. To begin with, I never had a fear of water when I was young. I was a good swimmer with a lot of imagination who loved The Little Mermaid, the Disney and Anderson versions, but after meeting someone when I was 13 years old, it changed everything. Now, a little introduction to my childhood to understand the context. My mom couldn't have a baby because she had an illness so she and her husband adopted me when I was a baby. I never had difficulties regarding that and had a happy childhood being an only child. They are my mother and father, that's all. However, one day, they divorced. My dad had an affair with a younger woman. She got pregnant and he told my mom when the pregnancy was almost done. I was 9 and it broke the relationship I had with my dad and gave me insecurities about 
about being unloved by him. My parents stayed friends only for me and for many years. I spent half of the summer holidays with one and the other half with the other. This summer, I was with my dad, his new wife, and my half little brother and I hated it. Being a teenager who despised this new side of my family and being forced to go with them to a beach, I was always grumpy and dramatic. It was a small nudist beach, a new thing my father discovered while having a new partner. I didn't really care since I could wear a swimsuit. One day, my dad came back to us with a guy around 50 who introduced himself as an English teacher. Let's call him Alex. Usually, I had nice grades, but I wasn't very good in English, which wasn't my first language, so my dad told me Alex agreed to teach me a bit and help me do my summer homework. I was happy, seeing their opportunity to not have my father helping me do them. So, the next day, Alex came back to us and helped me do a few exercises while my dad went away to go swimming. After an hour or so, Alex proposed to go in the water and I accepted. I said to my father's new wife where I was going and followed Alex. He gave me a tuba and a mask to watch the fishes. Now, I know it was stupid. I was well aware of stranger danger but I was happy to have a distraction and didn't think this guy was dangerous because he got introduced by my father. There were a lot of waves and the sea was so clear I remember watching in fascination all the colorful fishes around me. I followed Alex without difficulty and we turned around some big rocks. There, he gave me the sign to go up and told me we could rest here. Like I said at the beginning, I was a good swimmer so I put the tuba away from my mouth and said that I wasn't tired at all. I don't know if he didn't hear me or didn't care because the next moment, I felt hands around my hips forcing me onto his naked lap. I panicked, my head got under the water while the guy was pinning my back against his front. I don't remember if I had the tuba back into my mouth but my feet couldn't touch the sand at the bottom and I couldn't get to the surface. I thought I was about to drown. I was so scared I don't even know if he was hard or was trying to touch me. I kicked and struggled until he let go of me. I climbed on the rocks and got onto the shore before going back to the beach on foot. The rest of the day, I was silent but nobody seemed to notice. Except during the evening when my mom called me on my phone and she immediately knew something was wrong. I briefly explained to her what happened and she told everything to my father who confronted Alex the next day. We never contacted the police and I never met him again. Maybe he wasn't an English teacher to begin with and was looking for an excuse to meet a naive teenager. The moment Alex grabbed me was so quick, maybe 20 seconds, but it left a huge scar on me. I can't go totally underwater while being unable to touch the bottom without panicking. I don't swim anymore. I know it could have ended way worse and that's the only thing I'm glad for. About three years ago, I, a 21-year-old female, was a waitress during the height of the pandemic. It was my first ever job and I remember being so excited to start as soon as possible. After all my training was finished and I got my certifications, I was put on the closing shift. We closed at 10 at night every night. At the time, and typically it was just my cook, a 20-year-old male and I rarely would there be another waitress with me and I liked it that way. I always worked better alone and I didn't really get along with most of the other waitresses anyway, so it was nice. I can remember it was near the end of my my time there that this experience happened and I'm really happy I had the circumstance I did at the time. I never could really trust my gut very much because I had mild anxiety and couldn't tell if what I felt half the time was valid or not. I mentioned this because when all this went down, it felt real and I had an absolute feeling. I had started my shift that evening around 3. I said goodbye to the last waitress and I was on my own with my cook. Everything was pretty slow and normal until I got a call about one of the specialty items on the limited time menu we had. The food couldn't be ordered as takeout and the lady over the phone really didn't take it well. After a little debating, she finally decided to sit in and eat instead. I'd say around 10 to 20 minutes later is when I spotted an older looking car pull up and three people came out. Two men and a woman who looked to be in their 30s to 40s. I could tell it was the same lady I spoke to over the phone judging by her attitude coming in. I further confirmed it by asking since I already had a pretty good idea of what she wanted to eat. What I thought was an act of mild embarrassment and pettiness was actually something much more sinister later on. Her attitude toward me changed when she saw me. She was much nicer and more cooperative. This didn't ring any bells at first because it was something that most people who wanted to look good in front of others would do. I sat them at a booth and took their orders. I noticed they had a red binder and a black pen. Remember this. I then waited to tend to my other customers as there were a couple other tables I was waiting on. Once I brought their food out to them, they asked me if I knew any realtors. I found this to be normal as this being the tourist vacation state it is, it wasn't uncommon for outsiders to be looking for getaway homes. I would say this was reasonable for me 
to assume it was nothing if they didn't already look like the unsavory type of people if you get what I mean. Nonetheless, I gave them the phone number to a realtor I knew closely and well since I often went to church with her. There wasn't any other notable interactions I really had aside from occasional small talk if I wasn't doing anything or refilling their drinks. It was around 4.30 now and they were the last of my tables to leave the restaurant. If any of you were in the food industry, you know that as a server, you don't really get breaks. Just a lunch most of the time and sometimes not even that if it's super busy all day. So my cook and I took this as an opportunity to take a well-deserved break. We walked out behind them and had a small chat with them. I should mention by now that the front of the restaurant had a disabled ramp coming up to the doors. It was long because the building was on a raised foundation. This is important. Now, I didn't really notice it at the time, but one of the men took my cook to the other side of the ramp, down near the end, and was chatting with him over a cigarette. I was behind the railing at the top of the platform where the ramp plateaued. Luckily, the other man and the woman were on the other side of the railing about five feet below but in front of me. We were having some small talk and they started to ask some personal questions such as if I lived in the area, if I smoked weed, how old I was, stuff like that. I hadn't quite learned yet that telling strangers such personal things wasn't a good idea, however this for some reason was starting to raise some red flags. I gave very vague answers to all her questions as best as I could. Unfortunately, they still persisted in trying to have some sort of communication with me outside of my work. Whether or not I said no, I suppose when they finally realized that I wasn't going to give that information up, the woman finally got to her point. She had told me that she had a business offer for me. It was for a cleaning service. I don't like cleaning anyway so regardless I would have said no, however what she said next solidified my answer. She proceeded to tell me that she owned a maid service called the Pretty Kid is Maid Service. She said she needed pretty and young girls like me, that she had 10 girls now as it was that she wanted to expand. She mentioned how they get paid 30000 and how it would be a great opportunity for me to help her with her business. I instantly knew at that point that it certainly wasn't a maid business and I was in danger. However, I didn't understand just how much danger I was in. I politely declined her offer and told her I liked my job as it was, that I was satisfied working for my boss. She tried to further convince me by telling me how easy it was and reiterating how much I'd make under her supervision. She mentioned how she had a van for her business and described it to me. I can't exactly remember what she told me but I do remember how she told me to follow her to her car. She said she'd show me a picture of her van in her car but her phone was in her hands. I knew for certain I wasn't going anywhere with her or near that car. I declined yet again and said that I was fine right where I was. I said she could show me on her phone instead but she was hesitant. After which she proceeded to end the conversation and left with the two men. A little shaken, I walked back into the restaurant with my cook and told him what I had just experienced. He joked about how I'd have good money if I went with him. Because I didn't take the situation as seriously as I should have, I laughed with him. At the end of that night, when the cook's grandmother came to pick us up, I mentioned the weird interaction. A panicked look came over her and she sat silent, staring at me. I got confused and asked her if everything was okay. That's when I learned the signs of human trafficking. She broke it to me that I was almost trafficked and I was incredibly lucky I didn't get kidnapped. My stomach dropped and I started to panic at the realization of just how much danger I was in. Nothing really happened after that, except for the red binder and the black pen I told you you remember. I went to work the next day and a customer walked in. Now normally in my part of town, not many people like to sit and relax for a while. They're mostly there to just eat and leave as it wasn't exactly a cafe. While I get into my apron and sit this gentleman, he was well dressed, not in a suit and tie, but just nicely dressed. He was alone. I sat him at a single booth and took his order of one single coffee. He had a red binder and black pen with him. I didn't even notice until my cook from the night before reminded me of it. I was so shocked at the fact and it unsettled me even more that he proceeded to sit there for three hours, watching me as I tended to my tables. I kept asking him if he needed anything else and he asked me if people never just sat and relaxed with coffee. I sort of shrugged and said no, not here. Now this might come as a surprise to some of you, but servers, believe it or not, do listen in on some of your conversations. I'm lucky I did with this one. I specifically remember him speaking over the phone about finances and how he needed to find another house. He spoke about moving money and how he was going to pay his girls that night. I ran to the back of the kitchen and told my cook. Thankfully, he came out with me to help deliver some plates in order to throw the guy off. It worked, I think. He ended up leaving not long after that and I haven't seen or heard anything since. I'll tell you though, I've been much more on guard since then. Though, I wasn't able to report them because their car was facing forward toward the building's cameras and we couldn't see the license plate. Yes, I told my manager and he never allowed any of the servers to leave the building without someone else walking them out. I made it known throughout the whole staff about what happened since I didn't want any of them to get hurt. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
It was the middle of summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had made some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever and I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone I stayed up until 3 in the morning playing my console so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3 so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers so when my parents are gone I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through social media when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ears trained and trying to hear anything else. Nothing new. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walk down the stairs to check it out. So the stairs to the kitchen are pretty tight and walled in. I can't see into the kitchen when I walk down. Even though my house is very old and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There's no way I wouldn't have heard another noise and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen even if there were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a scared cat, I sort of chuckled to myself for being so stupid and just normally walked the last two stairs and turned the corner into the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face, just staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile but his arms. They weren't just at his side, he held them in the strangest most abnormal position I've ever seen. I don't know why I remember this so much, but it's just the weirdest position someone could put their arms in I've ever seen. Honest to god, I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I can realize how creepy this situation was, but in the moment, I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping slash pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I ran up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob, almost without thinking. I immediately called the cops and, nearly in tears, told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room, in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The guy was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the operator on the phone was asking, Hello, are you there? Hello. I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light returned to the gap, and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe, and I opened the door to the two of them standing there. I almost cried. Nowadays, my parents don't even leave me home alone anymore. Thank God and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. Even working with sketch artists and a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. I have no idea what he wanted or who he was, but regardless, let's never meet again. So, this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit but the situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time and so was video chatting this is important for later. I was on an online dating site and was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time, he was 28. We talked for about 6 weeks before I gave him my phone number and we took it online to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. 2 months after our initial chat we were texting and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out but I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like like going to a bar. I invited him over to my place, which was stupid in hindsight, and after he finished at the bar he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and know how to defend myself if needed. I also had a whip cam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo on a hot day, put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam program and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10 at night and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because 
because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later, he asks for some water, so I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I came back, he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left, I looked on my nightstand where I put the firearm down after showing him and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm and he left his phone on my bed. Right then his phone rings and I answer it. Come to find out, he's married. His wife was calling him wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm and I had video evidence and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door, my firearm in his hand, asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this, him, I need my phone, give me my phone, me not opening the door but yelling through the window, take the magazine out of my gun, empty the chamber, throw the magazine into the bushes, the one in the chamber across the road and put it on the ground. Him, no, give me my phone, me, I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment and I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker, wife, a whole bunch of expeditions, he gets shocked, runs and gets in his car then comes back, telling me he threw my gun in the ditch. At this point, I make him empty his pockets, take his pants off, take his hoodie off and show me that he doesn't have my gun on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone and I go outside and get in his car and the driver's seat and tell him to take me to where he threw my gun. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him. Being a felon, not being allowed to own a gun ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake, domestic violence, with a gun, we get up the road. He tells me my gun is there in the ditch. Then, I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. He was about 6 foot 4 and I am 5 foot 3. Or I could make him go get it and take a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on his phone with his wife and my phone with the police. He retrieves my gun, brings it back to the car and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the magazine and one of the chamber in his pocket so now he's enjoying time in prison. My mom's dog, Pucky, was a very sweet, loving dog. She was an emotional support animal dog, but trained to be a service dog for post-traumatic stress disorder before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped anyone, and she had no sense of smell, so she loved all animals and people, a real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I, a 11-year-old girl, was at home with my siblings who are 2 and 6 and my then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. For reference, we lived in a two bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods on a dead end road at the time and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our narrow driveway, and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand time watching videos when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times, and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time, so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch, and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur standing on end, her tail straight up, and then she barks. Loudly, I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've heard her bark. Ever. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock knock knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location wise, so my 11 year old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky, and I felt better with our three yappy dogs in the room with me. 
even if they were all the size of New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was a really thin, taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know. Like a clean, newer looking shirt and new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely in the hundreds of degrees that day. He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stare up at him in confusion because I definitely don't know this man, and I ask what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that's way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there, kid. I'm trying to sell this here carpet cleaner, and he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seemed so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home was unnerving because he probably knew they were and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I start to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen. When all of a sudden I hear it, Bucky had crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping from her mouth, her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too, and as I look towards Bucky she tries to lunge past me and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack this guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Bucky out along with the rest of our dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway, barking and jumping about, but Pucky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone join up with him running when he got onto the road. The second he disappeared, Pucky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog I knew, no barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realize my siblings are still down the call and run to check on them, and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still, but the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, no doubt in my mind about it. From what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Pucky was sleeping, so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Pucky went after them and scared them off, and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Pucky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while her small dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home, she took all of us to my aunt's house, and on our way there, we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men plural, because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. So, to the two men apparently going door to door to sell their unlabeled carpet cleaner, I'd really rather not meet again. At the time this happened, I was a 13 year old girl, so this happened 2 years ago and I was fairly naive. I was a major introvert and only friends with a few people in my class. I wanted to be social but I preferred to be alone and read or write, classic nerd things. In early November, I got a text on my phone that was from a few classmates whose phone numbers I had and around 1 or 2 I couldn't reconcise. It was a group chat, asking if we wanted to hang out at night near a park at our school. My parents, being strict and paranoid, would never let me go. Luckily, or what I thought was luck, they were heading out for an overnight trip. They would be back around 4 in the morning. Everything fell into place. Once my parents left around at about 8, I ran out the door and made my way to the park. The one thing I made sure to do was lock the door. My parents were paranoid after all and it was their biggest thing that they engraved into me. Once I arrived at the park, I noticed a creepy figure near the edge of the woods. No one else seemed to notice it. I didn't mention it though to anybody else there. The night drew on and on. I was having the time of my life, ignoring the gut feeling I had telling me to run. Every so often, I would look over my shoulder and the man would still be standing there. Around 9.45, 4 out of the 10 people there had to leave due to their curfew. It was getting cold and was nearly pitch black with a few street lights every so often. The rest of us decided to go as well, since it felt more eerie and quiet. The place we were hanging out at was a field that was fenced in with a few exits and entrances. A large wide field with a small park in the back and our giant middle school behind us. The front of the field faced the empty road and the right and left sides were surrounded by forest. 
All of the people left were getting picked up by cars meaning that they went the opposite way of the road since that's where the parking lot was. The man stood by the right forest slash road exit that I needed to take to get home. I walked away from my group. The man was probably early 40s late 30s. Dark hair with a beard. He was probably around 5 foot 9 but at the time it seemed like he was 6 foot. He stood about 10 feet from the exit I had to take so when I got close enough to it I ran for about 30 feet through the exit and through the woods. Once I felt safe enough I started to quickly walk through the woods or at least get to the road. I heard a snap and a crunch from behind me. I stopped walking for a second and quickly checked over my shoulder. Around 15 feet behind me stood the very same man. He was walking slowly behind me, almost as if he was trying not to be suspicious but it only made my fear worse. I turned around and walked so quickly I was basically jogging. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park we had hung out at and I wasn't athletic enough to run home. After around 7 minutes of walking fast, I was in my neighborhood. I knew that I could run to my house if I had to, so I checked to see if he was still trailing behind me. To my horror, he was only 5 feet away. I ran, I ran faster than I've ever ran. I could hear his footsteps behind me thumping across the concrete as he ran too. I dove down an alleyway I knew well and tried to lose him in a park, making my way home longer. I could hear his heavy breath followed by his footsteps as he tried to keep up. I cut through houses, backyards, and front yards. I finally made it to my house and flew up the steps. I looked behind me and he had just arrived at the bottom of my stairs. I unlocked the door and burst through it, shoving it closed behind me and I heard him hit the door with his whole body. I ran around the house and locked all the windows, turned off the lights and hid in my bedroom with a kitchen knife just in case he got in. He didn't luckily. If this was a better world, that's where my story would end, but it doesn't. After a few months, I haven't really told anyone what's happened since I don't want to get in trouble with my parents for sneaking out or anything. I didn't go out with anyone or any group anymore and my loner status returned. I began to write horror stories as a coping mechanism and never went out past 7. It was around February when a classmate of mine was sharing a story of some random man following her home on the bus. She just decided to almost the exact same as the man who had chased me home. Another girl mentioned that he sounded like the guy who stood outside the school and tried to follow her home. I didn't join him but everyone agreed that he was just a weird guy. He was kind of forgotten and eventually I moved on too. Around May, I was getting ready to walk to school when my mom pulled me aside and showed me a picture of a man. The guy who stalked me actually, she told me that he had been taken into custody two weeks ago for assaulting a child and had had escaped last night. She told me to keep an eye out for him and to call the cops if I saw him. I was shaking the whole time I walked to school. It haunts me to know that if he had caught me, I would most likely be in her position or even dead. So, creepy nighttime stalker who liked to hunt down young girls and assault them, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For context, I'm in school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once or twice a month and the stadium is off towards the edge of town. It's Friday night, I just had gotten out of school and I had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for 4 hours, a half shift tonight, and my boss, who is my aunt, tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream, and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them, I say okay I'll go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town and I still wanted to go meet up with some of my friends and mess around. I decide to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a weather bipolar state. It snowed last night but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I take off to the store and the first five minutes go by and nothing is wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time but keep in mind it's approaching 9 in the night and I'm on the outskirts of town and no one really takes this way in case they really have to. All of a sudden I see something in the corner of my eye and it looks like a man, roughly 5 foot 8 I'd say, wearing shorts, a shirt, and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch, walking in snow when it's 10 degrees out. My first thought is to pull over, but I'm on the phone with my mom at the time and she warns me not to as some things have happened before in this town. An example, a couple years ago a college girl was kidnapped and found dead rolled up in a rug in 2014. I consider stopping, but for some reason I tell myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I'm a young dude driving a big pickup truck. Last type of person anyone would want to harm, right? I pass the man, going about 40 miles per hour. I drive not even 500 feet past him, and immediately, a car that I did not see at all before turns on and pulls out of a field entrance off the road and starts to follow me. At first, I thought I just was focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road and that's where they come from. 
but I later found out there was not a road there. Now, again, I'm not super worried. I didn't feel it was a threat yet. I start to approach the town again and have to take some turns to get where I'm going. I turn left. The car turns left. I turn right. Car turns right. I go around a roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there. Car follows. At this point, I start to worry a little, but maybe they just need to go to the store also. I then pull up to a stop sign. Keep in mind, I wasn't on the best side of town either, may I add. I turn without my turn signal. The car follows. Now, at this point, I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think much of it. I'm two miles from the store, where plenty of people will be. I take a few more turns, and the car continues to follow me. I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection, and the car does a quick stop and go and catches up. At this point, I'm two turns until the store, so I'm still not worried. I turn into the store, and the car turns also. The store also has a gas station, so I pull there first to act like I was getting gas. The car sets off to the side of the road, and between the gas station and store, and just sits there. I wait about 10 minutes, and the car doesn't move. At this point, I start to get worried. I'm a young kid alone at night near the bad side of town. I call my friends I'm supposed to meet up with later on, and give them the license plate for worst case scenario, then take off to the store. I cross the street, and the car comes straight behind me. I'm freaking out on the phone, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store, and the car parks three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point, and the store is closing soon. There's only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go park on the complete opposite side of the lot, get out, and I completely bolt inside of the store. I'm not super overweight, but I'm not skinny either. I'm about 6 foot 1 and 200 pounds. Who would want anything to do with me? I get spoons, take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside, and my phone is dead. I look out the sliding doors, and suddenly there's a white van next to my driver's side. Looks like no one's in it, but the back windows are covered, and it's running. Big red flag. I run to customer service and explain everything, but they think I'm some young kid messing around. At the time, I didn't see the original follow car, but no way am I going outside with that van next to my truck. After waiting what seemed like hours, in reality about 30 minutes, the van pulls forward, and the original car appears from the side of the building. They came from the in-store Starbucks window and talked, and both drove off. I wait another 10 minutes and dash outside. I speed to my friend's house, and when I get there, I park in his garage. My one buddy asked why there's a big orange mark on my tire, and my heart sinks. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting rest of truck, we find a small pipe dropped in the bed of my truck surrounded by snow. It was about 2 inches wide, and I'd say about 18 inches long, wrapped in duct tape. It was not my gig. I was alone, no phone, scared, and a part of town I'm not familiar with. I try to laugh it off, but now that everyone's asleep I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked outside. I've always been sort of ego boosted on the fact I'm a chubby fat dude that no one would want to mess with, but after tonight I realize anyone can be targeted. This takes place around 10 years ago when I was like 8 or 9. I lived in a pretty bad neighborhood in what was at the time a really run down city. It wasn't good but it wasn't bad at the same time, just a few bad apples in the tree. Anyways, enough background on the neighborhood, now onto the main story. My friends and I loved to play outside, it, it was the only thing we could do. No one in the neighborhood could afford any sort of electronics or any sort of fun machine to play with. We loved to just run through people's yards, cutting through houses, if they just so happened to leave their door open. Now looking back on it, it it is probably the dumbest thing kids our age could have been doing in a neighborhood like that. This story has nothing to do with running at people's houses, just wanted to let you know how dumb of kids we were. Well, on one fateful day, we were playing hide and seek with four of us hiders and one of us a seeker. We thought it would have been a funny idea to go to the other side of the neighborhood so that the seeker could never find us and we'd win. We like to call that part of the neighborhood the ridge part because they had two story houses over there and a forest with a creek in it. We were just doing our usual thing, cutting through people's yards and jumping fences when we heard the loudest scream maybe four or five houses down. After hopping off the fence that we had just jumped, we all stopped and looked around wondering where it came from. I noticed that one of our hiders weren't with us anymore. Three of us left. Where's this egg? I exclaimed. We heard the scream again. I pointed towards where the sound came from and we all jumped back over the fence we just jumped from and ran towards the scream. When we thought we got to the spot where the screaming was coming from, there was nothing there but an empty plot of land in the forest. We all started to get scared. Did Isaac get lost in the forest? 
did he get taken back there? Then we heard the scream again. It was definitely Isaac. I decided to be the man of all the other eight year olds and go into the forest to make sure Isaac was okay. As I started my way into the trees, I did one last look at my friends and saw how horrified their faces were. I knew at the moment that I was definitely the only one that could go down into the forest. Thinking my way in, I could feel all the heat in my body fading and some sort of dread starting to take over. As I walked further and it started getting darker and harder to see, I was whisper yelling my friend's name. He responded in the most shaken up voice down here. Be quiet. I finally got to him and asked him what happened. He told me this story of how he got tired of running and decided to take a break on the curb to catch his breath and that instead of being out in the open and risking the chance of being caught, he decided to go into the woods and hide. He said that after like five minutes after he sat down he heard talking, nothing that he could make out, just random nonsense. He looked around to see a man in a black hoodie hiding behind a tree on the other side of the creek staring at him. But the man took off before my friend could even get up to run away and this is where he said he started screaming at the top of his lungs and hid somewhere else in the forest which is where both of us are now hiding and I kid you not as soon as he told me this we heard a twig snap we both look up to see the man looking for us in some of the shrubbery on the forest floor I couldn't make out any facial expressions or anything on his face for a matter of fact I could see he was holding some sort of blade I couldn't tell if it was a stick or a machete all I knew is that we needed to run so when he turned his back we got up and started running we didn't care how loud we were we just knew that we needed to run they got out of the forest and told all of our friends to run as fast as they could down the street we kept running until we got to the other side of the block and we all turned around to see the street empty. No one did. Not a single car. And from a distance you could hear a roar or like a very loud engine. Shortly after that initial roar a silver Mustang with the darkest windows comes peeling around the corner faster than I've ever seen a car go. Headed straight towards us. I've never had my body tighten up like it had at that very moment when I knew it was the same guy from the forest. I told all my friends to split up and run into people's yards to hide. So as we were all hiding and running through alleyways and jumping fences you can still hear his engine. It was like he was targeting only me. I can't even tell you how far I ran. I got to the point where I didn't even think I was in my neighborhood, but still I hear his engine coming up on me. So I ran more. I was exhausted. The sun finally started to set and I could hear his engine fade. Almost like he had forgotten about me or just had given up. I start making my way back home scared out of my mind, checking my back every so often to make sure I wasn't being followed. Once I made it home, I went right to bed to cry myself to sleep. And for months after that, that silver Mustang would follow us, stalking every corner that we played on. We'd see it at our school, at the grocery store. It could have been a coincidence that our little minds are now perceiving things around us, but either way I think he was stalking us. Nothing actually came of him following us. He never did what he did that first day, but it was still so scary seeing that car everywhere we went. This happened to be last summer. I'm a 20 year old woman. I went to the thrift store with my boyfriend who is 20 years old. And as we were heading back home, I suggested we pick up some sushi for dinner at our nearby grocery store. As my boyfriend works night shifts, he was already feeling tired and suggested that I go to the grocery store while he goes back home. We live in the busy part of our city where the mall, library, city hall, restaurants, and major stores are. They're all a couple of minutes away from our home. Not to mention, I live in a relatively safe city with little crime, so I was more than alright with going by myself. Now, I truly wish I hadn't. As we parted ways, I was walking through the parking lot of the grocery store when a stocky man, about 6 foot 5, probably in his early to mid 40s, approached me. With a wide smile and wider eyes, he said, well, you are stunning. I simply thanked him and tried walking away. He cut me off, saying I have never seen someone as beautiful as you before. I was immediately filled with dread. I looked back, hoping my boyfriend was still in sight. No luck. I was starting to feel cautious, not to mention, with his eyes and smile. He honestly reminded me of a buffer art the clown from Terrifier, minus the clown costume and lack of talking. The man roped me into a one-sided conversation asking me my name and how old I was. I gave him a fake name and told him I was Nati. He laughed and said, unnaturally excitedly, that's good, that means you're a true woman now. My boyfriend later told me I should have lied and said I was under 18 as this may have made the man not interested. From the red flags I got from the man, I seriously doubt that. He then stuck his phone out, asking for my number. I refused, saying I had a boyfriend and I just want to talk to you. I repeated that I had a boyfriend. It was unnerving how his smile never wavered, despite showing that I 
wasn't interested, like he wasn't understanding, or he just didn't care. He sounded confused, but still grinning. He stepped towards me and asked, so you don't want to cheat on your boyfriend? As if to say, what do you mean you don't want to go out with a scary man that's double your age? Speechless, I stepped back and gave pleading looks to the people walking in and out of the grocery store. After the last time I refused, his smile suddenly dropped while he placed his hand on my back, saying in a now cold, firm tone, come on, I have a nice car I can drive you around in. Let's check out one of these restaurants. Seeing a person's entire demeanor change with the flip of a switch was something I only saw in movies slash television shows, and seeing it in this situation terrified me. Going into panic mode, I somehow found the courage to push myself off of them and almost shouted, sorry, I really have to go buy my groceries. Noticing that people were staring at us, this sick smile reappeared and said with a low voice, all right then, I'll see you later, insert the fake name I gave here. I practically ran into the grocery store with so much relief. I glanced back, hoping to see him get in his car to try getting his license plate number, only to see the man just standing in the middle of the parking lot, leering at me. I called my boyfriend in the store, but he kept going to voicemail. I figured he was sleeping, and I was seriously scared to walk back home. I managed to calm myself down in the store, figuring the man must have been long gone, yet I was on high alert the entire walk home. It was starting to get dark, but I figured if I just stayed cautious and walked quickly I would be fine. I couldn't be more wrong. When I was approaching the crosswalk that led to my street, I heard a car pulling up to the sidewalk, followed by a sickeningly familiar voice barking. Hey, hi, hey, hi. My heart dropped into my stomach. I glanced sideways at the car. With his unmistakable, now malicious looking grin plastered on his face, the man's upper body was leaning out of his car window as if he was trying to reach out to me. He tauntingly called out, So where's your boyfriend? While well, cackled, I figured it was best not to acknowledge the man. My mind racing while trying to appear composed, I knew I couldn't lead him to my house, and turning back to go to the mall or stores may have given away that I was terrified and trying to escape. Plus, whoever designed my neighborhood, as the city center was conveniently right next to my complex. I ignored him and casually crossed the street, quickening my pace as I headed into the center. I tried not to look back, scared that I would see the man running up on me. With his wide grin, but I made it to the center and finally looked behind me. I assumed the man would have followed me in or waited for me in his car. Instead, he sped away down a street opposite from my house. With so much relief, I called my boyfriend, who woke up to my call. I was on the verge of breaking down, but managed to fill him in on everything. Thing. He rushed to the center, and after he helped me calm down, we walked home. My boyfriend asked if I got the man's license plate number, to which I felt like an idiot. Not only was it too dark, but I was too consumed with fear for my own life that it didn't even cross my mind at the time. At the very least, I called the police, giving them a description of the man and the make and model of his car. They said they would do what they could, but I haven't heard back from them. I haven't seen that man since, not in person at least. At the same time, I feel so grateful that the man never found out where I live. But, for all I know, he could be lurking around, trying to harm other women like he tried to that night he almost trailed me home. For mine, and the women in my city's sake, I hope I don't have to find out. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5 in the morning each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town slash suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort which lead to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car to park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot were ever on in the morning since no no one else really showed up before 6 in the morning when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old come scampering. Her body language was the exact definition, run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement. Through the span of trees that separates the resort from the outside road, she was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long, blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas maybe, like she just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something 
I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the speaker cable from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out of touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. I didn't call the police, and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though how off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there and where exactly. My mother was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base around the late 2010s, and being a military child at the age of 12, my life had reset once again. I didn't have friends again, and I had to learn an entire new neighborhood. I didn't really have anything that made me ecstatic, that is, except the Pokemon League held on base. It was ran by a few people who earned their judge cards from Nintendo and held tournaments and just open game nights. It was really fun picking up the card game, playing in the video game, they even had a small gym and Elite Four system. I made a lot of friends, and one of them was one of the judges, who I am thankful still to this day, because if it wasn't for him, I may not be here right now. The judge in question, who we will call the professor for the sake of anonymity, was a nice dude. He was the youngest of the three and wore a white professor get up. He looked maybe on the edge of his teens, early 20s with dark hair and glasses and a skinny frame. He was extremely helpful to newcomers, sort of like the big brother we could all look up to and strive to be in our children's cars and video games, even if his game name of the professor was a bit nerdy even for me. He was always one of the last people to leave, helping to clean up any supposedly lived nearby. This last thing is important for what's about to happen. It was a bit of a colder night when the event ended. I was sitting outside in the parking lot, scrolling through memes my friends texted me as I waited for my parents to arrive to pick me up. I was just kinda zoning out as the time clicked by when I heard someone nearby. Hey, hey girl, you play Pokemon? And I would look up at some really big dude, kinda chubby looking. I saw him every now and then in the events and he didn't really stand out too much. I give a small nod, said yeah I do as he gives this wide smile, like creepy wide. He starts walking forward and I am hit with this nasty stench, like bad body odor. I blink a bit as I see he's walking from a black sedan with its back door open. I got this cool card collection, come here, let me show you. Now, my parents have always taught me stranger danger, but my kid brain thought hey, he went to events and I saw him, so he should be fine, at least, so I thought, until he grabbed my wrist and started to drag me to the sedan. To say I immediately started screaming is an understatement. Stinky didn't care though. He was still dragging me, saying how I will have fun and throwing out things about trading cards, like someone listening would think that he was dealing with a whiny kid. I honestly thought that I was going to be taken, and I would never see my mom and dad again. That I would be on the back of a milk carton and never seen again. Silly, I know, but I was rather sheltered about dying and death at that time. Thankfully, the professor had walked out at that very moment, presumably on his way to walk home. All I know is I hear the sound of fabric hitting this dude's face as the professor had swung his professor coat right into the dude's face. I feel his hand go to where the dude's grabbing my arm, and I see his hand grab Stinky's pinky finger and yank back. Hard, Stinky let go and yelled like an animal as Professor pushed me back behind him as he yanked his coat off of the dude. He then kicked at the back of the dude's knees as he caused him to buckle as Professor grabbed his wrists and pulled back on them. Stinky groaned and even more pained as Professor looked at him with just a cold look in his eyes. The big brother figure was gone and something else in its place, and I think I was a bit scared of it. Professor's tone of voice when he spoke didn't help either, like icy daggers lingered with his words against Stinky. If I see you back here, or doing this stuff to my charges, this will pale in comparison to what Japanese prisons will do to you. Stinky would scramble away and get into his car and peel out of the parking lot, Professor glaring at him until he was out of sight.
site. He would then guide me inside of the venue and buy me some fish and chips and sit down with me until my parents arrived. That cool persona he had when he kicked that dude was gone, back to being the big brother I knew. To be frank, that frightened me. I didn't quite understand why the teenager was so aggressive. I only later learned that the professor was a black belt who taught kids how to defend themselves with his mother at the local activity center. I suspect he had something of a protective persona or something in his own life led him to act in such a way. He explained the situation to my folks when they arrived. I wasn't allowed to go to the events and leak as much as I used to but did from time to time. The professor was still his normal self at the events and helping people but he would stop coming to the events a year afterwards. His license had been expired and his father moving out of the country soon. Reaching about the same age as he was and with a little sibling on my own, I sympathized with Hal for a brief moment. He became something terrifying just to make sure I was safe. Oh, and as for Stinky, he never showed up to the events and he was either banned or just scared of the professor. I wish the professor a good life and I hope he is doing well. As for the Stinky guy, I wish that we never meet ever again. I was a 17 year old girl at the time. My boyfriend who was named Joe is 19, his brother Joe is 16, and his friend Doug is 20. Lee and my boyfriend just did a major cleaning of my house. To celebrate we wanted to go to the creek on our day off to relax and enjoy ourselves. The creek we went to was secluded, outside of the town and in what we call distracts. There was never very much traffic and not many houses in the surrounding area. This creek is amongst the more popular hangout spot when it gets warmer, but it's government property and open to public. It's really hard to get into in almost a mile Walk to make it going through ruts and big pond like mud puddles so you were forced to walk it if you didn't have a truck that was especially good at mudding and easy to maneuver the last person we heard attempting to drive down the path flipped their truck and no one ever attempts to drive down it it was later in the evening and getting dark so we were going to try to build a fire to warm up after we swam we were there maybe 30 minutes when we start hearing trucks and seeing lights in the woods like someone was driving down the path to the creek when we arrived, no one was there and the last car was leaving. We soon see this lanky man stumble down the path with a bottle of whiskey. At first, we thought he might have been a teenager around our age just trying to find someone to hang out with and stumbled across our path. It was just a coincidence. We soon learned he was a 26-year-old guy and we told him our respected ages, which was the first flag because he offered us alcohol even though we're underage. Although proven not to be poison or anything, it was just strange. He was very persistent with helping us start our fire. He mentioned how he could go grab his machete out of his truck to chop the branches or to go to his camp where he had five gallons of hand sanitizer. But soon after he mentions going to get the hand sanitizer, he mentions that he hasn't been to the creek in a while lately, about a year. My question is though who has hand sanitizer in large quantities stored at a camp that is not permanent or permitted since it's government property. As we continue to talk and kind of learn a little bit about each other, this man was meticulously not telling us who he was but with anything we said he would relate to. Like living on the same road as my boyfriend when he lived with his dad, but my boyfriend didn't know who he was even though we live in a small town with a small population only after my boyfriend had mentioned it. Also said he was from the same town I grew up in which was almost two hours away in a very populated town. So seemingly like a serial peer or trying to relate to us to gain our trust. Eventually he asked why we haven't asked him his name yet and we proceeded to not tell us anything about his name or who he is. But claimed that we have done this all before like we have been in the same place with him before doing the same thing. We have not been to this creek in almost a year and I only went one time before and do not remember him. He acted like he was stuck in a time loop. He claimed that he knew us all already. I just moved to this town and don't know very many people and stay very much so to myself so I remember a lot of the people I meet. What made it worse was the smiles he was giving all of us when no one else was looking it was bone chilling and he knew we were kind of freaked out of him and he would make sly comments that we didn't really pick up on. After that we decided it was time to leave as Joe had school in the morning. As we were walking up the bank of the river the man whispered into Doug's ear that if we kept asking questions we were going to find out something we didn't want to and mentions how we are all scared of him and that he could tell and tries to more sarcastically defend himself, seemingly making it worse because we could sense the danger. This man persisted that we get in the truck and ride with him, and when we denied he wanted us to sit on the tailgate, which we denied again, he wanted to have us walk in front of the truck so we could use the headlights to see. We eventually convinced him that we would walk behind and he said he would go walking speed and let us keep up. He then starts making my boyfriend help him jump his newer model truck at the time that was beat up. We finally get the truck going and Joe at this point is shaky with me and starts getting noticeable uncomfortable when the man starts making persistent remarks about how he should get in the truck with him and ride so he didn't have to walk. We didn't allow him to get in the truck and the man stopped asking. After that we start walking at a slow lurch not seeming to look away from him through his back glass. When a bigger mud puddle comes up he stopped and told us to back away from the truck and turn around like he didn't want us to get covered in mud. 
but said it in a remarkably weird name that set off about a hundred buzzers in my brain. I personally didn't look away from the truck, not even a second, and when the truck was far enough away where it was slinging mud, we went back to following. At that point, he is driving faster, so we are having to use flashlights to keep going to catch back up. He stopped and let us keep up and then sped off again to where he would wait until we were about vision distance away and skirted out to the road. We still had about a five minute walk, extremely anxious because we didn't know if there were people with him waiting for us to make it to the car. We made it to the car and not seeing a trace of the guy or his truck and quickly get into the car to leave. As we are pulling out to leave, we see the dude seemingly been parked at the bridge waiting for us to leave. He then followed us down the road and we eventually lost him and all made it home safely. We still don't know his intentions were for that night and nobody else knows who he he is, and I can't seem to find him online. And the only other information I know of him is that he is known to creep around town and tries to hang out with other teenagers in town. Whether or not he was harmless but drunk and coming of wrong, or an escapee from a mental institution, I hope me or anyone else ever have to cross paths with him again. We will no longer be going to the creek after dark or back to that creek in general. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When this took place, I, a 20 year old woman at the time, was finishing my degree in the city and working as a casual receptionist at a firm. One of the employees, Nick, told me one day that one of his clients, who he said was a stand up guy, thought I was very cute and wanted to see if I would be okay to give him my number. We went to dinner and he was charming enough. He was in the medical field and was about 7 years older, but I didn't mind as my own parents had a similar age gap between them. We talked about my studies and he told me he thought my rather run of the mill family life was amazing because his life was so different. He was adopted as a baby and his father was abusive. When he was 15, his mother left and he never saw her after that. He was kicked out at 18 and ended up in a terrible car accident in his early 20s. For a long time, he stayed at a relative's house and worked to support himself. Yeah, a heavy conversation on the first date. But all I felt was this overwhelming no eye compassion for this poor human who had been through so much. He seemed nice, was smart, handsome, and though he was just a touch too serious, given his life I figured that was understandable. We ended up dating but by about the third week, things started feeling a bit weird. He refused to introduce me to any of his friends because his last ex had left him for a friend. He also hated that I had male friends because of the same reason, and he would insist on reading any texts I sent or received from them. I made excuses in my head for him like, people need to heal, or sometimes they need a crutch before they learn to trust, or well, it's not like I have anything to hide. He started being critical of the way I spoke or acted and dressed. He was also super insistent we move in together, but I felt it was way too soon. In arguments, sometimes he would get a weird look in his eyes that made me feel unsettled, and I once tried to break the tension by half joking you look like you want to hit me, to which he responded, I wouldn't bother if it came to that. I would just kill you. I was so shocked I didn't even react to that until days later. Recounting it, red flags everywhere but though it might be hard to believe, I was actually convinced I was falling in love with him. Most of the time he was perfect, until he wasn't, but he would explain that was only because he had so many issues from his past, and I would believe him. Then one day, I told told him what I thought was a funny story about a random guy in my class who asked for my number. This guy had asked under the guise of getting notes for classes he'd missed, but I only offered my college email address, explaining that I had a boyfriend. Hilariously, as soon as class ended, I saw this guy annoyedly throwing the paper I wrote my email on in the bin on his way out of the lecture hall. I expected my boyfriend to laugh, but he lost it. He accused me of leading the guy on, accused me of wanting to cheat. I was furious because I knew I had done nothing wrong. When he angrily threw a mug at the wall, which shattered, the whole argument came to an abrupt halt. I was scared and angry, so I grabbed my bag and bolted out of his apartment. I thought he would stop me, but he didn't. I went home, cried about it to my cousin, who was 30 and who I was living with, and assumed it was over. Days passed and I hear nothing from him, and within those days I started questioning everything. Suddenly, it was clear as day that this relationship was toxic and very unhealthy. Even if he did have a tough past, it wasn't my job to fix it and it wasn't an excuse for the way he treated me. I was starting to accept that this was just a horrible near miss and get over it when he texted me, groveling apologies and how much he missed me, and I made the mistake of responding. He called and I picked up, but it was because I wanted to tell him I still thought it wasn't going to work out. He cried, yelled at me, asked me how I could do this to him when I knew that everyone he loved in his life had abandoned him, and how could I do the same? He told me he would never be able to love again and that it was all my fault. I had broken him. He told me that he had given me everything, but I was leaving over such a small argument. Then he apologized and told me he was trying to change and to give him another chance 
chance. I was bawling my eyes out. I felt like the worst human in the world, but I held tight to saying that it was best we moved on and that I was sorry. He ended the call by telling him I had ruined his life. Nothing happened for a while except for texts here and there where my ex would apologize, tell me he missed me, explain that he realized he made so many mistakes. Stuff like that. I would tell my cousin who I was living with about him, and she would firmly tell me to not respond. She was sure it would stop eventually. One day, I finished work as usual and headed to the station. It was a busy day, and the streets were scattered with other people. As I walked, I had this weird urge to look behind me, and when I did, I saw my ex. There was a little distance behind between me and him, but when I saw him, our eyes locked. He looked different, a bit out of it, and I thought maybe he was drunk. I decided I would deal with him at the train station as it was always crowded, and I wanted to talk to him only in a place where there were lots of people. I figured the yelling and crying would not be as intense that way. When I reached the station, I stopped and waited for him to catch up to me. He stopped about two feet away and I expected him to start apologizing again. But he said nothing. He just stared at me. Awkward seconds passed and I said, look, but that's all I got out because his arm moved slightly as he took his hand half out of his pocket and I saw he was holding a very small knife. I froze and vaguely remember thinking that I wanted to run, but it was like my brain and body shut down. I can only describe it as if there was a fog in my brain brain and I just couldn't move for what felt like ages. I just stared at him and I still remember how his eyes just looked so blank. I don't know how long that lasted but then without saying anything, he turned and left. Nobody else had noticed. I remember doubly getting on the train. It, I started second guessing if that even happened. Hindsight tells me I was in shock. As soon as I got home though, I burst into tears. My cousin calmed me down and helped me call the police. In the end, the security cameras were placed in a spot that could clearly show that he had a weapon so the police couldn't do much. Thankfully, I didn't see my ex again. I ended up quitting my job, changing my number, and eventually moved away to another city. To my ex, let's never ever meet. To the guy who asked for my number in class, thank you. You might have saved my life and definitely changed it. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story happened a few months ago. At that time, I had moved out of my house for a professional reason, but I had to wait a couple of months before moving into my next house to spend this time span, and since I could work from anywhere, I rented my very close friend Amy's holiday family house, which is otherwise empty, located in a village I grew up in the countryside. I know this family and their house very well since I was a small child. The house is rather large. It has two floors and five bedrooms. It is located in a quiet or even remote area of the village, only surrounded by forests and other empty holiday houses. While planning this, I was aware this setting could be scary being a single 27-year-old woman, but I hate to restrain myself in life because of unjustified fears, so I instead took a few measures to feel more safe. Before moving in, I had planned to go on a complete checkup of all the doors and windows. Once done, I would look into every room, under every bed, and inside all the wardrobes. This way, I could be certain that the house was perfectly empty at that moment, and would stay so, as I would be very careful with closing doors and I knew there were no spare keys so that, when at night I would be scared, I could reason with myself and know that it is only in my head. I was accompanied by my mother to proceed to the checkup, as she lives close by. We faced a problem rather quickly while verifying doors and windows. Two glass doors from the patio were malfunctioning and one could just slide them open. The layout of the two doors was the following. One was looking towards the garden, the second one was between the patio and the rest of the house. This meant someone could not only get inside the patio from outside, but also in the rest of the house. After this discovery, I called my friend Amy and we agreed I would find a locksmith. Amy's family's financial situation isn't at its peak, so depending on the price, either only the door leading to the garden, either both doors would get fixed. But the price was reasonable, thus the locksmith lady could change both locks. The patio was then perfectly sealed. However, according to her, the glass door leading to the garden was weak and one could easily open it, if motivated. But since the glass door between the patio and the rest of the house was safe, I did not mind that remark. One could have as much fun as they pleased in that patio as long as I was safe in my house. After that, in a successful second checkup, I was happy to move in. The first days were a bit scary, but since I was careful with doors and the house's surroundings were so peaceful and lovely, it quickly became bliss to live there. I was heating myself with the fireplace, eating good food, breathing fresh air. I felt very free and happy, only I had to notice a small odd detail in the very first days. A third glass door was not locking anymore. I got very surprised since I checked so carefully every single door during my checkup. 
This third door was right next to the one I got repaired, between the patio and the house. So, this meant that the patio was not perfectly sealed anymore, but fine, I thought. All the doors leading to the outside were still locked, so no need to worry. I quickly moved on since I felt so happy there, I did not want any useless fear to bother me. I came to the conclusion I must have missed it, and I was a bit ashamed that I got Amy's family to spend money on two locks whereas it should have been three, because of my carelessness. After two wonderful months living a dream, mostly on my own, since all my childhood friends moved out from the village, a friend came to visit me. We spent some time outside, and we had a drink at my place before I drove him back to his village, about an hour away. While we were leaving my house, he even emphasized how meticulous I was with closing all the shutters behind ourselves. I told him it was key for me to feel so good in there. I was back home at around 10 at night. I entered my perfectly sealed house and locked the door behind myself. While turning the key, out of the blue, sudden and intense goosebumps ran all over my scalp. I had never experienced such a feeling, and I was not even aware that the human body could get goosebumps onto the scalp. With that, came a very instinctive feeling of danger and being on my guard. I felt all of this so intensely that I was not able to not ignore it, yet I knew that my house was kept perfectly closed. So, I stayed cautious, but I walked through the entrance and came into the kitchen. Here, on the floor, was laying a rectangular plastic bag. It was small and blue on the orange floor. I was surprised. I recognized it being a plastic bag to be filled with water to make ice cubes. It had nothing to do here. I had already seen these bags earlier. Once I was looking for freezer bags to put my food and I mistooked up them. I knew they were stored at a drawer at the very other side of the kitchen and I knew we did not use them, nor anything from that drawer, with my friend earlier. This uncanny discovery confirmed my gut feeling and I began to feel very uneasy. I sent a picture to my friend asking if he had touched or used these. He said no. I grabbed a knife and I started walking in the living room. Usually, when Whenever I would feel afraid in this house, I would go on a little checkup tour in every room to reassure myself. That is what I had in mind at that moment, but the scuff feeling was literally forbidding my body to do so. Instead, it walked me out of the house. I drove to my mother's place and slept there. A few days after, during a sunny afternoon, my mother and I came back and did a checkup thoroughly. Nothing was missing, nor broken, and no one was there. Everything stayed exactly as I had left it. With such evidence, I came to the conclusion it must have been my friend who, by accident, took those bags and forgot about about it. Then they must have fallen on the floor while I opened the door or something like that. I came back in and kept living a dream in this beautiful place for another month after that. Then something else happened. For a few days, I had been hearing unusual noises which began to scare me, so I decided it was time for a checkup. It was around 9 at night. I began going in every room, looking under every bed. Downstairs, all clear. I walked upstairs, opened the first bedroom in surprise. The light was on. This caused me a small flinch. I never go to these rooms upstairs and they remain closed all the time. Nevertheless, I walk towards the wardrobe, but before opening it, I get a second flinch as an unknown object is now laying on top of the furniture. I open it, nobody. I close it, and I look at the objects. It is an elongated black fabric sheath, rather big, with a hook to carry it on a belt. A terrifying idea crosses my mind that it may be a knife sheath, but I brush it off, as I don't need my imagination to get crazy in such a situation. I finish my checkup, but despite nobody being found, I could not help but feeling weird about the sheath and the light. I went to sleep at my mother's place that night too. The day after, I checked with my friend Amy. No family member came into the house while I was away, nor did they recognize this object as belonging to any of them. I dropped it at the police station and according to them, it is likely a hunting knife sheath indeed. Then, I started thinking again at the patio's third door. It had been coming in my mind for some weeks, but I had been dismissing the idea to avoid unnecessary fear. Reflecting back at my thorough entrance checkup, it is very unlikely that I would have missed a door. As well, the locksmith had changed the lock of the door right next to this one and even stared at it to see how a well-functioning lock looked like. With Amy, we at first imagined that an old Airbnb tenant could have made a copy of the keys and the locks had to be changed. But more and more, I was sure the person was coming in the house from the patio. Another locksmith came and looked at the third door's lock. She said, oh yes, indeed. The lock part screwed on the door frame, where the lock embeds itself had been screwed off. She also checked the door leading to the garden and her colleague had pointed out as easy to open. She said that's obvious, meaning in her laconic way there was very little chance for all that to be a coincidence. I left the house for good after that. I believe a person had their little habits in this house, using the way I shut when I arrived, and they made sure to be able to reach inside the place to despite my changes. Thinking that all this time I was living my life peacefully, reasoning with myself not to be scared, that the place was safe and locked, it actually was not.
This story takes place in a very small town in the northeast region of the United States in the summer before I went off to college in 2015. After I graduated high school, my parents decided to move to a smaller, more affordable house about 40 minutes north into the mountains. We stayed in my childhood home because the public schools in my area were the best in the state, and my parents really valued my education. I ended up going off to an amazing university, and now I have an incredible career because of my excellent education. As most people in the United States know, amazing public education education usually means higher property taxes. My parents got to the point where they could not afford the taxes on their 4,000 square foot home anymore and decided to sell it just after I graduated from high school. Their home is humble and it sits on a beautiful piece of land on the side of a beautiful mountain. The trees are always so green and there is a lot of wildlife around. They don't have many neighbors either as their driveway is about a mile and a half long but this is what they chose to live in after I went off to college. In August of 2015 we moved into this new house. I wasn't planning on staying long as I was getting ready to head off to college as a freshman for the first time. We decided to have a little housewarming party with a bunch of family friends and my best friend at the time as well. My dad was manning the barbecue, my mom was making drinks, we were playing with our dogs. It was a grand time and everyone had so much fun. My dad had built a brick fire pit in our backyard. Just to set the scene for you here, the fire pit was about 30 feet from our back patio door and we had a picnic table and other seats all around. Behind the seating was the tree line. It was so dark some times at night, you needed a flashlight to see 10 feet in front of you. With the fire pit lit, you couldn't see someone unless they were either sitting next to you or across from you in front of the pit. My best friend decided to stay the night and we asked my dad if we could make s'mores. As it was getting a little chilly as it does in the late summer in the northeast at night, my parents left us outside with my dog, Nino. Nino was a huge 100 pound black lab slash pit bull mix. He was such a loyal and incredible dog that my dad trained as his right hand. He was our protector as he could run extremely fast, was very strong and alerted us when something went bump in the night. Side note, he passed away a week before I got married in 2022. He was 17 years old and lived an adventurous life with my parents, hunting squirrels, laying out in the sun, and running amok. Nino laid in between us, facing the tree line, and my best friend was to my right. Our backs were to the dark, dense tree line. Our first mistake, we were laughing, joking, and eating s'mores together, planning for the future, and generally excited about going off to college together. She decided to play some music, and we just relaxed, feeling content and at ease. It was the perfect summer night until Nino started growling. I saw his ears perk up and his head jerked to the side. He then sat up and continued to growl. My best friend and I both looked at each other, thinking Nino just saw a stray animal or something non-threatening. This area was known for lots of deer and rarely a coyote or wolf. As he was trained to help my dad hunt deer, we assumed it was a buck or fawn in the distance behind us. We went back to singing along to the music playing and talking about our fall 2015 class schedule. Again, Nino started growling. Our second mistake, we did not call out for my dad. We didn't even think there was a problem until Nino started barking repeatedly. This time, louder and more vicious, he stood up and started barking as if alerting us to activity beyond the tree line that we could not see. We stood up as well, the fire obscuring our view. My best friend took her phone, paused the music, and turned on her flashlight. She started to walk towards the edge of the tree line with Nino by her side, still growling and barking, alerting us to not go any further and to call for help. We stood still, in silence, listening. I was too afraid to even breathe at this point. She started walking into the woods, and when she shined her flashlight, she saw a figure, someone peering behind a tree. A man with a green shirt and green pants on, about 5 foot 11 with glasses too. We screamed and ran as fast as we could inside, leaving the fire unattended and this creepy man behind the tree. What we did not know at the time is where this man came from. We crashed through our front door, breathless with Nina Taylor behind us, and startled my mother, who was washing dishes and cleaning up from the party. She was talking to my dad about something they saw on the news and I think we cut him off mid-sentence to explain that there was a man dressed in all green lurking behind a tree in the woods. We didn't know how long he was there or if he was still there, but we were both crying. I remember feeling extremely sick like I was going to throw up. My dad jumped up, grabbed his shotgun and headlamp, and ran outside with Nino. My mom gathered us into the living room, shut all of the lights in the house off, and locked the doors. She told us to be quiet and that she was going to call 911. As she did that, my best friend and I shook in fear. We were anticipating gunshots and screaming, but never heard any. My mom, now on the phone with 911, described what we saw to the operator. I heard my mom say, oh, in an alarming way. At this point, my dad came back inside, and my mom let him know that the police were on their way to us. Being in a small town on the mountain with less than 10,000 people means that we don't get our own police force. We get the state police every time there is a call made to emergency responders. My dad put his gun away and waited outside for the police to show up. To our bewilderment, 
they didn't just send one police officer, but 10 in an entire SWAT team and helicopter to circle the area. We were rightfully terrified. I was practically having a panic attack at this point. The police officers came inside our home and asked my best friend and me what the man was wearing, what he looked like, if we were able to discern any scars or tattoos. We explained the weird matching green outfit and the glasses. The officer excused himself and alerted the police and SWAT members outside of our description. They started to search the woods behind our home with guns drawn, flashlights, and the helicopter circling above. They advised us to stay inside and that they would let us know when slash if they found something. After about 25 minutes, we got another knock on our door. It was not one but two officers this time and my dad let them in and they began to explain the situation. One officer explained that we must have seen on the news that a convicted felon from the prison about 20 miles away escaped into the mountains. The police set up a perimeter 10 miles around the prison, but the convict escaped them yet again. The outfit the man was wearing as well as our description signaled to them that the escaped convict was 100% lurking through our remote, densely wooded backyard that night. The all green outfit was a standard issue for prisoners in my state then. They did not, however, find the man near us after 25 minutes of searching. He was still out there. The officers let us know that they were going to have a squad car stay and watch our house for a few days as they were unable to locate the fugitive and believe he is still an active threat to our safety. That night and for three nights after that, we all slept in the living room together. My dad's shotgun was within arm's reach of him at all times. Later that week, we got another knock on our door from the officers stationed outside of our home. They let us know that the man was back in police custody and that we were safe. They advised us to get security cameras and how sorry they were that this happened to us. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.